This audio belongs to list-red.com. Visit list-read.com to read full book and many other books. Thank. 1. That doesn't sound like a school trivia night, said Mrs. Patty Ponder to Marie Antoinette. That sounds like a riot. The cat didn't respond. She was dozing on the couch and found school trivia nights to be trivial. Not interested, eh? Let them eat cake. Is that what you're thinking? They do eat a lot of cake, don't they? All those cake stalls. Goodness me. Although I don't think any of the mothers ever actually eat them. They're all so sleek and skinny, aren't they? Like you. Marie Antoinette sneered at the compliment. The let them eat cake thing had grown old a long time ago, and she'd recently heard one of Mrs. Ponder's grandchildren say it was meant to be let them eat brioche and also that Marie Antoinette never said it in the first place. Mrs. Ponder picked up her television remote and turned down the volume on Dancing with the Stars. She turned it up loud earlier because of the sound of the heavy rain, but the downpour had eased now. She could hear people shouting. Angry hollers crashed through the quiet, cold night air. It was somehow hurtful for Mrs. Ponder to hear, as if all that rage were directed at her. Mrs. Ponder had grown up with an angry mother. Goodness me. Do you think they're arguing over the capital of Guatemala? Do you know the capital of Guatemala? No? I don't either. We should Google it. Don't sneer at me. Marie Antoinette sniffed. Let's go see what's going on, said Mrs. Ponder briskly. She was feeling nervous and therefore behaving briskly in front of the cat, the same way she'd once done with her children when her husband was away and there were strange noises in the night. Mrs. Ponder heaved herself up with the help of her walker. Marie Antoinette slid her slippery body comfortingly in between Mrs. Ponder's legs, she wasn't falling for the brisk act, as she pushed the walker down the hallway to the back of the house. Her sewing room looked straight out onto the schoolyard of Pirui Public. Mum, are you mad? You can't live this close to a primary school, her daughter had said when she was first looking at buying the house. But Mrs. Ponder loved to hear the crazy babble of children's voices at intervals throughout the day, and she no longer drove so she couldn't care less that the street was jammed with those giant, truck-like cars they all drove these days, with women in big sunglasses leaning across their steering wheels to call out terribly urgent information about Harriet's ballet and Charlie's speech therapy. Mothers took their mothering so seriously now. Their frantic little faces. Their busy little bottoms strutting into the school in their tight gym gear. Ponytails swinging. Eyes fixed on the mobile phones held in the palms of their hands like compasses. It made Mrs. Ponder laugh. Fondly though. Her three daughters, although older, were exactly the same. And they were all so pretty. How are you this morning, she always called out if she was on the front porch with a cup of tea or watering the front garden as they went by. Busy, Mrs. Ponder. Frantic, they always called back trotting along, yanking their children's arms. They were pleasant and friendly and just a touch condescending because they couldn't help it. She was so old. They were so busy. The fathers, and there were more and more of them doing the school run these days, were different. They rarely hurried, strolling past with a measured casualness. No big deal. All under control. That was the message. Mrs. Ponder chuckled fondly at them too. But now it seemed the Pirui public parents were misbehaving. She got to the window and pushed aside the lace curtain. The school had recently paid for a window guard after a cricket ball had smashed the glass and nearly knocked out Marie Antoinette. A group of year three boys had given her a hand-painted apology card, which she kept on her fridge. There was a two-story sandstone building on the other side of the playground with an event room on the second level and a big balcony with ocean views. Mrs. Ponder had been there for a few functions, a talk by a local historian, a lunch hosted by the friends of the library. It was quite a beautiful room. 
Sometimes ex-students had their wedding receptions there. That's where they'd be having the school trivia night. They were raising funds for smart boards, whatever they were. Mrs. Ponder had been invited as a matter of course. Her proximity to the school gave her a funny sort of honorary status, even though she'd never had a child or grandchild attend. She'd said no thank you to the school trivia night invitation. She thought school events without the children in attendance were pointless. The children had their weekly school assembly in the same room. Each Friday morning, Mrs. Ponder set herself up in the sewing room with a cup of English breakfast and a ginger nut biscuit. The sound of the children singing floating down from the second floor of the building always made her weep. She'd never believed in God, except when she heard children singing. There was no singing now. Mrs. Ponder could hear a lot of bad language. She wasn't a prude about bad language, her eldest daughter swore like a trooper, but it was upsetting and disconcerting to hear someone maniacally screaming that particular four-letter word in a place that was normally filled with childish laughter and shouts. Are you all drunk, she said. Her rain-splattered window was at high level with the entrance doors to the building, and suddenly people began to spill out. Security lights illuminated the paved area around the entrance like a stage set for a play. Clouds of mist added to the effect. It was a strange sight. The parents at Pirawi Public had a baffling fondness for costume parties. It wasn't enough that they should have an ordinary trivia night, she knew from the invitation that some bright spark had decided to make it an Audrey and Elvis trivia night, which meant that the women all had to dress up as Audrey Hepburn and the men had to dress up as Elvis Presley. That was another reason Mrs. Ponder had turned down the invitation. She'd always abhorred costume parties. It seemed that the most popular rendition of Audrey Hepburn was the breakfast at Tiffany's look. All the women were wearing long black dresses, white gloves, and pearl chokers. Meanwhile, the men had mostly chosen to pay tribute to the Elvis of the latter years. They were all wearing shiny white jumpsuits, glittery gemstones, and plunging necklines. The women looked lovely. The poor men looked perfectly ridiculous. As Mrs. Ponder watched, one Elvis punched another across the jaw. He staggered back into an Audrey. Two Elvises grabbed him from behind and pulled him away. An Audrey buried her face in her hands and turned aside, as though she couldn't bear to watch. Someone shouted, stop this. Indeed. What would your beautiful children think? Should I call the police, wondered Mrs. Ponder out loud, but then she heard the wail of a siren in the distance, at the same time as a woman on the balcony began to scream and scream. Gabrielle, it wasn't like it was just the mothers you know. It wouldn't have happened without the dads. I guess it started with the mothers. We were the main players, so to speak. The mums. I can't stand the word mum. It's a frumpy word. Mom is better. With an O. It sounds skinnier. We should change to the American spelling. I have body image issues, by the way. Who doesn't, right? Bonnie, it was all just a terrible misunderstanding. People's feelings got hurt, and then everything just spiraled out of control. The way it does. All conflict can be traced back to someone's feelings getting hurt, don't you think? Divorce. World wars. Legal action. Well, maybe not every legal action. Can I offer you an herbal tea? Stu. I'll tell you exactly why it happened, women don't let things go. Not saying the blokes don't share part of the blame. But if the girls hadn't gotten their knickers in a knot. And that might sound sexist, but it's not, it's just a fact of life. Ask any man, not some new age, artsy fartsy, I wear moisturizer type, I mean a real man, ask a real man, then he'll tell you that women are like the Olympic athletes of grudges. You should see my wife in action and she's not even the worst of them. Miss Barnes, Helicopter Parents Before I started at Pirawi Public, I thought it was an exaggeration, this thing about parents being overly involved with their kids. I mean, 
My mum and dad loved me, they were, like, interested in me when I was growing up in the 90s, but they weren't, like, obsessed with me. Mrs. Lipman, it's a tragedy, and deeply regrettable, and we're all trying to move forward. I have no further comment. Carol, I blame the erotic book club. But that's just me. Jonathan, there was nothing erotic about the erotic book club, I'll tell you that for free. Jackie, you know what? I see this as a feminist issue. Harper, who said it was a feminist issue? What the heck? Are you what started it, the incident at the kindergarten orientation day? Graham, my understanding was that it all goes back to the stay-at-home mums battling it out with the career mums. What do they call it? The mummy wars. My wife wasn't involved. She doesn't have time for that sort of thing. Thea, you journalists are just loving the French nanny angle. I heard someone on the radio today talking about the French maid, which Juliet was certainly not. Renata had a housekeeper as well. Lucky for some. I have four children, and no staff to help out. Of course, I don't have a problem per se with working mothers, I just wonder why they bothered having children in the first place. Melissa, you know what I think got everyone all hot and bothered? The head lice. Oh my gosh, don't let me get started on the head lice. Samantha, the head lice. What did that have to do with anything? Who told you that? I bet it was Melissa, right? That poor girl suffered post-traumatic stress disorder after her kids kept getting reinfected. Sorry. It's not funny. It's not funny at all. Detective Sergeant Adrian Quinlan, let me be clear, this is not a circus. This is a murder investigation. 2. Six months before the trivia night. 40. Madeline Martha Mackenzie was 40 years old today. I am 40, she said out loud as she drove. She drew the word out in slow motion, like a sound effect. 40. She caught the eye of her daughter in the rearview mirror. Chloe grinned and imitated her mother. I am 5. Fee Eve. 40, trilled Madeline like an opera singer. Tra lo lo lo. 5, trilled Chloe. Madeline tried a rap version, beating out the rhythm on the steering wheel. I'm 40, yeah, 40. That's enough now, mummy, said Chloe firmly. Sorry, said Madeline. She was taking Chloe to her kindergarten, let's get kindy ready. Orientation. Not that Chloe required any orientation before starting school next January. She was already very firmly oriented at Pirui Public. At this morning's drop-off Chloe had been busy taking charge of her brother, Fred, who was two years older but often seemed younger. Fred, you forgot to put your book bag in the basket. That's it. In there. Good boy. Fred had obediently dropped his book bag in the appropriate basket before running off to put Jackson in a headlock. Madeline had pretended not to see the headlock. Jackson probably deserved it. Jackson's mother, Renata, hadn't seen it either, because she was deep in conversation with Harper, both of them frowning earnestly over the stress of educating their gifted children. Renata and Harper attended the same weekly support group for parents of gifted children. Madeline imagined them all sitting in a circle, wringing their hands while their eyes shone with secret pride. While Chloe was busy bossing the other children around at orientation, her gift was bossiness, she was going to run a corporation one day, Madeline was going to have coffee and cake with her friend Celeste. Celeste's twin boys were starting school next year too, so they'd be running amok at orientation. Their gift was shouting. Madeline had a headache after five minutes in their company. Celeste always bought exquisite and very expensive birthday presents, so that would be nice. After that, Madeline was going to drop Chloe off with her mother-in-law, and then have lunch with some friends before they all rushed off for school pickup. The sun was shining. 
She was wearing her gorgeous new Dolce and Gabbana stilettos, bought online, 30% off. It was going to be a lovely, lovely day. Let the festival of Madeline begin, her husband, Ed, had said this morning when he brought her coffee in bed. Madeline was famous for her fondness of birthdays and celebrations of all kinds. Any excuse for champagne. Still. 40. As she drove the familiar route to the school, she considered her magnificent new age. 40. She could still feel 40 the way it felt when she was 15. Such a colorless age. Marooned in the middle of your life. Nothing would matter all that much when you were 40. You wouldn't have real feelings when you were 40, because you'd be safely cushioned by your frumpy 14s. 40-year-old woman found dead. Oh dear. 20-year-old woman found dead. Tragedy. Sadness. Find that murderer. Madeline had recently been forced to do a minor shift in her head when she heard something on the news about a woman dying in her 40s. But, wait, that could be me. That would be sad. People would be sad if I was dead. Devastated, even. So there, age-obsessed world. I might be 40, but I am cherished. On the other hand, it was probably perfectly natural to feel sadder over the death of a 20-year-old than a 40-year-old. The 40-year-old had enjoyed 20 years more of life. That's why, if there was a gunman on the loose, Madeline would feel obligated to throw her middle-aged self in front of the 20-year-old. Take a bullet for youth. It was only fair. Well, she would, if she could be sure it was a nice young person. Not one of those insufferable ones, like the child driving the little blue Mitsubishi in front of Madeline. She wasn't even bothering to hide the fact that she was using her mobile phone while she drove, probably texting or updating her Facebook status. See? This kid wouldn't have even noticed the loose gunman. She would have been staring vacantly at her phone, while Madeline sacrificed her life for her. It was infuriating. The little car appeared to be jammed with young people. At least three in the back, their heads bobbing about, hands gesticulating. Was that somebody's foot waving about? It was a tragedy waiting to happen. They all needed to concentrate. Just last week, Madeline had been having a quick coffee after her shockwave class and was reading a story in the paper about how all the young people were killing themselves by sending texts while they drove. On my way. Nearly there. These were their last foolish, and often misspelled, words. Madeline had cried over the picture of one teenager's grief-stricken mother, absurdly holding up her daughter's mobile phone to the camera as a warning to readers. Silly little idiots, she said out loud as the car weaved dangerously into the next lane. Who is an idiot, said her daughter from the back seat. The girl driving the car in front of me is an idiot because she's driving her car and using her phone at the same time, said Madeline. Like when you need to call daddy when we're running late, said Chloe. I only did that one time, protested Madeline. And I was very careful and very quick. And I'm 40 years old. Today, said Chloe knowledgeably. You're 40 years old today. Yes. Also, I made a quick call, I didn't send a text. You have to take your eyes off the road to text. Texting while driving is illegal and naughty, and you must promise to never ever do it when you're a teenager. Her voice quivered at the thought of Chloe being a teenager and driving a car. But you're allowed to make a quick phone call, checked Chloe. No. That's illegal too, said Madeline. So that means you broke the law, said Chloe with satisfaction. Like a robber. Chloe was currently in love with the idea of robbers. She was definitely going to date bad boys one day. Bad boys on motorcycles. Stick with the nice boys, Chloe, said Madeline after a moment. Like daddy. Bad boys don't bring you coffee in bed, I'll tell you that for free.
What are you babbling on about, woman, sighed Chloe. She'd picked this phrase up from her father and imitated his weary tone perfectly. They'd made the mistake of laughing the first time she did it, so she kept it up, and said it just often enough, and with perfect timing, so that they couldn't help but keep laughing. This time Madeline managed not to laugh. Chloe currently trod a very fine line between adorable and obnoxious. Madeline probably trod the same line herself. Madeline pulled up behind the little blue Mitsubishi at a red light. The young driver was still looking at her mobile phone. Madeline banged on her car horn. She saw the driver glance in her rearview mirror, while all her passengers craned around to look. Put down your phone, she yelled. She mimicked texting by jabbing her finger in her palm. It's illegal. It's dangerous. The girl stuck her finger up in the classic up yours gesture. Right. Madeline pulled on her emergency brake and put on her hazard lights. What are you doing? said Chloe. Madeline undid her seat belt and threw open the car door. But we've got to go to orientation, said Chloe in a panic. We'll be late. Oh, calamity. Oh, Calamity was a line from a children's book that they used to read to Fred when he was little. The whole family said it now. Even Madeline's parents had picked it up, and some of Madeline's friends. It was a very contagious phrase. It's all right, said Madeline. This will only take a second. I'm saving young lives. She stalked up to the girl's car on her new stilettos and banged on the window. The window slid down, and the driver metamorphosed from a shadowy silhouette into a real young girl with white skin, sparkly nose ring and badly applied, clumpy mascara. She looked up at Madeline with a mixture of aggression and fear. What is your problem? Her mobile phone was still held casually in her left hand. Put down that phone. You could kill yourself and your friends. Madeline used the exact same tone she used on Chloe when she was being extremely naughty. She reached in the car, grabbed the phone and tossed it to the open-mouthed girl in the passenger seat. Okay. Just stop it. She could hear their gales of laughter as she walked back to her SUV. She didn't care. She felt pleasantly stimulated. A car pulled up behind hers. Madeline smiled, lifted her hand apologetically and hurried back to be in her car before the lights changed. Her ankle turned. One second it was doing what an ankle was meant to do, and the next it was flipping out at a sickeningly wrong angle. She fell heavily on one side. Oh, calamity. That was almost certainly the moment the story began. With the ungainly flip of an ankle. Three. Jane pulled up at a red light behind a big shiny SUV with its hazard lights blinking and watched a dark-haired woman hurry along the side of the road back to it. She wore a floaty, blue summer dress and high strappy heels, and she waved apologetically, charmingly at Jane. The morning sun caught one of the woman's earrings, and it shone as if she'd been touched by something celestial. A glittery girl. Older than Jane but definitely still glittery. All her life Jane had watched girls like that with scientific interest. Maybe a little awe. Maybe a little envy. They weren't necessarily the prettiest, but they decorated themselves so affectionately, like Christmas trees, with dangling earrings, jangling bangles, and delicate, pointless scarves. They touched your arm a lot when they spoke. Jane's best friend at school had been a glittery girl. Jane had a weakness for them. Then the woman fell, as if something had been pulled out from underneath her. Ouch, said Jane, and she looked away fast to save the woman's dignity. Did you hurt yourself, mummy? asked Ziggy from the back seat. He was always very worried about her hurting herself. No, said Jane. That lady over there hurt herself. She tripped. She waited for the woman to get up and get back in her car, but she was still on the ground. 
she tipped back her head to the sky, and her face had that compressed look of someone in great pain. The traffic light turned green, and a little blue Mitsubishi that had been in front of the SUV zoomed off with a squeal of tires. Jane put her signal on to drive around the car. They were on their way to Ziggy's orientation day at the new school, and she had no idea where she was going. She and Ziggy were both nervous and pretending not to be. She wanted to get there in plenty of time. Is the lady okay, said Ziggy. Jane felt that strange lurch she sometimes experienced when she got distracted by her life, and then something, it was often Ziggy, made her remember just in time the appropriate way for a nice, ordinary, well-mannered grown-up to behave. If it weren't for Ziggy she would have driven off. She would have been so focused on her goal of getting him to his kindergarten orientation that she would have left a woman sitting on the road, writhing in pain. I'll just check on her, said Jane, as if that were her intention all along. She flicked on her own hazard lights and opened the car door, aware as she did of a selfish sense of resistance. You are an inconvenience, glittery lady. Are you all right, she called. I'm fine. The woman tried to sit up straighter and whimpered, her hand on her ankle. Ow. Shit. I've rolled my ankle, that's all. I'm such an idiot. I got out of the car to go tell the girl in front of me to stop texting. Serves me right for behaving like a school prefect. Jane crouched down next to her. The woman had shoulder length, well-cut dark hair and the faintest sprinkle of freckles across her nose. There was something aesthetically pleasing about those freckles, like a childhood memory of summer, and they were very nicely complemented by the fine lines around her eyes and the absurd swinging earrings. Jane's resistance vanished entirely. She liked this woman. She wanted to help her. Although, what did that say? If the woman had been a toothless, water-nosed crone she would have continued to feel resentful. The injustice of it. The cruelty of it. She was going to be nicer to this woman because she liked her freckles. The woman's dress had an intricately embroidered cut-out pattern of flowers all along the neckline. Jane could see turned freckly skin through the petals. We need to get some ice on it straight away, said Jane. She knew about ankle injuries from her netball days and she could see this woman's ankle was already beginning to swell. And keep it elevated. She chewed her lip and looked about hopefully for someone else. She had no idea how to handle the logistics of making this actually happen. It's my birthday, said the woman sadly. My fortieth. Happy birthday, said Jane. It was sort of cute that a woman of forty would even bother to mention that it was her birthday. She looked at the woman's strappy shoes. Her toenails were painted a lustrous turquoise. The stiletto heels were as thin as toothpicks and perilously high. No wonder you did your ankle, said Jane. No one could walk in those shoes. I know, but aren't they gorgeous? The woman turned her foot at an angle to admire them. Ouch. Fuck, that hurts. Sorry. Excuse my language. Mummy. A little girl with dark curly hair, wearing a sparkling tiara, stuck her head out the window of the car. What are you doing? Get up. We'll be late. Glittery mother. Glittery daughter. Thanks for the sympathy, darling, said the woman. She smiled ruefully at Jane. We're on our way to her kindergarten orientation. She's very excited. At Pirui Public, said Jane. She was astonished. But that's where I'm going. My son, Ziggy, is starting school next year. We're moving here in December. It didn't seem possible that she and this woman could have anything in common, or that their lives could intersect in any way. Ziggy. Like Ziggy Stardust. What a great name, said the woman. I'm Madeline, by the way. Madeline Martha Mackenzie. I always mention the Martha for some reason. Don't ask me why. 
She held out her hand. Jane, said Jane. Jane no middle name Chapman. Gabrielle, the school ended up split in two. It was, like, I don't know, a civil war. You were either on Team Madeline or Team Renata. Bonnie, no, no, that's awful. That never happened. There were no sides. We're a very close-knit community. There was too much alcohol. Also, it was a full moon. Everyone goes a little crazy when it's a full moon. I'm serious. It's an actual verifiable phenomenon. Samantha, was it a full moon? It was pouring rain, I know that. My hair was all goofy. Mrs. Lipman, that's ridiculous and highly defamatory. I have no further comment. Carol, I know I keep harping on about the erotic book club, but I'm sure something happened at one of their little quote-unquote meetings. Harper, listen, I cried when we learned Emily was gifted. I thought, here we go again. I'd been through it all before with Sophia, so I knew what I was in for. Renata was in the same boat. Two gifted children. Nobody understands the stress. Renata was worried about how Amabella would settle in at school, whether she'd get enough stimulation and so on. So when that child with the ridiculous name, that Ziggy, did what he did, and it was only the orientation morning. Well, she was understandably very distressed. That's what started it all. 4. Jane had brought along a book to read in the car while Ziggy was doing his kindergarten orientation, but instead she accompanied Madeline Martha Mackenzie, it sounded like the name of a feisty little girl in a children's book, to a beachside cafe called Blue Blues. The cafe was a funny little misshapen building, almost like a cave, right on the boardwalk next to Pirui Beach. Madeline hobbled along in bare feet, leaning heavily and unselfconsciously on Jane's shoulder as if they were old friends. It felt intimate. She could smell Madeline's perfume, something citrusy and delicious. Jane hadn't been touched much by other grown-ups in the last five years. As soon as they opened the door of the cafe, a youngish man came out from behind the counter, his arms outstretched. He was dressed all in black, with curly blonde surfer hair and a stud in the side of his nose. Madeline! What's happened to you? I am gravely injured, Tom, said Madeline. And it's my birthday. Oh, calamity, said Tom. He winked at Jane. While Tom settled Madeline in a corner booth, bringing her ice wrapped in a tea towel and propping her leg up on a chair with a cushion, Jane took in the cafe. It was completely charming, as her mother would have said. The bright blue uneven walls were lined with rickety shelves filled with second-hand books. The timber floorboards shone gold in the morning light, and Jane breathed in a heady mix of coffee, baking, the sea and old books. The front of the cafe was all open glass, and the seating was arranged so that wherever you sat you faced the beach, as if you were there to watch the sea perform a show. As Jane looked around her, she felt that dissatisfied feeling she often experienced when she was somewhere new and lovely. She couldn't quite articulate it except with the words if only I were here. This little beachside cafe was so exquisite, she longed to really be there except, of course, she was there, so it didn't make sense. Jane? What can I get you, said Madeline. I'm buying you coffee and treats to thank you for everything. She turned to the fussing barista. Tom. This is Jane. She's my knight in shining armor. My knightess. Jane had driven Madeline and her daughter to the school, after first nervously parking Madeline's massive car in a side street. She'd taken a spare booster seat from the back of Madeline's car for Chloe and put it in the back of her own little Honda, next to Ziggy. It had been a project. A tiny crisis overcome. It was a sad indictment of Jane's mundane life that she'd found the whole incident just a little bit thrilling. Ziggy too had been wide-eyed and self-conscious at the novelty of having another child in the back seat with him, 
especially one as effervescent and charismatic as Chloe. The little girl had chatted non-stop the whole way, explaining everything Ziggy needed to know about the school, and who the teachers would be, and how they had to wash their hands before they went into the classroom, with just one paper towel, and where they sat to have their lunch, and how you went to loud peanut butter, because some people had allergies and could die, and she already had her lunchbox, and it had Dora the Explorer on it, and what did Ziggy's lunchbox have on it? Buzz Lightyear, Ziggy had answered promptly, politely, and completely untruthfully, as Jane hadn't bought his lunchbox yet, and they hadn't even discussed the need for a lunchbox. He was in daycare three days a week at the moment, and meals were provided. Packing a lunchbox was going to be new for Jane. When they got to the school, Madeline had stayed in the car while Jane took the children in. Actually, Chloe had taken them in, marching along in front of them, tiara gleaming in the sunlight. At one point Ziggy and Jane had exchanged looks as if to say, who are these marvellous people? Jane had been mildly nervous about Ziggy's orientation morning and conscious of the fact that she would need to hide her nerves from Ziggy, because he was prone to anxiety. It had felt like she was starting a new job, her job as a primary school mother. There would be rules and paperwork and procedures to learn. However, walking into school with Chloe was like arriving with a golden ticket. Two other mothers immediately accosted them, Chloe. Where's your mum? Then they introduced themselves to Jane, and Jane had a story to tell about Madeline's ankle, and next thing, the kindergarten teacher, Miss Barnes, wanted to hear, and Jane found herself the centre of attention, which was quite pleasant, to be honest. The school itself was beautiful perched at the end of the headland, so that the blue of the distant ocean seemed to be constantly sparkling in Jane's peripheral vision. The classrooms were in long, low sandstone buildings and the leaf-treed playground seemed to be full of enchanting secret spots to encourage the imagination, cubby holes in between trees, sheltered pathways, even a tiny, child-sized maze. When she'd left, Ziggy had been walking into a classroom hand in hand with Chloe, his little face flushed and happy, and Jane had walked outside to her car, feeling flushed and happy herself, and there was Madeline in the passenger seat, waving and smiling delightedly, as if Jane were her great friend, and Jane had felt a lessening of something, a loosening. Now she sat next to Madeline in blue blues and waited for her coffee to arrive, watching the water and feeling the sunshine on her face. Maybe moving here was going to be the beginning of something, or the end, which would be even better. My friend Celeste will be here soon, said Madeline. You might have seen her at the school, dropping off her boys. Two little blonde ruffians. She's tall, blonde, beautiful and flustered. I don't think so, said Jane. What's she got to be flustered about if she's tall, blonde and beautiful? Exactly, said Madeline, as if that answered the question. She's got this equally gorgeous, rich husband too. They still hold hands. And he's nice. He buys me presents. Honestly, I have no idea why I stay friends with her. She looked at her watch. Oh, she's hopeless. Always late. Anyway, I'll interrogate you while we wait. She leaned forward and gave her full attention to Jane. Are you new to the peninsula? I don't know your face at all. With kids the same age you'd think we would have run into each other at Jimbaro or Story Hour or whatever. We're moving here in December, said Jane. We live in Newtown at the moment, but I decided it might be nice to live near the beach for a while. It was just on a whim, I guess. The phrase on a whim came to her out of nowhere, and both pleased and embarrassed her. She tried to make it a whimsical story, as if she were indeed a whimsical girl. She told Madeline that one day a few months back she'd taken Ziggy for a trip to the beach, seen the rental sign outside a block of apartments and thought, why not live near the beach? It wasn't a lie, after all. Not exactly. A day at the beach, she'd kept telling herself, over and over, as she drove down that long swooping road, as if someone were listening in on her thoughts, 
questioning her motives. Piriwi Beach was one of the top 10 most beautiful beaches in the world. She'd seen that somewhere. Her son deserved to see one of the top 10 most beautiful beaches in the world. Her beautiful, extraordinary son. She kept looking at him in the review mirror, her heart aching. She didn't tell Madeline that, as they'd walked hand in hand back to the car, Sandy and Sticky, the word help screamed silently in her head, as if she were begging for something. A solution, a cure, a reprieve. A reprieve from what? A cure for what? A solution for what? Her breathing had become shallow. She'd felt beads of sweat at her hairline. Then she'd seen the sign. Their lease at their new turn apartment was up. The two-bedroom unit was in an ugly, soulless, red brick block of apartments, but it was only a five-minute walk to the beach. What if we moved right here, she'd said to Ziggy, and his eyes had lit up, and all at once it had seemed like the apartment was exactly the solution to whatever was wrong with her. A sea change, people called it. Why shouldn't she and Ziggy have a sea change? She didn't tell Madeline that she'd been taking six-month leases in different rental apartments across Sydney ever since Ziggy was a baby, trying to find a life that worked. She didn't tell her that, maybe the whole time, she'd been circling closer and closer to Pirui Beach. And she didn't tell Madeline that, when she'd walked out of the real estate office after signing the lease, she'd noticed for the first time the sort of people who lived on the peninsula golden-skinned and beach-haired, the sort of people who surfed before breakfast, who took pride in their bodies, and she'd thought of her own pasty white legs beneath her jeans, and then she'd thought of how her parents would feel so nervous driving along that winding peninsula road, her dad's knuckles white on the steering wheel, except they'd still do it, without complaint, and all at once Jane had been convinced that she'd just made a truly reprehensible mistake. But it was too late. So here I am, she finished lamely. You're going to love it here, Madeline enthused. She adjusted the ice on her ankle and winced. Ow. Do you surf? What about your husband? Or your partner, I should say. Or boyfriend? Girlfriend? I am open to all possibilities. No husband, Jane said. No partner. It's just me. I'm a single mum. Are you, said Madeline, as if Jane had just announced something rather daring and wonderful. I am. Jane smiled foolishly. Well, you know, people always like to forget this, but I was a single mother, said Madeline. She lifted her chin, as if she were addressing a crowd of people who disagreed with her. My ex-husband walked out on me when my older daughter, Abigail, was a baby. She's 14. I was quite young too, like you. Only 26. Although I thought I was over the hill. It was hard. Being a single mother is hard. Well, I have my mum man. Oh, sure, sure. I'm not saying I didn't have support. I had my parents to help me too. But my God, there were some nights, when Abigail was sick, or when I got sick, or worse, when we both got sick, and... Anyway. Madeline stopped and shrugged. My ex is remarried now to someone else. They have a little girl about the same age as Chloe, and Nathan has become father of the year. Men often do when they get a second chance. Abigail thinks her dad is wonderful. I'm the only one left holding a grudge. They say it's good to let your grudges go, but I don't know, I'm quite fond of my grudge. I tend it like a little pet. I'm not really into forgiveness either, said Jane. Madeline grinned and pointed her teaspoon at her. Good for you. Never forgive. Never forget. That's my motto. Jane couldn't tell how much she was joking. So what about Ziggy's dad, continued Madeline. Is he in the picture at all? Jane didn't flinch. She'd had five years to get good at it. She felt herself becoming very still. 
no. We weren't actually together. She delivered her line perfectly. I didn't even know his name. It was a. Stop. Pause. Look away as if unable to make eye contact. Sort of a, one-off. You mean a one-night stand, said Madeline immediately, sympathetically, and Jane almost laughed out loud with the surprise of it. Most people, especially of Madeline's age, reacted with a delicate, slightly distasteful expression that said, I get it and I'm cool with it, but I now place you in a different category of person. Jane was never offended by their distaste. She found it distasteful too. She just wanted that particular topic of conversation closed off for good, and most of the time that's exactly what happened. Ziggy was Ziggy. There was no dad. Move right along. Why don't you just say you split up with the father, her mother had asked in the early days. Lies get complicated, mum, said Jane. Her mother had no experience with lies. This way we just close the conversation down. I remember one night stands, said Madeline wistfully. The things I did in the 90s. Lordy me. I hope Chloe never finds out. Oh, calamity. Was yours fun? It took Jane a second to comprehend the question. She was asking if her one night stand was fun. For a moment Jane was back in that glass bubble of an elevator as it slid silently up the center of the hotel. His hand around the neck of the champagne bottle. The other hand on her lower back, pulling her forward. They were both laughing so hard. Deep creases around his eyes. She was weak with laughter and desire. Expensive smells. Jane cleared her throat. I guess it was fun, she said. Sorry, said Madeline. I was being frivolous. It was because I was thinking of my own frivolous youth. Or maybe because you're so young and I'm so old, and I'm trying to be cool. How old are you? Do you mind my asking? Twenty-four, said Jane. Twenty-four, breathed Madeline. I'm forty today. I told you that already, didn't I? You probably think you'll never be forty, right? Well, I hope I'll be forty, said Jane. She'd noticed before how middle-aged women were obsessed with the topic of age, always laughing about it, moaning about it, going on and on about it, as if the process of aging were a tricky puzzle they were trying to solve. Why were they so mystified by it? Jane's mother's friends seemed to literally have no other topic of conversation, or they didn't when they spoke to Jane. Oh, you're so young and beautiful, Jane. When she clearly wasn't, it was like they thought one followed the other, if you were young, you were automatically beautiful. Oh, you're so young, Jane, you'll be able to fix my phone computer camera. When in fact a lot of her mother's friends were more technologically savvy than Jane. Oh, you're so young, Jane, you have so much energy. When she was so tired, so very, very tired. And listen, how do you support yourself, said Madeline worriedly, sitting up straight, as if this were a problem she needed to solve right this minute. Do you work? Jane nodded at her. I work for myself as a freelance bookkeeper. I've got a good client base now, lots of small businesses. I'm fast. So I turn the work over fast. It pays the rent. Clever girl, said Madeline approvingly. I supported myself too when Abigail was little. For the most part anyway. Every now and then Nathan would rouse himself to send a check. It was hard, but it was also sort of satisfying, in a fuck you kind of way. You know what I mean. Sure, said Jane. Jane's life as a single mother wasn't making a fuck you point to anyone. Or at least not in the way that Madeline meant. You'll definitely be one of the younger kindergarten mums, mused Madeline. She took a sip of her coffee and grinned wickedly. You're even younger than my ex-husband's delightful new wife. Promise me you won't make friends with her, will you? I got you first. 
I'm sure I won't even meet her, said Jane, confused. Oh, you will, grimaced Madeline. Her daughter is starting kindergarten at the same time as Chloe. Can you imagine? Jane couldn't imagine. The kindy mums will all have coffee, and there will be my ex-husband's wife sitting across the table, sipping her herbal tea. Don't worry, there won't be any punch-ups. Unfortunately it's all very boring and amicable and terribly grown up. Bonnie even kisses me hello. She's into yoga and chakras and all that shit. You know how you're meant to hate your wicked stepmother. My daughter adores her. Bonnie is so calm, you see. The opposite of me. She speaks in one of those soft, low, melodious voices that make you want to punch a wall. Jane laughed at Madeline's imitation of a low, melodious voice. You probably will make friends with Bonnie, said Madeline. She's impossible to hate. I'm very good at hating people, and even I find it difficult. I really have to put my heart and soul into it. She shifted the ice again on her ankle. When Bonnie hears I've hurt my ankle, she'll bring me a meal. She just loves any excuse to bring me a home-cooked meal. Probably because Nathan told her I'm a terrible cook, so she wants to make a point. Although the worst thing about Bonnie is that she's probably not actually making a point. She's just freakishly nice. I'd love to throw her meals straight in the bin, but they're too damn delicious. My husband and children would kill me. Madeline's expression changed. She beamed and waved. Oh. She's here at last. Celeste. Over here. Come and see what I've done. Jane looked up and her heart sank. It shouldn't matter. She knew it shouldn't matter. But the fact was that some people were so unacceptably, hurtfully beautiful, it made you feel ashamed. Your inferiority was right there on display for the world to see. This was what a woman was meant to look like. Exactly this. She was right, and Jane was wrong. You're a very fat, ugly little girl, a voice said insistently in her ear with hot, fetid breath. She shuddered and tried to smile at the horribly beautiful woman walking toward them. Thea, I assume you've heard by now that Bonnie is married to Madeline's ex-husband, Nathan. So that was complicated. You might want to explore that. I'm not telling you how to do your job, of course. Bonnie, that had absolutely nothing to do with anything. Our relationship was completely amicable. Just this morning I left a vegetarian lasagna on their doorstep for her poor husband. Gabrielle, I was new to the school. I didn't know a soul. Oh, we're such a caring school, the principal told me. Blah, blah, blah. Let me tell you, the first thing I thought when I walked into that playground on that kindergarten orientation day was cliquey. Cliquey, cliquey, cliquey. I'm not surprised someone ended up dead. Oh, all right. I guess that's overstating it. I was a little surprised. 5. Celeste pushed open the glass door of Blue Blues and saw Madeline straight away. She was sharing a table with a small, thin young girl wearing a blue denim skirt and a plain white v-neck t-shirt. Celeste didn't recognize the girl. She felt an instant, sharp sense of disappointment. Just the two of us, Madeline had said. Celeste readjusted her expectations of the morning. She took a deep breath. Recently, she'd noticed something strange happening when she talked to people in groups. She couldn't quite remember how to be. She'd find herself thinking, did I just laugh too loudly? Did I forget to laugh? Did I just repeat myself? For some reason when it was just her and Madeline, it was okay. It was because she'd known Madeline for such a long time. Her personality felt intact when it was just the two of them. Maybe she needed a tonic. That's what her grandmother would have said. What was a tonic? She weaved through the tables toward them. They hadn't noticed her yet. They were deep in conversation. 
She could see the girl's profile clearly. She was too young to be a school mother. She must be a nanny or an AU pair. Probably an AU pair. Maybe European. With not much English. That would explain the slightly stiff, strained way she was sitting, as though she needed to concentrate. Of course, maybe she had nothing to do with the school at all. Madeline travelled with ease through dozens of overlapping social circles, making both lifelong friends and lifetime enemies along the way, probably more of the latter. Madeline thrived on conflict and was never happier than when she was outraged. Madeline saw Celeste and her face lit up. One of the nicest things about Madeline was the way her face transformed when she saw you, as if there were no one else in the world she'd rather see. Hello, birthday girl. Celeste called out. Madeline's companion swung around in her chair. She had brown hair scraped back painfully hard from the forehead, like she was in the military or the police force. What happened to you, Madeline, said Celeste as she got close enough to see Madeline's leg propped up on the chair. She smiled politely at the girl, and the girl seemed to shrink away, as if Celeste had sneered, not smiled. Oh, God, she had smiled at her, hadn't she? This is Jane, said Madeline. She saved me from the side of the road after I twisted my ankle trying to save young lives. Jane, this is Celeste. Hi, said Jane. There was something naked and raw about Jane's face, like it had just been scrubbed too hard. She was chewing gum with tiny movements of her jaw, as if it were a secret. Jane is a new kindergarten mother, said Madeline as Celeste sat down. Like you. So it's my responsibility to bring you both up to date with everything you need to know about school politics at Pirui Public. It's a minefield, girls. A minefield, I tell you. School politics. Jane frowned and used two hands to pull hard on her ponytail so it was even tighter still. I won't get involved in any school politics. Me either, agreed Celeste. Celeste's birthday gift was a set of Waterford crystal champagne glasses. Oh my god, I love them. They're absolutely gorgeous, said Madeline. She carefully took one out of the box and held it up to the light, admiring the intricate design, rows of tiny moons. They must have cost you a small fortune. She almost said, thank God you're so rich, darling, but she stopped herself in time. She would have said it if it were just the two of them, but presumably Jane, a young single mother, was not well off, and of course, it was impolite to talk about money in company. She did actually know that. She said this defensively to her husband in her head, because he was the one who was always reminding her of the social norms she insisted on flouting. Why did they all have to tread so very delicately around Celeste's money? It was like wealth was an embarrassing medical condition. It was the same with Celeste's beauty. Strangers gave Celeste the same furtive looks they gave to people with missing limbs, and if Madeline ever mentioned Celeste's looks, Celeste responded with something like shame. Shush, she'd say, looking around fearfully in case someone overheard. Everyone wanted to be rich and beautiful, but the truly rich and beautiful had to pretend they were just the same as everyone else. Oh, it was a funny old world. So, school politics, girls, Madeline said as she carefully replaced the glass in the box. We'll start at the top with the blonde bobs. The blonde bobs. Celeste squinted as if there were going to be a test afterward. The blonde bobs rule the school. If you want to be on the PTA, you have to have a blonde bob, said Madeline. She demonstrated the required haircut with her hand. It's like a bylaw. Jane chortled, a dry little chuckle, and Madeline found herself desperate to make her laugh again. It shouldn't be peroxide blonde, obviously, it should be expensive blonde, and then you get it cut in that sort of mum haircut, where it's like a helmet. You're being mean. Celeste tapped her lightly on the arm. I'm not, protested Madeline. I love that hairstyle. 
I told Lucy Ponder when I'm ready to run for the PTA she can give me the approved blonde bob. She said to Jane, Lucy Ponder is a local hairdresser, and she's the daughter of the lady who lives in the house overlooking the school playground. Everyone is connected to everyone in Pirui. Really, said Jane. A flash of something both hopeful and fearful crossed her face, and she glanced quickly over her shoulder. It's okay, we're safe, no blonde bobs in sight, said Madeline. So are the blonde bobs nice, asked Celeste. Or should we steer clear? Well, they mean well, said Madeline. They mean very, very well. They're like. Hum, what are they like? She tapped her fingers on the table, trying to think of the right way to describe the blonde bobs. They're like mum prefects. They feel very strongly about their roles as school mums. It's like their religion. They're fundamentalist mothers. You're exaggerating, said Celeste. Of course I am, agreed Madeline. Are any of the kindergarten mothers blonde bobs, asked Jane. Let's see now, said Madeline. Oh yes, Harper. She's your quintessential blonde bob. She's on the PTA and she has a horrendously gifted daughter with a mild nut allergy. So she's part of the zeitgeist, lucky girl. Come on now, Madeline, there's nothing lucky about having a child with a nut allergy, said Celeste. I know, said Madeline. She knew she was getting too show-offy in her desire to make Jane laugh. I'm teasing. Let's see. Who else? There's Carol Quigley. She's sort of a wannabe blonde bob, she's not quite blonde enough. She's not actually on the PTA yet, but she's doing her bit for the school by keeping it clean. She's obsessed with cleanliness. She runs in and out of the classroom with a bottle of spray and wipe. She does not, said Celeste. She does. What about dads? Jane opened a packet of chewing gum and slipped another piece into her mouth like illegal contraband. She appeared to be obsessed with gum, although you couldn't really see her chewing it. She didn't quite meet Madeline's eye as she asked the question. Was she hoping to meet a single dad perhaps? Well, I've heard on the grapevine we've got at least one stay-at-home dad in kindergarten this year, said Madeline. His wife is some hotshot in the corporate world. Jackie somebody. She's the CEO of a bank, I think. Not Jackie Montgomery, said Celeste. That's it. Goodness, murmured Celeste. We'll probably never see her. It's hard for the mums working full-time. Who else works full-time? Oh. Renata. Renata is in one of those finance jobs, equities or, I don't know, stock options. Is that a thing? Or maybe she's an analyst. I think that's it. She analyzes stuff. Every time I ask her to explain her job, I forget to listen. Her children are geniuses too. Obviously. So Renata is a blonde bob, said Jane. No, no. She's a career woman. She has a full-time nanny. I think she just imported a new one from France. She likes European stuff. Renata doesn't have time to help at the school. She has board meetings to attend. Whenever you talk to her she's just been to a board meeting, or she's on her way back from a board meeting, or she's preparing for a board meeting. I mean, how often do these boards have to meet? Well, it depends on, began Celeste. It was a rhetorical question, interrupted Madeline. My point is she can't go more than five minutes before she mentions a board meeting, just like Thea Cunningham can't go more than five minutes without mentioning she has four children. She's a kindergarten mother too, by the way. She has four children. She can't get over it. Um, do I sound bitchy? Yes, said Celeste. Sorry, said Madeline. She did feel a bit guilty. I was trying to be entertaining. 
blame my ankle. Quite seriously, it's a very lovely school and everyone is very lovely and we're all going to have a lovely, lovely time and make lovely, lovely new friends. Jane chortled and did her discreet gum-chewing thing. She seemed to be drinking coffee and chewing gum at the same time. It was peculiar. So, these gifted and talented children, asked Jane. Are the children tested or something? There's a whole identification process, said Madeline. And they get special programs and opportunities. They stay in the same class, but they're given more difficult assignments, I guess, and sometimes they're pulled out for separate sessions with a specialist teacher. Look, obviously you don't want your child being bored in class, waiting for everyone else to catch up. I do understand that. I just get a little, well, for example, last year I had a little conflict with Renata. Madeline loves conflict, said Celeste to Jane. Renata somehow found time in between board meetings to ask the teachers to organize an exclusive little excursion just for the gifted kids. It was to see a play. Well, come on now, you don't have to be bloody gifted to enjoy theatre. I'm the marketing manager at the Pirawi Peninsula Theatre, you see, so that's how I got wind of it. She won of course, grinned Celeste. Of course I won, said Madeline. I got a special group discount and all the kids went and I got half-price champagne at interval for all the parents and we had a great time. Oh. Speaking of which, said Celeste. I nearly forgot to give you your champagne. Did I? Oh, yes, here it is. She rummaged through her voluminous straw basket in her typically breathless way and handed over a bottle of Bollinger. Can't give you champagne glasses without champagne. Let's have some now. Madeline lifted the bottle by the neck, suddenly inspired. No, no, said Celeste. Are you crazy? It's too early for drinking. We have to pick the kids up in two hours. And it's not chilled. Champagne breakfast, said Madeline. It's all in the way you package it. We'll have champagne and orange juice. Half a glass each. Over two hours. Jane? Are you in? I guess I could have a sip, said Jane. I'm a cheap drunk. I bet you are, because you weigh about ten kilos, said Madeline. We'll get on well. I love cheap drunks. More for me. Madeline, said Celeste. Keep it for another time. But it's the festival of Madeline, said Madeline sadly. And I'm injured. Celeste rolled her eyes. Pass me a glass. Thea, Jane was tipsy when she picked up Ziggy from orientation. So, you know, it just paints a certain type of picture, doesn't it? Young single mother drinking first thing in the morning. Chewing gum too. Not a good first impression. That's all I'm saying. Bonnie, for heaven's sake, nobody was drunk. They had a champagne breakfast at Blue Blues for Madeline's 40th. They were just a little giggly. That's what I heard, anyway, we actually couldn't make orientation day because we were doing a family healing retreat in Byron Bay. It was an incredible spiritual experience. Would you like the website address? Harper, you knew from the very first day that Madeline, Celeste, and Jane were a little threesome. They arrived with their arms around one another like twelve-year-olds. Renata and I didn't get invited to their little soiree, even though we'd known Madeline since all our boys were in kindergarten together, but as I said to Renata that night, when we were having the most divine degustation menu at Remy's, that was before the rest of Sydney discovered it by the way, I really didn't care less. Samantha, I was working. Stu took Lily to orientation. He mentioned some of the mothers had just come from a champagne breakfast. I said, right. What are their names? They sound like my sort of people. Jonathan, I missed all that. Stu and I were talking about cricket. Melissa, you didn't hear this from me, but apparently Madeline Mackenzie got so drunk that morning, 
she fell over and sprained her ankle. Graham, I think you're barking up the wrong tree there. I don't see how an ill-advised champagne breakfast could have led to murder and mayhem, do you? Champagne is never a mistake. That had always been Madeline's mantra. But afterward, Madeline did wonder if just this once it might have been a tiny error of judgment. Not because they were drunk. They weren't. It was because when the three of them walked into the school, laughing together, Madeline had decided she didn't want to stay in the car and miss seeing Chloe come out, so she hopped in, hanging onto their elbows, they trailed behind them the unmistakable scent of party. People never like missing out on a party. 6. Jane was not drunk when she arrived back at the school to pick up Ziggy. She had had three mouthfuls of that champagne at the most. But she was feeling euphoric. There had been something about the pop of the champagne cork, the naughtiness of it, the unexpectedness of the whole morning, those beautiful long fragile glasses catching the sunlight, the surfy-looking barista bringing over three exquisite little cupcakes with candles, the smell of the ocean, the feeling that she was maybe making new friends with these women who were somehow so different from any of her other friends, older, wealthier, more sophisticated. You'll make new friends when Ziggy starts school, her mother had kept telling her, excitedly and irritatingly, and Jane had to make a big effort not to roll her eyes and behave like a sulky, nervous teenager starting at a new high school. Jane's mother had three best friends whom she had met 25 years ago when Jane's older brother, Dane, started kindergarten. They all went out for coffee on that first morning and had been inseparable ever since. I don't need new friends, Jane had told her mother. Yes you do. You need to be friends with other mothers, her mother said. You support one another. You understand what you're going through. But Jane had tried that with mother's group and failed. She just couldn't relate to those bright, chatty women and their bubbly conversations about husbands who weren't stepping up and renovations that weren't finished before the baby was born and that hilarious time they were so busy and tired they left the house without putting on any makeup. Jane, who was wearing no makeup at the time, and never wore makeup, had kept her face blank and benign, while she inwardly shouted, What the fuck? And yet, strangely, she related to Madeline and Celeste, even though they really had nothing in common except for the fact that their children were starting kindergarten, and even though Jane was pretty sure that Madeline would never leave the house without makeup either, but she felt already that she and Celeste, who also didn't wear makeup, luckily, her beauty was shocking enough without improvement, could tease Madeline about this, and she'd laugh and tease them back, as if they were already established friends. So Jane wasn't ready for what happened. She wasn't on alert. She was too busy getting to know Pirawi public, everything so cute and compact, it made life seem so manageable, enjoying the sunshine and the still novel smell of the sea. Jane felt filled with pleasure at the thought of Ziggy's school days. For the first time since he was born, the responsibility of being in charge of Ziggy's childhood weighed lightly on her. Her new apartment was walking distance from the school. They would walk to school each day, past the beach and up the tree-lined hill. At her own suburban primary school she'd had views of a six-lane highway and the scent of barbecued chicken from the shop next door. There had been no cleverly designed, shady little play areas with charming, colourful tile mosaics of grinning dolphins and whales. There were certainly no murals of underwater sea scenes or stone sculptures of tortoises in the middle of sandpits. This school is so cute, she said to Madeline as she and Celeste helped Madeline hop along to a seat. It's magical. I know. Last year's school trivia night raised money to redo the schoolyard, said Madeline. The blonde bobs know how to fundraise. The theme was dead celebrities. It was great fun. Hey, are you any good at trivia, Jane? I'm excellent at trivia, said Jane. Trivia and jigsaws are my two areas of expertise. Jigsaws, said Madeline. I'd rather stick pins in my eyes. She sat down on a blue painted wooden bench built around the tree trunk of a Morton Bay fig and put her ankle up. A crowd of other parents soon formed around them, 
and Madeline held court, introducing Jane and Celeste to the mothers with older children she already knew and telling everyone the story of how she twisted her ankle saving young lives. Typical Madeline, a woman called Carol said to Jane. She was a soft-looking woman wearing a puffer-sleeved floral sundress and a big straw sun hat. She looked like she was off to a white clapboard church in Little House on the Prairie. Carol. Wasn't she the one Madeline said liked to clean? Clean Carol. Madeline just loves a fight, said Carol. She'll take on anyone. Our sons play soccer together, and last year she got in an argument with this giant dad. All the husbands were hiding, and Madeline was standing this close to him, poking her finger into his chest like this, not giving an inch. It's a wonder she didn't get herself killed. Oh, him. The under seven age coordinator. Madeline spat the words under seven age coordinator as if they were serial killer. I shall load that man until the day I die. Meanwhile Celeste stood off slightly to the side, chatting in that ruffled, hesitant way of hers, which Jane was already beginning to recognize as characteristic of Celeste. What did you say your son's name was again? Carol asked Jane. Ziggy, said Jane. Ziggy, repeated Carol uncertainly. Is that an ethnic sort of a name? Hello, there, I'm Renata. A woman with a crisp grey symmetrical haircut and intense brown eyes behind stylish black framed spectacles appeared in front of Jane, hand outstretched. It was like being accosted by a politician. She said her name with strange emphasis, as if Jane had been expecting her. Hello. I'm Jane. How are you? Jane tried to match her enthusiasm. She wondered if this was the school principal. A well-dressed, blonde woman, who Jane thought probably qualified as one of Madeline's blonde bobs, bustled over with a yellow envelope in her hand. Renata, she said, ignoring Jane. I've got that education report we were talking about at dinner. Just give me a moment, Harper, said Renata with a touch of impatience. She turned back to Jane. Jane, nice to meet you. I'm Amabella's mum, and I have Jackson in year two. That's Amabella, by the way, not Annabella. It's French. We didn't make it up. Harper continued to hover at Renata's shoulder, nodding along respectfully as Renata spoke, like those people who stand behind politicians at press conferences. Well, I just wanted to introduce you to Amabella and Jackson's nanny, who also happens to be French. Qual coincidence? This is Juliet. Renata indicated a petite girl with short red hair and an oddly arresting face, dominated by a huge, luscious-lipped mouth. She looked like a very pretty alien. Pleased to meet you. The nanny held out a limp hand. She had a strong French accent and looked bored out of her mind. You too, said Jane. I always think it's nice for the nannies to get to know each other. Renata looked brightly between the two of them. A little support group, shall we say. What nationality are you? She's not a nanny, Renata, said Madeline from the bench her voice brimming with laughter. Well, a you pair, then, said Renata impatiently. Renata, listen to me, she's a mother, said Madeline. She's just young. You know, like we used to be. Renata glanced uneasily at Jane, as if she suspected a practical joke, but before Jane had a chance to say anything, she felt like she should apologize, someone said, here they come and all the parents surged forward as a pretty, blonde, dimpled teacher who looked like she'd been cast for the role of kindergarten teacher ushered the children out from a classroom. Two little fair-headed boys charged out first like they'd been shot from a gun and headed straight for Celeste. OOF, grunted Celeste as two little fair heads rammed her stomach. I quite liked the idea of twins until I met Celeste's little demons, Madeline had told Jane when they were having their champagne and orange juice while Celeste smiled distractedly, apparently unoffended. 
Chloe sauntered out of the classroom with her arms linked with two other little princess-like girls. Jane anxiously scanned the children for Ziggy. Had Chloe dumped him? There he was. He was one of the last to come out, but he looked happy. Jane gave him an okay? Thumbs up signal, and Ziggy lifted both thumbs up and grinned. There was a sudden commotion. Everyone stopped to look. It was a little curly-haired girl. The last one to come out of the classroom. She was sobbing, her shoulders hunched, clutching her neck. Oh, breathed the mothers, because she looked so pitiful and brave and her hair was so pretty. Jane watched Renata hurry over, followed at a more relaxed pace by her odd-looking nanny. The mother, the nanny and the pretty, blonde teacher all bent down to the little girl's height to listen to her. Mummy! Ziggy ran to Jane, and she scooped him up. It seemed like ages since she'd seen him, as if they'd both been on journeys to exotic far-off lands. She buried her nose in his hair. How was it? Was it fun? Before he could answer, the teacher called out, could all the parents and children listen up for a moment? We've had such a lovely morning, but we just need to have a little chat about something. It's a little bit serious. The teacher's dimples quivered in her cheeks, as if she were trying to put them away for a more appropriate time. Jane let Ziggy slide back down to his feet. What's going on, said someone. Something happened to Amabella, I think, said another mother. Oh, God, said someone else quietly. Watch Renata get on the warpath. Now, someone just hurt Amabella, I'm sorry, Amabella, and I want whomever it was to come over and apologize, because we don't hurt our friends at school, do we, said the teacher in her teacher voice. And if we do, we always say sorry, because that's what big kindergarten children do. There was silence. The children either stared blankly at the teacher or swayed back and forth, looking at their feet. Some of them buried their faces against their mother's skirts. One of Celeste's twin boys tugged on her shirt. I'm hungry. Madeline hobbled over from her seat under the tree and stood next to Jane. What's the hold up? She looked around her. I don't even know where Chloe is. Who was it, Amabella, said Renata to the little girl. Who hurt you? The little girl said something inaudible. Was it an accident, maybe, Amabella, said the teacher desperately. It wasn't an accident, for heaven's sake, snapped Renata. Her face was aflame with righteous rage. Someone tried to choke her. I can see marks on her neck. I think she's going to have bruises. Good lord, said Madeline. Jane watched the teacher squat down at the little girl's level, her arm around her shoulders, her mouth close to her ear. Did you see what happened? Jane asked Ziggy. He shook his head vigorously. The teacher stood back up and fiddled with her earring as she faced the parents. Apparently one of the boys, um, well. My problem is that the children obviously don't know one another's names yet, so Amabella can't tell me exactly which little boy. We're not going to let this go, interrupted Renata. Absolutely not, agreed her hovering blonde friend. Harper, thought Jane, trying to get all the names straight hovering Harper. The teacher took a deep breath. No. We won't let it go. I wonder if I could ask all the children, well, actually, maybe just the boys, to come over here for just a moment. The parents pushed their sons forward with gentle shoves between the shoulder blades. Over you go, said Jane to Ziggy. He grabbed hold of her hand and looked up at her pleadingly. I'm ready to go home now. It's okay, said Jane. It's just for a moment. He wandered over and stood beside a boy who looked like a giant next to Ziggy. He was about a head taller than her son, with black curly hair and big strong shoulders. 
He looked like a little gangster. The boys formed a straggling line in front of the teacher. There were about fifteen, of all shapes and sizes. Celeste's fair-haired twins stood at the end, one of them was running a matchbox car over his brother's head, while the other one swatted it away like a fly. It's like a police lineup, said Madeline. Someone snickered. Stop it, Madeline. They should all face forward, then turn to the side to show their profiles, continued Madeline. To Celeste she said, if it's one of your boys, Celeste, she won't be able to tell the difference. We'll have to do DNA testing. Wait, do identical twins have the same DNA? You can laugh, Madeline, your child isn't a suspect, said another mother. They've got the same DNA but different fingerprints, said Celeste. Right, then, we'll have to dust for fingerprints, said Madeline. SHHHH, said Jane, trying not to laugh. She felt so desperately sorry for the mother of the child who was about to be publicly humiliated. The little girl called Amabella held on to her mother's hand. The red-headed nanny folded her arms and took a step back. Amabella surveyed the line of boys. It was him, she said immediately. She pointed at the little gangster kid. He tried to choke me. I knew it, thought Jane. But then for some reason the teacher was putting her hand on Ziggy's shoulder, and the little girl was nodding, and Ziggy was shaking his head. It wasn't me. Yes, it was, said the little girl. Detective Sergeant Adrian Quinlan, a post-mortem is currently being undertaken to ascertain cause of death, but at this stage I can confirm the victim suffered right rib fractures, a shattered pelvis, fractured base of skull, right foot and lower vertebrae. 7. Oh, calamity, thought Madeline. Wonderful. She'd just made friends with the mother of a little thug. He'd seemed so cute and sweet in the car. Thank God he hadn't tried to choke Chloe. That would have been awkward. Also, Chloe would have knocked him out with a right hook. Ziggy would never, said Jane. Her face had gone completely white. She looked horrified. Madeline saw the other parents take tiny steps back, forming a circle of space around Jane. It's all right. Madeline put a comforting hand on Jane's arm. They're children. They're not civilized yet. Excuse me. Jane stepped past two other mothers and into the middle of the little crowd, like she was stepping onto a stage. She put her hand on Ziggy's shoulder. Madeline's heart broke for them both. Jane seemed young enough to be her own daughter. In fact Jane reminded her a little of Abigail, that same prickliness and shy, dry humor. Oh dear, fretted Celeste next to Madeline. This is awful. I didn't do anything, said Ziggy in a clear voice. Ziggy, we just need you to say sorry to Amabella, that's all, said Miss Barnes. Beck Barnes had taught Fred when he was in kindergarten. It had been her first year out of teacher's college. She was good, but still very young and a bit too anxious to please the parents, which was absolutely fine when the parent was Madeline, but not when Renata Klein was the parent and out for revenge. Although to be fair, any parent would want an apology if another child tried to choke theirs. It probably hadn't helped that Madeline had made Renata look silly for thinking Jane was the nanny. Renata didn't like to look silly. Her children were geniuses, after all. She had a reputation to uphold. Board meetings to attend. Jane looked at Amabella. Sweetheart, are you sure it was this boy who hurt you? Could you say sorry to Amabella, please? You really hurt her quite badly, said Renata to Ziggy. She was speaking nicely, but firmly. Then we can all go home. But it wasn't me, said Ziggy. He spoke very clearly and precisely and looked Renata straight in the eye. Madeline took her sunglasses off and chewed on the stem. Maybe it wasn't him. Could Amabella have gotten it wrong? But she was gifted. 
she was actually quite a lovely little girl too. She'd been on playdates with Chloe and was very easygoing and let Chloe boss her about, taking the supporting role in whatever game they were playing. Don't lie, Renata snapped at Ziggy. She'd dropped a well-bred, I'm still nice to other people's kids even when they hurt mine demeanor. All you need to do is say sorry. Madeline saw Jane's body react instantly, instinctively, like the sudden rear of a snake or pounce of an animal. Her back straightened. Her chin lifted. Ziggy doesn't lie. Well, I can assure you Amabella is telling the truth. The little audience became very still. Even the other children were quiet, except for Celeste's twins, who were chasing each other around the playground, yelling something about ninjas. Okay, so we seem to have reached a stalemate here. Miss Barnes clearly didn't know what in the world to do. She was 24 years old, for heaven's sake. Chloe reappeared at Madeline's side, breathing hard from her exertions on the monkey bars. I need a swim, she announced. Shush, said Madeline. Chloe sighed. May I have a swim, please, mummy? Just shhhh. Madeline's ankle ached. This was not turning out to be a very good 40th birthday, thank you very much. So much for the festival of Madeline. She really needed to sit back down. Instead she limped into the middle of the action. Renata, she said. You know how children can be. Renata swung her head to glare at Madeline. The child needs to take responsibility for his actions. He needs to see there are consequences. He can't go around choking other children and pretend he didn't do it. Anyway, what's this got to do with you, Madeline? Mind your own beeswax. Madeline bristled. She was only trying to help. And mind your own beeswax was such a profoundly geeky thing to say. Ever since the conflict over the theatre excursion for the gifted and talented children last year, she and Renata had been tetchy with each other, even though they were ostensibly still friends. Madeline actually liked Renata, but right from the beginning there had been something competitive about their relationship. See, I'm just the sort of person who would be bored out of my mind if I had to be a full-time mother, Renata would say confidentially to Madeline and that wasn't meant to be offensive because Madeline wasn't actually a full-time mother, she worked part-time, but still, there was always the implication that Renata was the smart one, the one who needed more mental stimulation, because she had a career while Madeline had a job. It didn't help that Renata's older son Jackson was famous at school for winning chess tournaments, while Madeline's son Fred was famous for being the only student in the history of Pirui public brave enough to climb the giant Morton Bay fig tree and then leap the impossible distance onto the roof of the music room to retrieve 34 tennis balls. The fire brigade had to be called to rescue him. Fred's street cred at school was sky high. It doesn't matter, mummy. Amabella looked up at her mother with eyes still teary. Madeline could see the red finger marks around the poor child's neck. It does matter, said Renata. She turned to Jane. Please make your child apologize. Renata, said Madeline. Stay out of it, Madeline. Yes, I don't think we should get involved Madeline, said Harper who was predictably nearby and spent her life agreeing with Renata. I'm sorry, but I just can't make him apologize for something he says he didn't do, said Jane. Your child is lying, said Renata. Her eyes flashed behind her glasses. I don't think he is, said Jane. She lifted her chin. I just want to go home now, please, mummy, said Amabella. She began to sob in earnest. Renata's weird-looking new French nanny, who had been silent the whole time, picked her up, and Amabella wrapped her legs around her waist and buried her face in her neck. A vein pulsed in Renata's forehead. Her hands clenched and unclenched. This is completely unacceptable, Renata said to poor distraught Miss Barnes, who was probably wondering why they hadn't covered situations like this at Teachers College. 
Renata leaned down so that her face was only inches away from Ziggy. If you ever touch my little girl like that again, you will be in big trouble. Hey, said Jane. Renata ignored her. She straightened and spoke to the nanny. Let's go, Juliet. They marched off through the playground, while all the parents pretended to be busy tending to their children. Ziggy watched them go. He looked up at his mother, scratched the side of his nose and said, I don't think I want to come to school anymore. Samantha, all the parents have to go down to the police station and make a statement. I haven't had my turn yet. I feel quite sick about it. They'll probably think I'm guilty. Seriously, I feel guilty when a police car pulls up next to me at the traffic lights. 8. Five months before the trivia night. The reindeers ate the carrots. Madeline opened her eyes in the early morning light to see a half-eaten carrot shoved in front of her eyes by Chloe. Ed, who was snoring gently next to her, had taken a lot of time and care last night, gnawing on the carrots to make the most authentic-looking reindeer bites. Chloe was sitting comfortably astride Madeline's stomach in her pajamas, hair like a mop, big grin, wide-awake shiny eyes. Madeline rubbed her own eyes and looked at the clock. 6 a.m. probably the best they could hope for. Do you think Santa Claus left Fred a potato, said Chloe hopefully. Because he's been pretty naughty this year. Madeline had told her children that if they were naughty, Santa Claus might leave them a wrapped up potato, and they would always wonder what the wonderful gift was that the potato replaced. It was Chloe's dearest wish for Christmas that her brother would receive a potato. It would probably please her more than the dollhouse under the tree. Madeline had seriously considered wrapping up potatoes for both of them. It would be such an incentive for good behavior throughout the next year. Remember the potato, she could say. But Ed wouldn't let her. He was too damned nice. Is your brother up yet? She said to Chloe. I'll wake him, shouted Chloe and before Madeline could stop her she was gone, pounding down the hallway. Ed stirred. It's not morning time, is it? It couldn't be morning time. Deck the halls with something and holly, sang Madeline. Tra lo 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 lo, lo 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 lo. I'll pay you a thousand dollars if you stop that sound right now, said Ed. He put his pillow over his face. For a very nice man he was surprisingly cruel about her singing. You don't have a thousand dollars, said Madeline, and she launched into Silent Night. Her mobile phone beeped with a text message, and Madeline picked it up from the bedside table while still singing. It was Abigail. It was Abigail's year to spend Christmas Eve and morning with her father, Bonnie and her half-sister. Skye, who was born three months after Chloe, was a fair-haired, Faye little girl who followed Abigail around like an adoring puppy. She also looked a lot like Abigail had when she was a child, which made Madeline feel uneasy, and sometimes teary, as though something precious had been stolen from her. It was clear that Abigail preferred Skye to Chloe and Fred, who refused to idolize her, and Madeline often found herself thinking, but, Abigail, Chloe and Fred are your real brother and sister, you should love them more. Which was not technically true. Madeline could not quite believe that all three had equal footing as Abigail's half-siblings. She read the text, Merry Christmas, Mum. Dad, Bonnie, Skye and me all here at the shelter from 5.30am. I've already peeled 40 potatoes. It's a beautiful experience being able to contribute like this. Feel so blessed. Love, Abigail. She's never peeled a freaking potato in her life, muttered Madeline as she texted back, that's wonderful, darling. Merry Christmas to you too, see you soon, xxx. She put the phone down on the bedside table with a bang, suddenly exhausted, and tried her best to restrain the little eruption of fury behind her eyes. Feel so blessed. A beautiful experience this from a 14-year-old who whined if she was asked to set the table. 
Her daughter was starting to sound just like Bonnie. Blair, she said out loud. Bonnie had arranged for the whole family to volunteer at a homeless shelter on Christmas morning. I just hate all that crass commercialism of Christmas, don't you, she told Madeline last week, when they'd run into each other in the shops. Madeline had been doing Christmas shopping, and her wrists were looped with dozens of plastic shopping bags. Fred and Chloe were both eating lollipops, their lips a garish red. Meanwhile Bonnie was carrying a tiny bonsai tree in a pot, and Skye was walking along next to her eating a pear. A fucking pear, Madeline had told Celeste later. For some reason she couldn't get over the pear. How in the world had Bonnie managed to get Madeline's ex-husband out of bed at that time of morning to go to work in a homeless shelter? Nathan wouldn't get up before 8am in the 10 years they'd been together. Bonnie must give him organic blowjobs. Abigail is having a beautiful experience with Bonnie at the homeless shelter, Madeline said to Ed. Ed took his pillow off his face. That's revolting, he said. I know, said Madeline. This is why she loved him. Coffee, he said sympathetically. I'll get you coffee. Presents, shouted Chloe and Fred from down the hallway. Chloe and Fred couldn't get enough of the crass commercialism of Christmas. Harper, can you imagine how strange it must have been for Madeline to have her ex-husband's child in the same kindergarten class as her own child? I remember Renata and I talked about it over brunch. We were quite concerned how it would affect the classroom dynamics. Of course, Bonnie loved to pretend it was all so nice and amicable. Oh, we all have Christmas lunch together. Spare me. I saw them at the trivia night. I saw Bonnie throw her drink all over Madeline. 9. It was just becoming like when Celeste woke up on Christmas morning. Perry was sound asleep, and there was no sound from the adjoining room where the boys were sleeping. They'd been almost demented with excitement about Santa Claus finding them in Canada, letters had been sent to Santa informing him of the change of address and with their body clocks all confused, she and Perry had had terrible trouble getting them off to sleep. The boys were sharing a king-size bed, and they'd kept wrestling in that hysterical way they sometimes did, where laughter skidded into tears and then back again into laughter, and Perry had shouted from the next room, go to sleep, boys, and all of a sudden there was silence, and when Celeste had checked in a few seconds later they were both lying flat on their backs, arms and legs spread, as if exhaustion had simultaneously knocked them out cold. Come and look at this, she'd said to Perry, and he'd come in and stood next to her, and they'd watched them sleep for a few minutes before grinning at each other and tiptoeing out to have a drink to celebrate Christmas Eve. Now Celeste slid out from underneath the feathery quilt and walked to the window overlooking the frozen lake. She put her hand flat against the glass. It felt cold, but the room was warm. There was a giant Christmas tree in the center of the lake, glowing with red and green lights. Snowflakes fell softly. It was all so beautiful she felt like she could taste it. When she looked back on this holiday, she'd remember its flavor, full and fruity, like the mulled wine they'd had earlier. Today, after the boys had opened their presents and they'd eaten a room service breakfast, pancakes with maple syrup, they'd go out to play in the snow. They'd build a snowman. Perry had booked them a sleigh ride. Perry would post pictures of them all frolicking in the snow on Facebook. He'd write something like, the boys have their first white Christmas. He loved Facebook. Everyone teased him about it. Big, successful banker posting photos on Facebook, writing cheery comments about his wife's friend's recipe posts. Celeste looked back at the bed where Perry was sleeping. He always slept with a tiny perplexed frown, as if his dreams puzzled him. As soon as he woke he'd be desperate to give Celeste his gift. He loved giving presents. The first time she knew she wanted to marry him was when she saw the anticipation on his face, watching his mother open a birthday present he'd bought for her. Do you like it? He'd burst out as soon she tore the paper and his family had all laughed at him for sounding like a big kid. She wouldn't need to fake her pleasure. 
whatever he chose would be perfect. She'd always prided herself on her ability to choose thoughtful gifts, but Perry outdid her. On his last overseas trip he'd found the most ridiculously tizzy pink crystal champagne stopper. I took one look and thought Madeline, he'd said. Madeline had loved it of course. Today would be perfect in every way. The Facebook photos wouldn't lie. So much joy. Her life had so much joy. That was an actual verifiable fact. There really was no need to leave him until the boys finished high school. That would be the right time to leave. On the day they finished their last exams. Put down your pens, the exam supervisors would say. That's when Celeste would put down her marriage. Perry opened his eyes. Merry Christmas, smiled Celeste. Gabrielle, everyone thinks Celeste and Perry have the perfect marriage, but I'm not sure about that. I walked by them, sitting in their car parked on the side of the road on the trivia night. Celeste looked gorgeous, of course. I've personally witnessed her eating carps like there's no tomorrow, so don't tell me there's any justice in this world. They were both staring straight ahead, not looking at each other, all dressed up in their costumes, not saying a word. 10. Jane woke to the sound of people shouting Happy Christmas, from the street below her apartment window. She sat up in bed and tugged at her t-shirt, it was damp with sweat. She'd been dreaming. A bad one. She'd been lying flat on her back while Ziggy stood next to her, in his shorty pajamas, smiling down at her, one foot on her throat. Get off, Ziggy, I can't breathe, she'd been trying to say but he'd stopped smiling and was studying her with benign interest, as if he were performing a scientific experiment. She put her hand to her neck and took big gulps of air. It was just a dream. Dreams mean nothing. Ziggy was in bed with her. His warm back pressed against her. She turned around to face him and put a fingertip to the soft, fragile skin just above his cheekbone. He went to bed each night in his own bed and woke up each morning in with her. Neither of them ever remembered how he got there. Maybe it's magic, they decided. Maybe a good witch carries me in each night, Ziggy said, wide-eyed but with a bit of a grin, because he only half believed in all that kind of stuff. He'll just stop one day, Jane's mother said whenever Jane mentioned that Ziggy still came into her bed each night. He won't be still doing it when he's fifteen. There was a new freckle on Ziggy's nose Jane hadn't noticed before. He had three freckles on his nose now. They formed the shape of a sail. One day a woman would lie in bed next to Ziggy and study his sleeping face. There would be tiny black dots of whiskers across his upper lip. Instead of those skinny little boy shoulders, he'd have a broad chest. What sort of man would he be? He's going to be a gentle, lovely man just like Poppy, her mother would say adamantly, as if she knew this for an absolute fact. Jane's mother believed Ziggy was her own beloved father, reincarnated. Or she pretended to believe this, anyway. Nobody could really tell how serious she was. Poppy had died six months before Ziggy was born, right when Jane's mother had been halfway through reading a book about a little boy who was supposedly a reincarnated World War II fighter pilot. The idea that her grandson might actually be her dad had gotten stuck in her head. It had helped with her grieving. And of course, there was no son-in-law to offend with talk that his son was actually his wife's grandfather. Jane didn't exactly encourage the reincarnation talk, but she didn't discourage it either. Maybe Ziggy was Poppy. Sometimes she could discern a faint hint of Poppy in Ziggy's face, especially when he was concentrating. He got the same puckered forehead. Her mother had been furious when Jane called to tell her what had happened at the orientation day. That's outrageous. Ziggy would never choke another child. That child has never harmed a fly. He's just like Poppy. Remember how Poppy couldn't bear to swat a fly? Your grandma would be dancing about, yelling, Kill it, Stan. Kill the damn thing. 
There had been silence then, which meant that Jane's mother had been felled by an attack of the giggles. She was a silent giggler. Jane had waited it out, until her mother finally got back on the phone and said shakily, Oh, that did me good. Laughter is wonderful for the digestion. Now, where were we? Oh yes. Ziggy. That little brat. Not Ziggy, of course, the little girl. Why would she accuse our darling Ziggy? I don't know, said Jane. But the thing is, she didn't seem like a brat. The mother was sort of awful, but her daughter seemed nice. Not a brat. She could hear the uncertainty in her voice, and her mother heard it too. But darling, you can't possibly think Ziggy really tried to choke another child. Of course not, Jane had said, and changed the subject. She readjusted her pillow and wriggled into a more comfortable position. Maybe she could go back to sleep. Ziggy will have you up at the crack of dawn, her mother had said, but Ziggy didn't seem overly excited about Christmas this year, and Jane wondered if she'd failed him in some way. She often experienced an uneasy sense that she was somehow faking a life for him, giving him a pretend childhood. She tried her best to create little rituals and family traditions for birthdays and holidays. Let's put your stocking out now. But where? They'd move too often for there to be a regular spot. The end of his bed. The door handle. She floundered about, and her voice became high and strained. There was something fraudulent about it. The rituals weren't real like they were in other families where there was a mum and a dad and at least one sibling. Sometimes she felt like Ziggy might be just going along with it for her sake, and that he could see right through her, and he knew he was being shortchanged. She watched the rise and fall of his chest. He was so beautiful. There was no way he hurt that little girl and lied about it. But all sleeping children were beautiful. Even really horrible children probably looked beautiful when they slept. How could she know for sure that he hadn't done it? Did anyone really know their child? Your child was a little stranger, constantly changing, disappearing and reintroducing himself to you. New personality traits could appear overnight. And then there was. Don't think about it. Don't think about it. The memory fluttered like a trapped moth in her mind. It had been trying so hard to escape ever since the little girl had pointed at Ziggy. The pressure on Jane's chest. Terror rising, flooding her mind. A scream trapped in her throat. The bruises were black, purple and red. She's going to have bruises, the child's mother had said. No, no, no. Ziggy was Ziggy. He could not. He would not. She knew her child. He stared. His blue-veined eyelids twitched. Guess what day it is, said Jane. Christmas, shouted Ziggy. He sat up so fast, the side of his head slammed violently against Jane's nose and she fell back against the pillow, tears streaming. Thea. I always thought there was something not quite right about that child. That Ziggy. Something funny about his eyes. Boys need a male role model. I'm sorry, but it's a fact. Stu, bloody hell, there was a lot of fuss about that Ziggy kid. I didn't know what to believe. 11. Do you fly as high as this plane, Daddy? asked Josh. They were about seven hours into their flight from Vancouver back home to Sydney. So far so good. No arguments. They'd put the boys on either side of them in separate window seats and Celeste and Perry were in adjacent hall seats. Nope. Remember I told you. I have to fly really low to avoid radar detection, said Perry. Oh yeah. Josh turned his face back to the window. Why do you have to avoid radar detection, asked Celeste. Perry shook his head and shared a tolerant women, grin with Max, who was sitting on the other side of Celeste and had leaned over to listen to the conversation. 
It's obvious isn't it, Max? It's top secret, mummy, Max told her kindly. No one knows that daddy can fly. Oh, of course, said Celeste. Sorry. Silly of me. See, if I got caught, they'd probably want to run a whole battery of tests on me, said Perry. Find out just how I develop these superpowers, then they'd want to recruit me for the Air Force, I'd have to go on secret missions. Yeah, and we don't want that, said Celeste. Daddy already travels enough. Perry reached across the aisle and put his hand over hers in silent apology. You can't really fly, said Max. Perry raised his eyebrows, widened his eyes and gave a little shrug. Can't I? I don't think so, said Max uncertainly. Perry winked at Celeste over Max's head. He'd been telling the twins for years that he had secret flying abilities, going into ridiculous detail about how he'd discovered his secret powers when he was 15, which was the age when they'd probably learned to fly too, assuming they'd inherited his powers and eaten enough broccoli. The boys could never tell if he was serious or not. I was flying when I skied over that big jump yesterday, said Maximum. He used his hand to demonstrate his trajectory. Whoosh. Yeah, you were flying, said Perry. You nearly gave Daddy a heart attack. Max chuckled. Perry linked his hands in front of him and stretched out his back. Ow. I'm still stiff from trying to keep up with you lot. You're all too fast. Celeste studied him. He looked good, tanned and relaxed from the last five days, skiing and sledding. This was the problem. She was still hopelessly, helplessly attracted to him. What? Perry glanced at her. Nothing. Good holiday, eh? It was a great holiday, said Celeste with feeling. Magical. I think this is going to be a good year for us, said Perry. He held her eyes. Don't you? With the boys starting school, hopefully you'll get a bit more time to yourself, and I'm. He stopped, and ran his thumb across his armrest as if he were doing some sort of quality control test. Then he looked up at her. I'm going to do everything in my power to make this a good year for us. He smiled self-consciously. He did this sometimes. He said or did something that made her feel as besotted with him as she'd been that very first year after they'd met at that boring business lunch, where she'd first truly understood those four words, swept off my feet. Celeste felt a sense of peace wash over her. A flight steward was coming down the aisle, offering chocolate chip cookies baked on board the plane. The aroma was delicious. Maybe it was going to be a really good year for them. Perhaps she could stay. It was always such a glorious relief when she allowed herself to believe she could stay. Let's go down to the beach when we get home, said Perry. We'll build a big sandcastle. Snowman one day. Sandcastle the next. Gosh you kids have a good life. Yep, Josh yawned, and stretched out luxuriously in his business class seat. It's pretty good. Melissa, I remember I saw Celeste and Perry and the twins down on the beach during the school holidays. I said to my husband, I think that's one of the new kindergarten mums. His eyes nearly popped out of his head. Celeste and Perry were all loving and laughing and helping their kids make this really elaborate sandcastle. It was kind of sickening, to be honest. Like, even their sandcastles were better than ours. 12. Detective Sergeant Adrian Quinlan, we're looking at all angles, all possible motives. Samantha, so we're, like, seriously using the word. Murder. For months before the trivia night. I want to have a playdate with Ziggy, announced Chloe one warm summer night early in the new year. All right, said Madeline. Her eyes were on her older daughter. Abigail had taken an age cutting up her steak into tiny precise squares, and now she was pushing the little squares back and forth, 
as if she were arranging them into some sort of complicated mosaic. She hadn't put a single piece in her mouth. Ed said quietly to Madeline, wasn't Ziggy the one who, you know? He put his hands to his throat and made his eyes bulge. What are you doing, Daddy? Chloe giggled fondly. Daft Daddy. You should have a playdate with Skye. Abigail put down her fork and spoke to Chloe. She's very excited about being in the same class as you. That's nice, isn't it, said Madeline in the strained, sugary tone she knew she used whenever her ex-husband's daughter came up in conversation. Isn't that nice? Ed spluttered on his wine, and Madeline gave him a dark look. Sky is sort of like my sister, isn't she, mummy, said Chloe now. Unlike her mother, she'd been thrilled to learn she was going to be in the same kindergarten class as Sky and she'd asked this question about 40,000 times. No, Sky is Abigail's half-sister, said Madeline with saint-like patience. But I'm Abigail's sister too, said Chloe. So that means Sky and I must be sisters. We could be twins, like Josh and Max. Speaking of which, have you seen Celeste since they got back from Canada, asked Ed, those photos Perry put on Facebook were amazing. We should have a white Christmas one day. When we win the lottery. Biaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaa
I'm sure Madeline and Bonnie were fighting about Abigail at the trivia night. Harper, I actually heard Madeline say, I'm going to kill someone before the night is out. I assumed it was something to do with Bonnie. Not that I'm pointing fingers, of course. Bonnie, yes, Abigail is my stepdaughter, and it's absolutely true that Abigail had a few, well, issues, just typical teenage girl issues, but Madeline and I were working together as a team to help her. Can you smell lemon myrtle? I'm trying this new incense for the first time. It's good for stress. Take a deep breath. That's it. You look like you need a little stress relief, if you don't mind my saying. 13. It was one of those days. It had been a while. Not since well before Christmas. Celeste's mouth was dry and hollow. Her head throbbed gently. She followed the boys and Perry through the schoolyard with her body held stiffly, carefully, as if she were a tall fragile glass in danger of spilling. She was hyper aware of everything, the warm air against her bare arms, the straps of her sandals in between her toes, the edges of the leaves of the Morton Bay fig tree, each sharply delineated against the blue of the sky. It was similar to that intense way you felt when you were newly in love, or newly pregnant, or driving a car on your own for the very first time. Everything felt significant. Do you and Ed fight? she'd asked Madeline once. Like cats and dogs, Madeline had said cheerfully. Celeste could somehow tell she was talking about something else entirely. Can we show Daddy the monkey bars first, cried Max. School started back in two weeks, but the uniform shop was open for two hours this morning so parents could get what they needed for the new year. Perry had the day off, and after they picked up the boys' uniforms they were going around the point to take the boys snorkeling. Sure, said Celeste to Maximum. He ran off, and as she watched him go she realized it wasn't Maximum. It was Josh. She was losing her grip. She thought she was concentrating too hard when she wasn't concentrating enough. Perry ran his fingertip down her arm and she shivered. You okay, he asked. He lifted his sunglasses so she could see his eyes. The whites were very white. Her eyes were always bloodshot the morning after an argument, but Perry's eyes were always clear and shining. Fine. She smiled at him. He smiled back and pulled her to him. You look beautiful in that dress, he said in her ear. This was the way they always behaved with each other the day after, tender and tremulous, as if they'd been through something terrible together, like a natural disaster, as if they'd barely escaped with their lives. Daddy, shrieked Josh. Come and watch us. Coming, cried Perry. He banged his fists against his chest like a gorilla and ran after them with his back hunched and his arms swinging, making gorilla noises. The boys went crazy with delighted terror and ran off. It was just a bad fight, she told herself. All couples fight. The previous night the boys had stayed overnight at Perry's mother's place. Have a romantic dinner without these little ruffians, she'd said. It had started over the computer. She'd been double-checking the opening times for the uniform shop when the computer said something about a catastrophic error. Perry, she'd called from the office, there's something wrong with the computer, and a tiny part of her warned, no, don't tell him. What if he can't fix it? Stupid, stupid, stupid. She should have known better. But it was too late. He came into the office, smiling. Step aside, woman, he'd said. He was the one who was good with computers. He liked being able to solve problems for her, and if he could have fixed it then, everything would have been fine. But he couldn't fix it. The minutes passed. She could see by the set of his shoulders that it wasn't going well. Don't worry about it, she said. Leave it. I can do it, he said. He moved the mouse back and forth. 
I know what the problem is, I just need to. Damn it. He swore again. Softly at first, and then louder. His voice became like a blow. She winced each time. And as his fury rose, a kind of matching fury rose within her, because she could already see exactly how the night was going to proceed, and how it could have proceeded if she hadn't made such a catastrophic error. The seafood platter she'd prepared would sit there uneaten. The pavlova would slide straight from the tray into the bin. All that time and effort and money wasted. She hated waste. It made her feel sick. So when she said, please, Perry, just leave it, there was frustration in her voice. That was her fault. Maybe if she'd spoken nicely. Been more patient. Said nothing. He swiveled the chair to face her. His eyes were already shiny with rage. Too late. He was gone. It was all over, Red Rover. And yet she didn't retreat. She refused to retreat. She kept fighting right to the end because of the injustice of it, the ridiculousness of it. I asked him to help fix the computer. It should not be like this, a part of her continued to inwardly rage, even as the yelling began and her heart pounded and her muscles tensed in readiness. It's not fair. It's not right. It was even worse than usual because the boys weren't at home. They didn't have to keep their voices down, to hiss at each other behind closed doors. The house was too big for the neighbors to hear them shout. It was almost like they both relished the opportunity to fight without boundaries. Celeste walked down toward the monkey bars. They were in a cool, shady bottom corner of the playground. The boys would love playing here when they started school. Perry was doing chin-ups on the monkey bars while the boys counted. His shoulders moved gracefully. He had to hold his legs up high because the monkey bars were so low to the ground. He'd always been athletic. Was there some sick, damaged part of Celeste that actually liked living like this and wanted this shameful, dirty marriage? That's how she thought of it. As if she and Perry engaged in some sort of strange, disgusting and perverted sexual practice. And sex was part of it. There was always sex afterward. When it was all over. At about 5 a.m. fierce, angry sex, with tears that slid onto each other's faces and tender apologies and the words murmured over and over, never again, I swear on my life, never again, this has to stop, we have to stop this, we should get help, never again. Come on she said to the boys. Let's get to the uniform shop before it closes. Perry dropped easily to the ground and grabbed a twin under each arm. Gotcha. Did she love him as much as she hated him? Did she hate him as much as she loved him? We should try another counselor, she'd said to him early this morning. You're right, he'd said, as if it were an actual possibility. When I get back. We'll talk about it then. He was going away the next day. Vienna. It was a summit his firm was sponsoring. He would be delivering the keynote address on something terribly complex and global. There would be a lot of acronyms and incomprehensible jargon, and he'd stand there with a little pointer, making a red dot of light zip about on the PowerPoint presentation prepared by his executive assistant. Perry was away often. He sometimes felt like an aberration in her life. A visitor. Her real life took place when he wasn't there. What happened never mattered all that much because he was always about to leave, the next day or the next week. Two years ago, they'd gone to a counselor. Celeste had been buoyant with hope, but as soon as she saw the cheap vinyl couch and the counselor's eager, earnest face, she knew it was a mistake. She watched Perry weigh up his superior intelligence and social standing relative to the counselor and knew that this would be their first and last visit. They never told her the truth. They talked about how Perry found it frustrating that Celeste didn't get up early enough and was always running late. Celeste said that sometimes Perry lost his temper. How could they admit to a stranger what went on in their marriage? 
the shame of it, the ugliness of their behavior. They were a fine-looking couple. People had been telling them that for years. They were admired and envied. They had all the privileges in the world. Overseas travel. A beautiful home. It was ungracious and ungrateful of them to behave the way they did. Just stop it, that nice eager woman would have surely said, disgusted and disapproving. Celeste didn't want to tell her either. She wanted her to guess. She wanted her to ask the right question. But she never did. After they left the counselor's office, they were both so exhilarated to be out of there, their performance over, that they went to a hotel bar in the middle of the afternoon and had a drink, and flirted with each other, and they couldn't keep their hands off each other. Halfway through his drink, Perry suddenly stood, took her hand and led her to the reception desk. They literally got a room. Ha ha. So funny, so sexy. It was as though the counselor really had fixed everything. Because after all, how many married couples did that? Afterward she felt seedy and sexy and disheveled and filled with despair. So where's the uniform shop, said Perry as they walked back up into the school's main quadrangle. I don't know, said Celeste. How should I know? Why should I know? The uniform shop, did you say? It's over here. Celeste turned around. It was that intense little woman with the glasses from the orientation day. The one whose daughter said Ziggy tried to choke her. The curly-haired little girl was with her. I'm Renata, said the woman. I met you at the orientation day last year. You're friends with Madeline Mackenzie, aren't you? Amabella, stop that. What are you doing? The little girl was holding onto her mother's white shirt and shyly twisting her body behind her mother's. Come and say hello. These are some of the boys who will be in your class. They're identical twins. Isn't that so interesting? She looked at Perry, who had deposited the boys at his feet. How in the world do you ever tell them apart? Perry held out his hand. Perry, he said. We can't tell them apart either. No idea which is which. Renata pumped Perry's hand enthusiastically. Women always took to Perry. It was that Tom Cruise, white-toothed smile and the way he gave them his full attention. Very pleased to meet you. Here to get the boys their uniforms, are you? Exciting. Amabella was going to come with her nanny but then my board meeting finished early so I decided to come myself. Perry nodded along, as if this were all very fascinating. Renata lowered her voice. Amabella has become a little anxious ever since the incident at the school. Did your wife tell you? A little boy tried to choke her on the orientation day. She had bruises on her neck. A little boy called Ziggy. We seriously considered reporting it to the police. That's terrible, said Perry. Jesus. Your poor little girl. Daad, said Max, pulling on his father's hand. Hurry up. Actually, I'm sorry, said Renata, looking brightly at Celeste. I might have put my foot in it. Didn't you and Madeline have some sort of little birthday party with that boy's mother? Jane? Was that her name? A very young girl. I mistook her for an AU pair. You might all be best friends, for all I know. I hear you were all drinking champagne. In the morning. Ziggy, frowned Perry. We don't know anyone with a kid called Ziggy, do we? Celeste cleared her throat. I met Jane for the first time that day, she said to Renata. She gave Madeline a lift after she hurt her ankle. She was, well, she seemed very nice. She didn't particularly want to be aligned with the mother of a bully, but on the other hand she'd like Jane, and the poor girl had looked quite sick when Renata's daughter pointed out Ziggy. She's deluded, that's what she is, said Renata. She absolutely refused to accept that her precious child did what he did. 
I've told Amabella to stay well away from this Ziggy. If I were you I'd tell your boys to steer clear too. Probably a good idea, said Perry. We don't want them getting in with a bad crowd from day one. His tone was light and humorous, as if he weren't really taking any of it seriously, although, knowing Perry, the lightness was probably a cover. He had a particular paranoia about bullying because of his own experiences as a child. He was like a secret service guy when it came to his boys, his eyes darting about suspiciously, monitoring the park or the playground for rough kids or savage dogs or pedophiles posing as grandfathers. Celeste opened her mouth. Um, she said. They're five. Is this a bit over the top? But then again, there was something about Ziggy. She'd only seen him briefly at the school, and she couldn't put her finger on exactly what it was about his face, but there was something about him that made her feel off balance, something that filled her with mistrust. But he was a beautiful little five-year-old boy, just like her boys. How could she feel like that about a five-year-old? Mum! Come on! Josh yanked on Celeste's arm. She clutched at her tender right shoulder. Ow! For a moment the pain was so sharp, she fought nausea. Are you all right, said Renata. Celeste, said Perry. She could see the shameful recognition in his eyes. He knew exactly why it had hurt so much. There would be an exquisite piece of jewellery in his bag when he returned from Vienna. Another piece for her collection. She would never wear it, and he would never ask why. For a moment Celeste couldn't speak. Big blocky words filled her mouth. She imagined letting them spill out. My husband hits me, Renata. Never on the face of course. He's far too classy for that. Does yours hit you? And if he does, and this is the question that really interests me, do you hit back? I'm fine, she said. 14. I've invited Jane and Ziggy over for a playdate next week. Madeline was on the phone to Celeste as soon as she hung up from Jane. I think you and the boys should come too. In case we run out of things to say. Right, said Celeste. Thanks so much. A playdate with the little boy who. Yes, yes, said Madeline. The little strangler. But you know, our kids aren't exactly shrinking violets. I actually met the victim's mother yesterday when we were getting the boys' uniforms, said Celeste. Renata. She's telling her daughter to avoid having anything to do with Ziggy and she suggested I tell my boys the same. Madeline's hand tightened on the phone. She had no right to tell you that. I think she was just concerned. You can't blacklist a child before he's even started school. Well, I don't know, you can sort of understand, from her point of view. I mean, if that happened to Chloe, I mean, I guess. Madeline pressed the phone to her ear as Celeste's voice drifted. Ever since Madeline had first met her, Celeste had had this habit. She'd be chatting perfectly normally, and then she'd suddenly be floating off with the fairies. That's how they'd met in the first place, because Celeste had been dreaming. Their kids were in swimming class together as toddlers. Chloe and the twins had stood on a little platform at the edge of the swimming pool while the teacher gave each child a turn practicing their dog paddle and floating. Madeline had noticed the gorgeous-looking mother watching the class, but they'd never bothered to talk to each other. Madeline was normally busy keeping an eye on Fred, who was four at the time and a handful. On this particular day, Fred had been happily distracted with ice cream, and Madeline was watching Chloe have her turn floating like a starfish when she noticed there was only one twin boy standing on the platform. Hey, shouted Madeline at the teacher. Hey! She looked for the beautiful mother. She was standing off to the side, staring off into the distance. Your little boy, she screamed. People turned their heads in slow motion. The pool supervisor was nowhere to be seen. For fuck's sake, said Madeline, and she jumped straight into the water, fully dressed, 
stilettos and all, and pulled Max from the bottom of the pool, choking and spluttering. Madeline had yelled at everyone in sight, while Celeste hugged her two wet boys to her and sobbed crazy, grateful thanks. The swim school had been both obsequiously apologetic and appallingly evasive. The child wasn't in danger, but they were sorry it appeared that way and they would most certainly review their procedures. They both pulled their children out of the swim school, and Celeste, who was an ex-lawyer, wrote them a letter demanding compensation for Madeline's ruined shoes, her dry-clean only dress and of course a refund of all their fees. So they became friends. And Madeline understood when Celeste first introduced her to Perry and it became clear that she'd only told her husband that they'd met through swimming lessons. It wasn't always necessary to tell your husband the whole story. Now Madeline changed the subject. Has Perry gone away to wherever he's going this time, she asked. Celeste's voice was suddenly crisp and clear again. Vienna. Yes. He'll be gone for three weeks. Missing him already, said Madeline. Joke. There was a pause. You still there? asked Madeline. I like having toast for dinner, said Celeste. Oh yes, I have yogurt and chocolate biscuits for dinner whenever Ed goes away, said Madeline. Good lord, why do I look so tired? She was making the phone call while sitting on the bed in the office spare room where she always folded laundry, and she'd just caught sight of her reflection in the mirrored wardrobe on one side of the wall. She got off the bed and walked over to the mirror, the phone still held to her ear. Maybe because you are tired, suggested Celeste. Madeline pressed a fingertip beneath her eye. I had a great night's sleep, she said. Every day I think, gosh, you look a bit tired today, and it's just recently occurred to me that it's not that I'm tired, it's that this is the way I look now. Cucumbers. Isn't that what you do to reduce puffiness, said Celeste idly. Madeline knew that Celeste was spectacularly disinterested in a whole chunk of life that Madeline relished, clothes, skincare, makeup, perfume, jewellery, accessories. Sometimes Madeline looked at Celeste with her long red gold hair pulled back any old how and she longed to grab her and play with her like she was one of Chloe's Barbie dolls. I am mourning the loss of my youth, she told Celeste. Celeste snorted. I know I wasn't that beautiful to begin with. You're still beautiful, said Celeste. Madeline made a face at herself in the mirror and turned away. She didn't want to admit, even to herself, just how much the aging of her face really did genuinely depress her. She wanted to be above such superficial concerns. She wanted to be depressed about the state of the world, not the crumpling and creasing of her skin. Each time she saw evidence of the natural aging of her body, she felt irrationally ashamed, as if she weren't trying hard enough. Meanwhile, Ed got sexier each year that went by as the lines around his eyes deepened and his hair grayed. She sat back down on the spare bed and began folding clothes. Bonnie came to pick up Abigail today, she told Celeste. She came to the door and she looked like, I don't know, a Swedish fruit picker, with this red and white checked scarf on her head, and Abigail ran out of the house. She ran. As if she couldn't wait to get away from her old hag of a mother. Ah, said Celeste. Now I get it. Sometimes I feel like I'm losing Abigail. I feel her drifting, and I want to grab her and say, Abigail, he left you too. He walked out on both of us. But I have to be the grown-up. And the awful thing is, I think she is actually happier when she's with their stupid family, meditating and eating chickpeas. Surely not, said Celeste. I know, right? I hate chickpeas. Really? I quite like chickpeas. They're good for you too. Shut up. So are you bringing the boys over to play with Ziggy? I feel like that poor little Jane is going to need some friends this year. Let's be her friends and look after her. Of course we'll come, said Celeste. I'll bring chickpeas. 
Mrs. Lipman, no. The school has not had a trivia night end in bloodshed before. I find that question offensive and inflammatory. 15. I want to live in a double-decker house like this, said Ziggy as they walked up the driveway to Madeline's house. Do you, said Jane. She adjusted her bag in the crook of her arm. In her other arm she carried a plastic container of freshly baked banana muffins. You want a life like this? I'd quite like a life like this too. Hold this for a moment, will you? She handed Ziggy the container so she could take another two pieces of gum out of her bag, studying the house as she did. It was an ordinary two-story, cream brick family house. A bit ramshackle looking. The grass needed a mow. Two double kayaks hung above the car in the garage. Boogie boards and surfboards leaned against the walls. Beach towels hung over the balcony. A child's bike had been abandoned on the front lawn. There wasn't anything all that special about this house. It was similar to Jane's family home, although Jane's home was smaller and tidier, and they were an hour's drive from the beach, so there wasn't all the evidence of the beach activities, but it had the same casual, simple, suburban feel. This was childhood. It was so simple. Ziggy wasn't asking for too much. He deserved a life like this. If Jane hadn't gone out that night, if she hadn't drunk that third tequila slammer, if she'd said no thank you when he'd slid onto the seat next to hers, if she'd stayed home and finished her law degree and gotten a job and a husband and a mortgage and done it all the proper way, then maybe one day she would have lived in a family house and been a proper person living a proper life. But then Ziggy wouldn't have been Ziggy. And maybe she wouldn't have had any children at all. She remembered the doctor, his sad frown, just a year before she got pregnant. Jane, you need to understand, it's going to be very difficult, if not impossible, for you to conceive. Ziggy. Ziggy, Ziggy, Ziggy. The front door flew open and Chloe, in a fairy dress and gumboots, came running out and dragged Ziggy off by the hand. You're here to play with me, okay? Not my brother Fred. Madeline appeared behind her, wearing a red and white polka-dotted 1950s-style dress with a full skirt. Her hair was pulled up in a swinging ponytail. Jane. Happy New Year. How are you? It's so lovely to see you. Look, my ankle is all healed. Although you'll be pleased to see I'm wearing flat shoes. She stood on one foot and twirled her ankle, showing off a sparkly red ballet shoe. They're like Dorothy's ruby slippers, said Jane, handing Madeline the muffins. Exactly, don't you love them, said Madeline. She unpeeled the lid of the container. Good lord. Don't tell me you baked these. I did, said Jane. She could hear Ziggy's laughter from somewhere upstairs. Her heart lifted at the sound. Look at you, with freshly baked muffins, and I'm the one dressed like a 1950s housewife, said Madeline. I love the idea of baking, but then I can't seem to make it a reality, I never seem to have all the ingredients. How do you manage to have all that flour and sugar and, I don't know, vanilla extract? Well, said Jane, I buy them. From this place called a supermarket. I suppose you make a list, said Madeline. And then you remember to take the list with you. Jane saw that Madeline's feelings about Jane's baking were similar to Jane's feelings about Madeline's accessories, confused admiration for an exotic behavior. Celeste and the boys are coming today. She'll hoover up those muffins of yours. Tea or coffee? We'd better not have champagne every time we meet, although I could be convinced. Got anything to celebrate? Madeline led her into a big combined kitchen and living area. Nothing to celebrate, said Jane. Just ordinary tea would be great. So how did the move go, asked Madeline. We were away up the coast when you were moving, otherwise I would have offered Ed to help you. I'm always offering him up as a mover. He loves it. Seriously. 
no, no. He hates it. He gets so cross with me. He says, I'm not an appliance you can loan out. She put on a deep voice to imitate her husband as she switched the kettle on, her ponytail swinging. But you know, he pays money to lift weights at the gym, so why not lift a few boxes for free? Have a seat. Sorry about the mess. Jane sat down at a long timber table covered with the detritus of family life, ballerina stickers, a novel face down, sunscreen, keys, some sort of electronic toy, an airplane made out of Legos. My family helped me move, said Jane. There are a lot of stairs. Everyone was kind of mad at me, but they are the ones who never let me pay for movers. If I'm lugging this freaking refrigerator back down these stairs in six months' time, then all her brother had said. Milk? Sugar, asked Madeline as she dunked tea bags. Neither, just black. Um, I saw one of those kindergarten mothers this morning, Jane told Madeline. She wanted to bring up the subject of the orientation day while Ziggy wasn't in the room. At the gas station. I think she pretended not to see me. She didn't think it. She knew it. The woman had snapped her head in the other direction so fast, it was like she'd been slapped. Oh, really? Madeline sounded amused. She helped herself to a muffin. Which one? Do you remember her name? Harper, said Jane. I'm pretty sure it was Harper. I remember I called her hovering Harper to myself because she seemed to hover about Renata all the time. She's one of your blonde bobs, I think, with a long droopy face. Kind of like a basset hound. Madeline chortled. That's Harper exactly. Yes, she's very good friends with Renata, and she's bizarrely proud about it, as if Renata is some sort of celebrity. She always needs to let you know that she and Renata see each other socially. Oh, we all had a marvelous night at some marvelous restaurant. She took a bite of her muffin. I guess that's why Harper doesn't want to know me then, said Jane. Because of what happened. Jane, interrupted Madeline. This muffin is magnificent. Jane smiled at Madeline's amazed face. There was a crumb on her nose. Thanks, I can give you the recipe if you. Oh, Lord, I don't want the recipe, I just want the muffins. Madeline took a big sip of her tea. You know what? Where's my phone? I'm going to text Harper right now and demand to know why she pretended not to see my new muffin baking friend today. Don't you dare, said Jane. Madeline, she realized, was one of those slightly dangerous people who jumped right in defending their friends and stirred up far bigger waves than the first tiny ripple. Well, I won't have it, said Madeline. If those women give you a hard time over what happened at orientation, I'll be furious. It could happen to anyone. I would have made Ziggy apologize, said Jane. She needed to make it clear to Madeline that she was the sort of mother who made her child say sorry. I believed him when he said he didn't do it. Of course you did, said Madeline. I'm sure he didn't do it. He seems like a gentle child. I'm 100% positive, said Jane. Well, I'm 99% positive. I'm. She stopped and swallowed because she was suddenly feeling an overwhelming desire to explain her doubts to Madeline. To tell her exactly what that 1% of doubt represented. To just say it. To turn it into a story she'd never shared with anyone. To package it up into an incident with a beginning, a middle and an end. It was a beautiful, warm spring night in October. Jasmine in the air. I had terrible hay fever. Scratchy throat. Itchy eyes. She could just talk without thinking about it, without feeling it, until the story was done. And then perhaps Madeline would say in her definite, don't argue manner, oh, you mustn't worry about that, Jane. That's of no consequence. Ziggy is exactly who you think he is. 
You are his mother. You know him. But what if she did the opposite? If the doubt Jane was feeling right now was reflected even for an instant on Madeline's face, then what? It would be the worst betrayal of Ziggy. Oh, Abigail. Come have a muffin with us. Madeline looked up as a teenage girl came into the kitchen. Jane, this is my daughter Abigail. A false note had crept into Madeline's voice. She put down her muffin and fiddled with one of her earrings. Abigail, she said again. This is Jane. Jane turned in her chair. Hi, Abigail, she said to the teenage girl, who was standing very still and straight, her hands clasped in front of her as if she were taking part in a religious ceremony. Hello, said Abigail, and she smiled at Jane, a sudden flash of unexpected warmth. It was Madeline's brilliant smile, but apart from that you would never have picked them for mother and daughter. Abigail's colouring was darker and her features were sharper. Her hair hung down her back in that ratty, just got out of bed look and she wore a shapeless sack-like brown dress over black leggings. Intricate henna markings extended from her hands all the way up her forearms. Her only jewellery was a silver skull hanging from a black shoelace around her neck. Dad is picking me up, said Abigail. What? No is not, said Madeline. Yeah, I'm going to stay there tonight because I've got that thing tomorrow with Louisa and we have to be there early, and it's closer from Dad's place. It's ten minutes closer at the most, protested Madeline. But it's just easier going from Dad and Bonnie's place, said Abigail. We can get out the door faster. We won't be sitting waiting in the car while Fred looks for his shoes or Chloe runs back inside to get a different Barbie doll or whatever. I suppose Skye never has to go back inside for her Barbie doll, said Madeline. Bonnie would never let Skye play with Barbie dolls in a million years, said Abigail with a roll of her eyes, as if that would be obvious to anyone. I mean, you really shouldn't let Chloe play with them, mum, they are, like, badly unfeminist, and they give her unrealistic body shape expectations. Yes, well, the ship has sailed when it comes to Chloe and Barbie. Madeline gave Jane a rueful smile. There was a beep of a horn from outside. That's him, said Abigail. You already called him, said Madeline. Colour rose in her cheeks. You arranged this without asking me. I asked Dad, said Abigail. She came around the side of the table and gave Madeline a kiss on the cheek. Bye, Mum. Nice to meet you. Abigail smiled at Jane. You couldn't help but like her. Abigail Marie. Madeline stood up from the table. This is unacceptable. You don't just get to choose where you're going to spend the night. Abigail stopped. She turned around. Why not, she said. Why should you and Dad get to choose who gets the next turn of me? Jane could again see a resemblance to Madeline in the way Abigail quivered with rage. As if I'm something you own. Like I'm your car and you get to share me. It's not like that, began Madeline. It is like that, said Abigail. There was another beep of the horn from outside. What's going on? A middle-aged man strolled into the kitchen, wearing a wetsuit rolled down to his waist revealing a broad, very hairy chest. He was with a little boy who was dressed exactly the same way, except his chest was skinny and hairless. He said to Abigail, your dad is out front. I know that, said Abigail. She looked at the man's hairy chest. You should not walk around like that in public. It's disgusting. What? Showing off my fine physique? The man banged a proud fist against his chest and smiled at Jane. She smiled back uneasily. Revolting, said Abigail. I'm going. We'll talk more about this later, said Madeline. Whatever. Don't you whatever me, called out Madeline. The front door slammed. Mummy, I am starved to death, 
said the little boy. Have a muffin, said Madeline gloomily. She sank back down into her chair. Jane, this is my husband, Ed, and my son, Fred. Ed, Fred. Easy to remember. Because they rhyme, clarified Fred. Gide, said Ed. He shook Jane's hand. Sorry about the disgusting sight of me. Fred and I have been surfing. He sat down next to Madeline and put his arm around her. Abigail giving you grief. Madeline pressed her face against his shoulder. You're like a wet, salty dog. These are good. Fred took a gigantic bite from his muffin while simultaneously snaking out his hand and taking a second one. Jane would bring extra next time. Mummy. We need you. Chloe called from down the hallway. I'm going to go ride my skateboard. Fred took a third muffin. Helmet, said Madeline and Ed at the same time. Mummy. Chloe shouted. Coming, said Madeline. Talk to Jane, Ed. She went off down the hallway. Jane prepared herself to carry the conversation, but Ed grinned easily at her, took a muffin and settled back in his chair. So you're Ziggy's mum. How'd you come up with the name Ziggy? My brother suggested it, said Jane. He's a big Bob Marley fan and I guess Bob Marley called his son Ziggy. She paused, remembering the miraculous weight of her new baby in her arms, his solemn eyes. I like that it was kind of out there. My name is so dull. Plain Jane and all that. Jane is a beautiful, classic name, said Ed very definitely, making her fall in love with him just a little. In point of fact, I had Jane on my list when we were naming Chloe, but I got overruled, and I'd already won on Fred. Jane's eyes were caught by a wedding photo on the wall, Madeline wearing a champagne-coloured tulle dress, sitting on Ed's lap, both of them had their eyes screwed shut with helpless laughter. How did you and Madeline meet? she asked to make conversation. Ed brightened. It was obviously a story he liked to tell. I lived across the street from her when we were kids, he said. Madeline lived next door to a big Lebanese family. They had six sons, big strapping boys. I was terrified of them. They used to play cricket in the street, and sometimes Madeline would join in. She'd come trotting out, half the size of these big lumps, and she'd have ribbons in her hair and those shiny bangles, well you know what she's like, the girliest girl you'd ever seen, but my god, she could play cricket. He put down his muffin and stood up to demonstrate. So out she'd come, flick, flick of the hair, flounce, flounce of the dress, and she'd take the bat, and next thing, wham! He slammed an imaginary cricket bat. And those boys would fall to their knees, clutching their heads. Are you telling the cricket story again? Madeline returned from Chloe's bedroom. That's when I fell in love with her, said Ed, truly, madly, deeply. Watching from my bedroom window. I didn't even know he existed, said Madeline airily. Nope, she didn't. So we grow up and leave home, and I hear from my mum that Madeline has married some wanker, said Ed. Shush. Madeline slapped his arm. Then, years later, I go to this barbecue for a friend's 30th birthday. There's a cricket game in the backyard, and who's out there batting in her stilettos, all blinged up, exactly the same, but little Madeline from across the road. My heart just about stopped. That's a very romantic story, said Jane. I nearly didn't go to that barbecue, said Ed. Jane saw that his eyes were shiny, even though he must have told this story a hundred times before. And I nearly didn't go either, said Madeline. I had to cancel a pedicure, and I would normally never cancel a pedicure. They smiled at each other. Jane looked away. She picked up her mug of tea and took a sip even though it was all gone. The doorbell rang. That will be Celeste, said Madeline. 
Great, thought Jane, continuing to pretend sip her empty mug of tea. Now I'll be in the presence of both great love and great beauty. All around her was color, rich, vibrant color. She was the only colorless thing in this whole house. Miss Barnes, obviously parents form their own social groups outside of school. The conflict at the trivia night might not necessarily have anything to do with what was going on at Pirui Public. I just thought I should point that out. Thea, yes, well, Miss Barnes would say that, wouldn't she? 16. What did you think of Jane? Madeline asked Ed that night in the bathroom as he cleaned his teeth and she used her fingertip to apply an eye-wateringly expensive dab of eye cream to her fine lines and wrinkles. She had a marketing degree, for heaven's sake. She knew she'd just blown her money buying a jar of hope. Ed? I'm cleaning my teeth, give me a moment. He rinsed his mouth out, spat and tapped his toothbrush on the side of the basin. Tap, tap, tap. Always three definite, decisive taps, as if the toothbrush were a hammer or wrench. Sometimes, if she'd been drinking champagne, she could get weak from laughter just watching Ed tap his toothbrush on the basin. Jane looks about twelve years old to me, said Ed, Abigail seems older than her. I can't get my head around her being a fellow parent. He pointed his toothbrush at her and grinned. But she'll be our secret weapon at this year's trivia night. She'll know the answers to all the Gen Y questions. I reckon I might know more pop culture stuff than Jane, said Madeline. I get the feeling she's not your typical 24-year-old. She seems almost old-fashioned in some ways, like someone from my mother's generation. She examined her face, sighed and put her jar of hope back on the shelf. She can't be that old-fashioned, said Ed, you said she got pregnant after a one-night stand. She went ahead and had the baby, said Madeline. That's sort of old-fashioned. But then she should have left him on the church doorstep, said Ed, in a wicked basket. A what? A wicker basket. That's a word, isn't it? Wicker? I thought you said a wicked basket. I did. I was covering up my mistake. Hey, what's with all the gum? She was chewing it all day. I know. It's like she's addicted. He turned off the bathroom light. They both went to opposite sides of the bed, snapped on their bedside lamps and pulled back the cover in a smooth, practiced, synchronized move that proved, depending on Madeline's mood, that they either had the perfect marriage or that they were stuck in a middle-class suburban rut and they needed to sell the house and go traveling around India. I'd quite like to give Jane a makeover, mused Madeline as Ed found his page in his book. He was a big fan of Patricia Cornwall murder mysteries. The way she pulls back her hair like that. All flat on her head. She needs some volume. Volume, murmured Ed, absolutely. That's what she needs. I was thinking the same thing. He flipped a page. We need to help find her a boyfriend, said Madeline. You'd better get on that, said Ed. I'd quite like to give Celeste a makeover too, said Madeline. I know that sounds strange. Obviously she looks beautiful no matter what. Celeste? Beautiful, said Ed, can't say I've noticed. Ha, ha. Madeline picked up her book and put it straight down again. They seem so different, Jane and Celeste, but I feel like they're also sort of similar. I can't quite work out how. Ed put down his own book. I can tell you how they're similar. Can you now? They're both damaged, said Ed. Damaged, said Madeline. How are they damaged? Don't know, said Ed, I just recognize damaged girls. I used to date them. I can spot a crazy chick a mile off. So was I damaged too? asked Madeline. Is that what attracted you? Nope, said Ed. He picked up his book again. You weren't damaged. 
Yes I was, protested Madeline. She want to be interesting and damaged too. I was heartbroken when you met me. There's a difference between heartbroken and damaged, said Ed, you were sad and hurt. Maybe your heart was broken, but you weren't broken. Now, be quiet, because I think I'm falling for a red herring here, and I'm not falling for it, Miss Cornwall, no I'm not. MMMM, said Madeline. Well, Jane might be damaged, but I don't see what Celeste has got to be damaged about. She's beautiful and rich and happily married and she doesn't have an ex-husband stealing her daughter away from her. He's not trying to steal her away, said Ed, his eyes back on his book. This is just Abigail being a teenager. Teenagers are crazy. You know that. Madeline picked up her own book. She thought of Jane and Ziggy walking off hand in hand down the driveway as they left that afternoon. Ziggy was telling Jane something, one little hand gesticulating wildly, and Jane had her head tipped to one side, listening, her other hand holding out the car keys to open her car. Madeline heard her say, I know. Let's go to that place where we got those yummy tacos. Watching them brought back a flood of memories from the years when she was a single mother. For five years it had been just her and Abigail. They'd lived in a little two-bedroom flat above an Italian restaurant. They ate a lot of takeout pasta and free garlic bread. Madeline had put on seven kilos. They were the Mackenzie girls in Unit 9. She'd changed Abigail's name back to her maiden name, and she refused to change it again when she married Ed. A woman could only change her surname so many times before it got ridiculous. She couldn't stand having Abigail walk around with her father's surname when Nathan chose to spend his Christmas lying on a beach in Bali with a trashy little hairdresser. A hairdresser who, by the way, didn't even have good hair, black roots and split ends. I always thought that Nathan's punishment for walking out on us would be that Abigail wouldn't love him the way she loved me, she said to Ed, I used to say it to myself all the time. Abigail won't want Nathan walking her down the aisle. He'll pay the price, I thought. But you know what? He's not paying for his sins. Now he's got Bonnie, who is nicer and younger and prettier than me, he's got a brand new daughter who can write out the whole alphabet, and now he's getting Abigail too. He got away with it all. He hasn't got a single regret. She was surprised to hear her voice crack. She thought she was just angry, but now she knew she was hurt. Abigail had infuriated her before. She'd frustrated and annoyed her. But this was the first time she'd hurt her. She's meant to love me best, she said childishly, and she tried to laugh, because it was a joke, except that she was deadly serious. I thought she loved me best. Ed put his book back down and put his arm around her. Do you want me to kill the bastard? Bump him off. I could frame Bonnie for it. Yes please, said Madeline into his shoulder. That would be lovely. Detective Sergeant Adrian Quinlan, we haven't made any arrests at this stage. I can say that we do believe we have probably already spoken to the person or persons involved. Stu, I don't think anyone, including the police, have got the faintest idea about who did what. 17. Gabrielle, I thought there might have been a certain, I don't know, etiquette about handing out party invitations. I thought what happened on that first day of kindergarten was kind of inappropriate. Smile, Ziggy, smile. Ziggy finally smiled at the exact same moment that Jane's father yawned. Jane clicked the shutter and then checked the photo on the screen of her digital camera. Ziggy and her mum were both smiling beautifully, while her dad was captured mid-yawn, mouth agape, eyes scrunched. He was tired because he'd had to get up so early to make it all the way to the peninsula from Granville to see his grandson on his first day of school. Jane's parents had always gone to bed late and gotten up late, and these days anything that required them leaving the house before 9am was a tremendous effort. Her father had taken early retirement from his job in the public service last year and since then, 
he and Jane's mother had been staying up late doing their puzzles until three or four in the morning. Our parents are turning into vampires, Jane's brother had said to her. Jigsaw playing vampires. Would you like my husband to take a photo of all of you together, said a woman standing nearby. I'd offer to take it myself, but technology and I are not friends. Jane looked up. The woman wore a full-length paisley skirt with a black singlet. Her wrists seemed to be adorned with twine, and she wore her hair in one long single plait. There was a tattoo of a Chinese symbol on her shoulder. She looked a bit out of place next to all the other parents in their casual beachwear, gym gear or business clothes. Her husband seemed a good deal older than her and was wearing a t-shirt and shorts, standard middle-aged dad gear. He was holding the hand of a tiny, mouse-like little girl with long scraggly hair, whose uniform looked like it was three sizes too big for her. I bet you're Bonnie, thought Jane suddenly, remembering how Madeline had described her ex-husband's wife, at the same time as the woman said, I'm Bonnie, and this is my husband, Nathan, and my little girl, Skye. Thanks so much, said Jane, handing over the camera to Madeline's ex-husband. She went to stand with her parents and Ziggy. Say cheese and biscuits. Nathan held up the camera. Ha, said Ziggy. Coffee, yawned Jane's mother. Nathan took the photo. There you go. He handed back the camera, just as another little curly-haired girl marched straight up to his daughter. Jane felt sick. She recognized her immediately. It was the girl who had accused Ziggy of trying to choke her. Amabella. Jane looked around. Where was the angry mother? What is your name, said Amabella importantly to Skye. She was carrying a large pile of pale pink envelopes. Skye, whispered the little girl. She was so painfully shy, it hurt to watch her try to squeeze the words out. Amabella flipped through her envelopes. Sky, sky, sky. Goodness, can you read all those names already? asked Jane's mother. I've actually been reading since I was three, said Amabella politely. She continued to flip. Sky. She handed over a pink envelope. This is an invitation to my fifth birthday. It's an A party, because my name starts with A. Already reading before they start school, said Jane's dad chummily to Nathan. Top of the class already. Must have had tutoring, do you reckon? Well, not to blow our own trumpet or anything, but Sky here is already reading quite well too, said Nathan. And we don't believe in tutoring, do we, Bon? We prefer to let Sky's growth happen organically, said Bonnie. Organic? Hey, said Jane's dad. He furrowed his brow. Like fruit? Amabella turned to Ziggy. What's your, she froze. An expression of pure panic crossed her face. She clutched the pink envelopes tight to her chest as if to prevent Ziggy from stealing one and, without saying a word, she turned on her heel and ran off. Goodness. What was that all about, said Jane's mother. Oh, that was the kid who said I hurt her, said Ziggy matter-of-factly. But I never did, Grandma. Jane looked around the playground. Everywhere she looked she could see children in brand new, two big school uniforms. Every single one was holding a pale pink envelope. Harper, look, nobody in that school knew Renata better than me. We were very close. I can tell you for a fact. She was not trying to make a point that day. Samantha, oh my god, of course she was making a point. 18. Madeline was being assaulted by a vicious bout of PMS on Chloe's first day of school. She was fighting back, but to no avail. I choose my mood, she told herself as she stood in the kitchen, tossing back evening primrose capsules like Valium. She knew it was no use. You were meant to take them regularly, but she had to try something, even though the stupid things were probably just a waste of money. She was furious with the bad timing. 
She would have liked to have found a way to blame someone, ideally her ex-husband, but she couldn't find a way to make Nathan responsible for her menstrual cycle. No doubt Bonnie danced in the moonlight to deal with the ebbs and flows of womanhood. PMS was still a relatively new experience for Madeline. Another jolly part of the aging process. She'd never really believed in it before. Then, as she hit her late thirties, her body said, okay, you don't believe in PMS. I'll show you PMS. Get a load of this, bitch. Now, for one day every month, she had to fake everything, her basic humanity, her love for her children, her love for Ed. She'd once been appalled to hear of women claiming PMS as a defense for murder. Now she understood. She could happily murder someone today. In fact, she felt like there should be some sort of recognition for her remarkable strength of character that she didn't. All the way to school she did deep breathing exercises to help calm her mood. Thankfully Fred and Chloe weren't fighting in the back seat. Ed hummed to himself as he drove, which was kind of unbearable, the unnecessary, relentless cheerfulness of the man, but at least he was wearing a clean shirt and hadn't insisted on wearing the too small white polo shirt with the tomato sauce stain he thought was invisible. PMS would not win today. PMS would not ruin this milestone. They found a legal parking spot straight away. The children actually got out of the car the first time they were asked. Happy New Year, Mrs. Ponder, she called out as they walked past the little white weatherboard cottage next to the school, where plump, white-haired Mrs. Ponder sat on her fold-out chair with a cup of tea and the newspaper. Morning, called Mrs. Ponder eagerly. Keep walking, keep walking. Madeline hissed at Ed as he started to slow his pace. He loved a good long chat with Mrs. Ponder, she'd been a nurse in Singapore during the war, or with anyone really, particularly if they were over the age of 70. Chloe's first day of school. Ed called out. Big day. Ah, bless, said Mrs. Ponder. They kept walking. Madeline had her mood under control, like a rabid dog on a tight leash. The schoolyard was filled with chatting parents and shouting children. The parents stood still while the children ran helter-skelter around them, like marbles skidding about a pinball machine. There were the new kindergarten parents smiling brightly and nervily. There were the year six mums in their animated, unbreakable little circles, secure in their positions as queens of the school. There were the blonde bobs caressing their freshly cut blonde bobs. Ah, it was lovely. The sea breeze. The children's bright little faces, and, oh for fuck's sake, there was her ex-husband. It wasn't like she hadn't known he'd be there, but it was outrageous that he looked so comfortable in Madeline's schoolyard, so pleased with himself, so ordinary and dad lie. And worse, he was taking a photo of Jane and Ziggy, they belonged to Madeline and a pleasant-looking couple who didn't seem much older than Madeline, but who she knew must be Jane's parents. He was a terrible photographer too. Don't rely on Nathan to capture a memory for you. Don't rely on Nathan for anything. There's Abigail's dad, said Fred. I didn't see his car out front. Nathan drove a canary yellow Lexus. Poor Fred would have quite liked a father who cared about cars. Ed didn't even know the difference between models. That's my half-sister. Chloe pointed at Nathan and Bonnie's daughter. Sky's school uniform was gigantic on her, and with her big sad eyes and long, fair, wavy, wispy hair, she looked like a sad little waif from a production of Les Miserables. Madeline could already see what was going to happen. Chloe was going to adopt Sky. Skye was exactly the sort of shy little girl Madeline would have taken under her wing when she was at school. Chloe would ask Skye to come over for playdates so she could play with her hair. Just at that moment, Skye blinked rapidly as a strand of her hair fell in her eyes, and Madeline blanched. The child blinked just like Abigail used to blink when her hair fell in her eyes. That was a piece of Madeline's child, Madeline's past and Madeline's heart. There should be a law against ex-husbands procreating. 
For the millionth time, Chloe, she hissed, Sky is Abigail's half-sister, not yours. Deep breaths, said Ed, deep breaths. Nathan handed the camera back to Jane and strolled toward them. He'd grown out his hair recently. It was thick and grey and flip-flopping about on his forehead as if he were a middle-aged, Australian Hugh Grant. Madeline suspected he'd grown it deliberately to one-up Ed, who was almost completely bald now. Maddie, he said. He was the only person in the world to call her Maddie. Once, that had been a source of great pleasure, now it was a source of profound irritation. Ed, mate. And little, hum. It's your first day at school too, isn't it? Nathan could never be bothered to remember Madeline's children's names. He held up his palm for a high five with Fred. Did a, champ. Fred betrayed her by high fiving him back. Nathan kissed Madeline on the cheek and shook Ed's hand enthusiastically. He took an ostentatious relish in the civility of his dealings with his ex wife and family. Nathan, intoned Ed. He had a particular way of saying Nathan's name, a deepening and drawling of his voice and an emphasis on the second syllable. It always made Nathan frown slightly, never quite sure if he was being laughed at or not. But today it wasn't enough to save Madeline's mood. Big day, big day, said Nathan. You two are old hands, but this is a first for us. I'm not ashamed to say I got a bit teary when I saw Sky in her school uniform. Madeline couldn't help herself. Sky is not your first child to start school, Nathan, she said. Nathan flushed. She'd broken their unspoken no hard feelings rule. But for God's sake. Only a saint could let that one go. Abigail had been at school for two months before Nathan had noticed. He'd called up in the middle of the day for a chat. She's at school, Madeline had told him. School, he'd spluttered. She's not old enough for school, is she? Speaking of Abigail, Maddie, are you okay if we swap weekends this week, said Nathan. We're going to see Bonnie's mother down at Barrel on Saturday, and Abigail hates to miss seeing her. Bonnie materialized by his side, smiling beatifically. She was always smiling beatifically. Madeline suspected drugs. My mother and Abigail have such a special connection, she said to Madeline, as if this would be news that Madeline would welcome. This was the thing, who would want their daughter having a special connection with their ex-husband's wife's mother? Only Bonnie could think that you would want to hear that, and yet, you couldn't complain, could you? You couldn't even think, shut up, bitch, because Bonnie was not a bitch. So all Madeline could do was just stand there and nod and take it, while her mood snarled and snapped and strained at the leash. Sure, she said. No problem. Daddy. Sky pulled on Nathan's shirt, and he lifted her up onto his hip while Bonnie gazed tenderly at them both. I'm so sorry, Maddie, but I'm just not cut out for this. That's what Nathan had said when Abigail was three weeks old, a fretful baby, who, since she'd been home from the hospital, had never slept longer than 32 minutes. Madeline had yawned, me either. She didn't think he meant it literally. An hour later, she'd watched in stunned amazement as he'd packed his clothes into his long red cricket bag and his eyes had rested briefly on the baby, as if she belonged to someone else, and he'd left. She would never ever forgive or forget that cursory glance he gave his beautiful baby daughter. And now that daughter was a teenager, who made her own lunch and caught the bus to high school all on her own and called out over her shoulder as she left, don't forget I'm staying at dad's place tonight. Hi, Madeline, said Jane. Jane was once again wearing a plain v-necked white t-shirt, did she own no other sort of shirt, the same blue denim skirt and thongs. Her hair was pulled back in that painfully tight ponytail, and of course she was doing her clandestine gum chewing. Her simplicity was somehow a relief to Madeline's mood, as if Jane were what she needed to feel better, in the same way that you longed for plain dry toast after you'd been ill. Jane, she said warmly. How are you? I see you met my delightful ex-husband here and his family. 
Ho, 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 said Nathan, presumably sounding like Santa Claus because he didn't know how else to respond to the delightful ex-husband Barb. Madeline felt Ed's hand rest on her shoulder, a warning that she was skating too close to the line of incivility. I did, said Jane. Her face gave nothing away. These are my parents, D.I. and Bill. Hello. Your grandson is just beautiful. Madeline shrugged off Ed and shook hands with Jane's parents, who were somehow lovely, you could just tell by looking at them. We actually think Ziggy is my own darling father reincarnated, sparkled Jane's mother. No we don't, said Jane's dad. He looked at Chloe, who was pulling at Madeline's dress. And this must be your little one, eh? Chloe handed a pink envelope to Madeline. Can you keep this, mummy? It's an invitation to Amabella's party. You have to come dressed as something starting with A. I'm going to dress up as a princess. She ran off. Apparently poor little Ziggy isn't invited to that party, Jane's mother said in a lowered voice. Mum, said Jane. Leave it. What? She shouldn't be handing out invitations in the playground unless she's asking the whole class, said Madeline. She scanned the playground for Renata and saw Celeste walking through the school gates, late as usual, holding hands with the twins, looking impossibly gorgeous. It was as though another species had turned up at school. Madeline saw one of the year two dads catch sight of Celeste and do a comical double take and nearly trip over a school bag. And there was Renata, bustling straight for Celeste and handing her two pink envelopes. I'm going to kill her, said Madeline. Mrs. Lipman, look, I'd rather not say anything further. We deserve to be left in peace. A parent is dead. The entire school community is grieving. Gabrielle, hum, I wouldn't say the entire school community is grieving. That might be a stretch. Celeste saw the man trip while he was checking her out. Maybe she should have an affair. It might make something happen, push her marriage over the cliff it had been inexorably creeping toward for so many years. But the thought of being with any other man besides Perry filled her with a heavy, listless sensation. She'd be so bored. She was not interested in other men. Perry made her feel alive. If she left him, she'd be single and celibate and bored forever. It wasn't fair. He ruined her. You're holding my hand too tight, said Josh. Yeah, mummy, said Max. She loosened her grip. Sorry, boys, she said. It hadn't been a good morning. First, there was something cataclysmically wrong with one of Josh's socks that could not be rectified with any amount of adjusting. Then Max couldn't find a very specific little Lego man with a very specific yellow hat that he required right at that very minute. They'd both wailed and wailed for Daddy. They didn't care that he was on the other side of the world. They wanted him. Celeste wanted Perry too. He would have fixed Josh's sock. He would have found Max's Lego man. She'd always known that she was going to struggle with the school morning routine. She and the boys were late sleepers and generally out of sorts in the morning, whereas Perry woke up happy and energetic. If he'd been here this morning, they would have been early for their first day at school. There would have been laughter in the car, not silence, interspersed by pitiful shudders from the boys. She'd given them lollipops in the end. They were still sucking on them as she got them out of the car, and she'd seen one of the kindergarten mothers she recognized from the orientation day walk by and smile sweetly at the boys, while flicking Celeste a bad mother look. There's Chloe and Ziggy, said Josh. Let's go kill them, said Max. Boys, don't talk like that, said Celeste. Good God. What would people think? Just pretend killing, mummy said Josh kindly. Chloe and Ziggy like it. Celeste. It is Celeste, isn't it? A woman appeared in front of her as the boys ran off. 
I met you and your husband at the uniform shop a few weeks ago. She touched her chest. Renata. I'm Amabella's mum. Of course. Hi, Renata, said Celeste. Perry couldn't make it today. Renata looked around hopefully. He's in Vienna, said Celeste. He travels a lot for work. I'm sure he does, said Renata knowingly. I thought I recognized him the other day and so I googled him when I got back home, and that's when it clicked. The Perry White. I've actually seen your husband speak a few times. I'm in the funds management world myself. Great. A Perry Groupie. Celeste often wondered what the Perry Groupies would think if they were to see him doing the things he did. I've got some invitations for the boys to Amabella's fifth birthday party. Renata handed her two pink envelopes. Of course, you and Perry are most welcome to come along. Nice way for all the parents to start getting to know one another. Lovely. Celeste took the envelopes and put them in her bag. Good morning, ladies. It was Madeline, wearing one of her beautiful signature dresses. She had two spots of color high on her cheeks and a dangerous glitter in her eyes. Thank you for Chloe's invitation to Amabella's party. Oh dear, is Amabella handing them out? Renata frowned and patted at her handbag. Oh dear. She must have taken them from my handbag. I did mean to hand them discreetly to the parents. Yes, because it looks like you're inviting the whole class except for one little boy. I assume you're talking about Ziggy, the child who left bruises on my daughter's neck, said Renata. He didn't make it onto the invitation list. Surprise, surprise. Come on now, Renata, said Madeline. You can't do this. So sue me. Renata shot Celeste a glinting, mischievous look, as if they were in on a joke together. Celeste took a breath. She didn't want to be involved. I might just. I'm so sorry, Renata, interrupted Madeline with a queenly look of apology. But Chloe won't be able to make it to the party. What a pity, Renata said. She pulled hard on the diagonal strap of her handbag, as if she were adjusting body armor. You know what? I think I might terminate this conversation before I say something I regret. She nodded at Celeste. Nice to see you again. Madeline watched her go. She seemed invigorated. This is war, Celeste, she said happily. War, I tell you. Oh, Madeline, sighed Celeste. Harper, I know we all like to put Celeste on a pedestal but I don't think she always made the best nutritional choices for her children. I saw the twins eating lollipops for breakfast on their first day of school. Samantha, parents do tend to judge each other. I don't know why. Maybe because none of us really know what we're doing. And I guess that can sometimes lead to conflict. Just not normally on this sort of scale. Jackie, I, for one, don't have the time to be judging other parents. Or the interest. My children are only one part of my life. Detective Sergeant Adrian Quinlan, in addition to the murder investigation, we expect to be charging multiple parents with assault. We're deeply disappointed and quite shocked to see a group of parents behaving this way. 19. Oh, Madeline, sighed Ed. He parked the car, pulled the keys from the ignition and turned to look at her. You can't make Chloe miss her friend's party just because Ziggy isn't invited. That's crazy. They'd driven straight from the school down to the beach to have a quick coffee at Blue Blues with Jane and her parents. It had been Jane's mother who had suggested it, and it had seemed so important to her that Madeline, who had an overly ambitious list of things to achieve on the kids' first day at school, felt she couldn't say no. No it's not, said Madeline, although she was already feeling the first twinges of regret. When Chloe heard she was missing Amabella's a party there would be hell to pay. Amabella's last birthday party had been insane. 
jumping castle, a magician and a disco. I'm in a very bad mood today, she told Ed. Really, said Ed, I would never have noticed. I miss the children, said Madeline. The back seat of the car felt so empty and silent. Her eyes filled with tears. Ed guffawed. You're kidding, right? My baby has started school, wept Madeline. Chloe had marched straight into the classroom, walking right alongside Miss Barnes, as if she were a fellow teacher, chatting the whole way, probably making a few suggestions for changes to the curriculum. Yep, said Ed, and not a moment too soon. I think those were the words you used yesterday on the phone to your mother. And I had to stand there in the schoolyard, making polite conversation with my ex-bloody husband. Madeline's mood flipped from teary back to angry. Yeah, I don't know if I'd use the word polite, said Ed. It's hard enough being a single mother, said Madeline. Um. What, said Ed. Jane. I'm talking about Jane, of course. I remember Abigail's first day of school. I felt like a freak. It felt like everyone was so disgustingly married. All the parents were in perfect little pairs. I never felt so alone. Madeline thought of her ex-husband today, looking comfortably about the schoolyard. Nathan had no clue as to what it had been like for Madeline for all those years she'd brought Abigail up on her own. He wouldn't deny it. Oh no. If she were to scream at him, it was hard. It was so hard, he'd wince and look so sad and so sorry, but no matter how hard he tried, he would never really get it. She was filled with impotent rage. There was nowhere to aim it except straight at Renata. So just imagine how Jane feels when her child is the only one not invited to a party. Imagine it. I know, said Ed, although I guess after what happened, you can sort of see it from Renata's point of view. No you can't, cried Madeline. Jesus. Sorry. No. Of course I can't. Ed looked in the rearview mirror. Oh, look, here's your poor little friend pulled up behind us. Let's go eat cake with her. That will fix things. He undid his seat belt. If you're not asking every child in the class, you don't hand out the invitations on the playground, said Madeline. Every mother knows that. It's a law of the land. I could talk about this subject all day long, said Ed, I really could. There is nothing else I want to talk about today other than Amabella's fifth birthday party. Shut up, said Madeline. I thought we didn't say shut up in our house. Fuck off, then, said Madeline. Ed grinned. He put a hand to the side of her face. You'll feel better tomorrow. You always feel better tomorrow. I know, I know. Madeline took a deep breath and opened the car door to see Jane's mother fling herself out of Jane's car and hurry along the sidewalk toward her, slinging her handbag over her shoulder and smiling frantically. Hi. Hi there. Madeline, will you just walk along the beach with me for a bit while the others order our coffee? Mum. Jane walked behind with her father. You've seen the beach. You don't even like the beach. You didn't have to be gifted and talented to see that Jane's mother wanted to talk alone with Madeline. Of course I will. D.I. The name came to her like a gift. I'll come too then, sighed Jane. No, no, you go into the cafe and help your dad get settled and order something nice for me, said D.I. Yes, because I'm such a doddering old senior citizen. Jane's father put on a quavering old man's voice and clutched Jane's arm. Help me, darling daughter. Off you go, said D.I. firmly. Madeline watched Jane struggle with whether or not to insist, before giving a tiny shrug and giving up. Don't take too long, she said to her mother. Or your coffee will get cold. 
Get me a double shot espresso and the chocolate mud cake with cream, said Madeline to Ed. Ed gave her a thumbs up and led Jane and her father into Blue Blues, while Madeline reached down and slipped off her shoes. Jane's mother did the same. Did your husband take the day off work for Chloe's first day at school? asked D.I. as they walked across the sand toward the water. Oh, goodness, the glare. She was wearing sunglasses, but she shielded her eyes with the back of her hand. He's a journalist for the local paper, said Madeline. He's got very flexible hours, and he works from home a lot. That must be nice. Or is it? Does he get under your feet? D.I. picked her way unsteadily across the sand. Sometimes I send Bill off to buy me something at the supermarket I don't really need, just to give myself a little breather. It works pretty well for us, said Madeline. I work three days a week for the Pirawi Peninsula Theatre Company, so Ed can pick the kids up when I'm working. We're not making a fortune but, you know, we both love our jobs, so we're happy. My God, why was she talking about money? It was like she was defending their choice of lifestyles. And to be honest, they didn't love their jobs that much. Was it because she sometimes felt like her whole life was in competition with high-flying career women like Renata? Or was it just because money was on her mind because of that shocking electricity bill she'd opened this morning? The truth was that although they weren't wealthy, they were certainly not struggling, and thanks to Madeline's savvy online shopping skills, even her wardrobe didn't need to suffer. Ah, uh, yes, money. They say it doesn't buy happiness, but I don't know about that. D.I. pushed her hair out of her eyes and looked around the beach. It is a very pretty beach. We're not really beach people, and obviously no one wants to see this in a bikini. She made a face of pure loathing and gestured at her perfectly ordinary body, which Madeline judged to be about the same size as her own. I don't see why not, said Madeline. She had no patience for this sort of talk. It drove her to distraction the way women wanted to bond over self-hatred. But it will be nice for Jane and Ziggy, living near the beach, I think, I guess, and ah, uh, you know, I just wanted to really thank you, Madeline, for taking Jane under your wing the way you have. She took her sunglasses off and looked directly at Madeline. Her eyes were pale blue, and she was wearing a frosted pink eye shadow which wasn't quite working for her, although Madeline approved of the effort. Well, of course, said Madeline. It's hard when you move to a new area and you don't know anyone. Yes, and Jane has moved so often in the last few years. Ever since she had Ziggy, she can't seem to stay put, or find a nice circle of friends, and she'd kill me for saying this, it's just, I'm not sure what's really going on with her. She stopped, looked back over her shoulder at the cafe and compressed her lips. It's hard when they stop telling you things, isn't it, said Madeline after a moment. I have a teenage daughter. From a previous relationship. She always felt compelled to clarify this when she spoke about Abigail, and then felt obscurely guilty for doing so. It was like she was separating Abigail out somehow, putting her into a different category. I don't know why I was so shocked when Abigail stopped telling me things. That's what all teenagers do, right? But she was such an open little girl. Of course, Jane isn't a teenager. It was like she'd given D.I. permission to speak freely. She turned to Madeline enthusiastically. I know. She's 24, a grown-up. But they never seem like grown-ups. Her dad tells me I'm worrying over nothing. It's true that Jane is doing a beautiful job bringing up Ziggy, and she supports herself, won't take a cent from us. I slip money into her pockets like a pickpocket. Or the opposite of a pickpocket. But she's changed. Something has changed. I can't put my finger on it. It's like this deep unhappiness that she tries to hide. I don't know if it's depression or drugs or an eating disorder or what. She got so painfully thin. She used to be quite voluptuous. Well, said Madeline, thinking, if it's an eating disorder, you probably gave it to her. Why am I telling you this, 
said D.I. You won't want to be her friend anymore. You'll think she's a drug addict. She's not a drug addict. She only has three out of the ten top signs of drug addiction. Or four at the most. You can't believe what you read on the internet, anyway. Madeline laughed, and D.I. laughed too. Sometimes I feel like waving my hand in front of her eyes and saying, Jane, Jane, are you still in there? I'm pretty sure she's. She hasn't had a boyfriend since before Ziggy was born. She broke up with this boy. Zack. We all loved Zack, gorgeous boy, and Jane was very upset over the breakup, very upset, but gosh, that was what, six years ago now. She couldn't still be grieving over Zack, could she? He wasn't that good looking. I don't know, said Madeline. She wondered wistfully if her coffee was sitting on the table up at Blue Blue's getting cold. Next thing she's pregnant, and supposedly Zack isn't the father, although we did always wonder about that, but she was absolutely adamant that Zack was not the father. She said it over and over again. A one-night stand, she said. No way of contacting the father. Well, you know, she was halfway through her arts law degree, it wasn't ideal, but everything happens for a reason, don't you think? Absolutely, said Madeline, who did not believe that at all. She'd been told by a doctor that she was likely to have a lot of trouble falling pregnant naturally, so it just seemed like it was meant to be. And then my darling dad died while Jane was pregnant and that's why it seemed like his soul might have come back in. Muam. Madeline. Jane's mother startled and they both turned away from the sea to see Jane standing on the boardwalk outside Blue Blues, waving frantically. Your coffee is ready. Coming, called Madeline. I'm sorry, said D.I. as they walked back up from the beach. I talk too much. Can you please forget everything I said? It's just that when I saw poor little Ziggy didn't get asked to that child's birthday party, I felt like crying. I'm so emotional these days. And then we had to get up so early today, I'm feeling quite lightheaded. I didn't used to be, I used to be quite hard hearted. It's my age, I'm 58. My friends are the same, we went out for lunch the other day, we've been friends since our children started kindergarten. We were all talking about how we feel like 15 year olds, weeping at the drop of a hat. Madeline stopped walking. D.I., she said. D.I. turned to her nervously, as if she were about to be told off. Yes. I'll keep an eye on Jane, she said. I promise. Gabrielle, see, part of the problem was that Madeline sort of adopted Jane. She was like a crazy, protective big sister. If you ever said anything even mildly critical of her Jane, you'd have Madeline snarling at you like a rabid dog. 20. It was 11 a.m. on the first day of Ziggy's school life. Had he already had his morning tea by now? Was he eating his apple and his cheese and crackers? His tiny box of raisins? Jane's heart twisted at the thought of him carefully opening his new lunch box. Where would he sit? Who would he talk to? She hoped Chloe and the twins were playing with him, but they could just as easily be ignoring him. It wasn't like one of the twins would stroll up to Ziggy, hand outstretched, and say, why, hello. Ziggy, isn't it? We met a few weeks back at a play date. How have you been? She stood up from the dining room table where she was working and stretched her arms high above her head. He'd be fine. Every child went to school. They survived. They learned the rules of life. She went into the tiny kitchen of her new apartment to switch the kettle on for a cup of tea she didn't especially feel like. It was just an excuse to take a break from the accounts of perfect Pete's plumbing. Pete might be a perfect plumber, but he wasn't that great at keeping his paperwork in order. Every quarter she received a shoebox filled with an odd assortment of scrunched, smudged, strange-smelling paperwork, invoices, credit card bills and receipts, most of which were not claimable. 
She could just imagine Pete emptying out his pockets, scooping up all the receipts from the console of his car in one meaty hand, stomping around his house, grabbing every piece of paper he could find before stuffing the lot into the shoebox with a gusty sigh of relief. Job done. She went back to the dining room table and picked up the next receipt. Perfect Pete's wife had just spent $335 at the beautician, where she had enjoyed the classic facial, deluxe pedicure and a bikini line works. So that was nice for Perfect Pete's wife. Next was an unsigned permission note for a school excursion to Taro Nozu last year. On the back of the permission note, a child had written in purple crayon, I hate Tom. Jane studied the permission note. I will will not be able to attend the excursion as a parent helper. Perfect Pete's wife had already circled will not. Too busy getting her bikini line done. She crumpled the receipt and permission slip in her hand and walked back into the kitchen. She could be a parent helper if Ziggy ever went on an excursion. After all, that was why she'd originally decided to become a bookkeeper so she could be flexible for Ziggy, and balance motherhood and career, even though she always felt foolish and fraudulent when she said things like that, as if she weren't really a mother, as if her whole life were a fake. It would be fun to go on a school excursion again. She could still remember the excitement. The treats on the bus. Jane could secretly observe Ziggy interact with the other children. Make sure he was normal. Of course he was normal. She thought again, as she had been all morning, of the pale pink envelopes. So many of them. It didn't matter that he wasn't invited to the party. He was too little to feel hurt and none of the children knew one another yet anyway. It was silly to even think about it. But the truth was, she felt deeply hurt on his behalf, and somehow responsible, as if she'd messed up. She'd been so ready to forget all about the incident on orientation day, and now it was back at the forefront of her mind again. The kettle boiled. If Ziggy really had hurt Amabella, and if he did something like that again, he would never get invited to any parties. The teachers would call Jane in for a meeting. She would have to take him to see a child psychologist. She would have to say out loud all her secret terrors about Ziggy. Her hand shook as she poured the hot water into the mug. If Ziggy isn't invited, then Chloe isn't going, Madeline had said at coffee this morning. Please don't do that, Jane had said you're going to make things worse. But Madeline just raised her eyebrows and shrugged. I've already told Renata. Jane had been horrified. Great. Now Renata would have even more reason to dislike her. Jane would have an enemy. The last time she had had anything close to an enemy, she was in primary school herself. It had never crossed her mind that sending your child to school would be like going back to school yourself. Perhaps she should have made him apologize that day, and apologized herself. I'm so sorry, she could have said to Renata. I'm terribly sorry. He's never done anything like this before. I will make sure it never happens again. But it was no use. Ziggy said he didn't do it. She couldn't have reacted any other way. She took the cup of tea to the dining room table sat back down at her computer and unwrapped a new piece of gum. Right. Well, she would volunteer for anything on offer at the school. Apparently parental involvement was good for your child's education, although she'd always suspected that was propaganda put out by the schools. She would try to make friends with other mothers, apart from Madeline and Celeste, and if she ran into Renata she would be polite and friendly. This will all blow over in a week her father had said at coffee this morning when they were discussing the party. Or it will all blow up, said Madeline's husband, Ed, now that my wife is involved. Jane's mother had laughed as if she'd known Madeline and her propensities for years. What had they been talking about for so long on the beach? Jane inwardly squirmed at the thought of her mother revealing every concern she had about Jane's life, she can't seem to get a boyfriend. 
She's so skinny. She won't get a good haircut. Madeline had fiddled with a heavy silver bracelet around her wrist. Kaboom, she'd said suddenly, and swirled her hands in opposite directions to indicate an explosion, her eyes wide. Jane had laughed, even while she thought, great. I've made friends with a crazy lady. The only reason Jane had had an enemy in primary school was because it was decreed to be so by a pretty, charismatic girl called Emily Berry, who always wore red ladybug hair clips in her hair. Was Madeline the 40-year-old version of Emily Berry? Champagne instead of lemonade. Bright red lipstick instead of strawberry-flavored lip gloss. The sort of girl who merrily stirred up trouble for you and you still loved her. Jane shook her head to clear it. This was ridiculous. She was a grown-up. She was not going to end up in the principal's office like she had when she was ten. Emily had sat up on the chair next to her, kicking her legs, chewing gum and grinning over at Jane whenever the principal looked the other way, as if it were all a great lark. Right. Focus. She picked up the next document from Pete the plumber's shoebox and held it carefully with her fingertips. It was greasy to touch. This was an invoice from a wholesale plumbing supplier. Well done, Pete. This actually relates to your business. She rested her hands on the keyboard. Come on. Ready, set, go. In order for the data inputting side of her job to be both profitable and bearable she had to work fast. The first time an accountant gave her a job, he told her it was about six to eight hours work. She'd done it in four, charged him for six. Since her first job she'd gotten even faster. It was like playing a computer game, seeing if she could get to a higher level each time. It wasn't her dream job but she did quite enjoy the satisfaction of transforming a messy pile of paperwork into neat rows of figures. She loved calling up her clients, who were now mostly small business people like Pete, and telling them she'd found a new deduction. Best of all, she was proud of the fact that she'd supported herself and Ziggy for the last five years without having to ask her parents for money, even if it had meant that she sometimes worked well into the night while he slept. This was not the career she dreamed of as an ambitious 17-year-old, but now it was hard to remember ever feeling innocent and audacious enough to dream of a certain type of life, as if you got to choose how things turned out. A seagull squawked, and for a moment she was confused by the sound. Well, she'd chosen this. She'd chosen to live by the beach, as if she had as much right as anyone else. She could reward herself for two hours' work with a walk on the beach. A walk on the beach in the middle of the day. She could go back to Blue Blues, buy a coffee to go and then take an arty photo of it sitting on a fence with the sea in the background and post it on Facebook with a comment, work break. How lucky am I? People would write, jealous. If she packaged the perfect Facebook life, maybe she would start to believe it herself. Or she could even post, mad as hell. Ziggy the only one in the class not invited to a birthday party. Gyaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaa
It was time. Ziggy was in school. She lived by the beach. She sent back the text, OKX. Okay, she took a sip of her tea and put her hands on the keyboard. It was her body that reacted. She wasn't even thinking about the text. She was thinking about Pete the plumber's receipt for wastes and plugs. A violent swoop of nausea made her fold in two, her forehead resting against the table. She pressed her palm across her mouth. Blood rushed from her head. She could smell that scent. She could swear it was real, that it was actually here in the apartment. Sometimes, if Ziggy's mood changed too fast, without warning, from happy to angry, she could smell it on him. She half straightened, gagging, and picked up her phone. She texted Anna with shaky fingers, don't give it to him. Changed my mind. The text came back almost instantly. Too late. Thea, I heard Jane had a quote-unquote fling with one of the fathers. I've no idea which one. Except I know it wasn't my husband. Bonnie, she did not. Carol, you know there was a man in their erotic book club. Not my husband, thank goodness. He only reads Golf Australia. Jonathan, yes, I was the man in the so-called erotic book club, except that was just a joke. It was a book club. A perfectly ordinary book club. Melissa, didn't Jane have an affair with the stay-at-home dad? Gabrielle, it wasn't Jane who had the affair. I always thought she was born again. Flat shoes, no jewellery, no makeup. But good body. Not an ounce of fat. She was the skinniest mother in the school. God, I'm hungry. Have you tried the 5 colon 2 diet? This is my fast day. I am dying of starvation. 21. Celeste arrived early for school pickup. She ached for her twins' compact little bodies, and for that all too brief moment when their hands curled, suffocatingly, possessively, around her neck and she kissed their hot, hard, fragrant little heads before they squirmed away. But she knew she would probably be yelling at them within 15 minutes. They'd be tired and crazy. She couldn't get them to sleep until 9 p.m. last night. Much too late. Bad mother. Just go to sleep, she'd ended up shrieking. She always had trouble getting them to bed at a reasonable hour, except when Perry was at home. They listened to Perry. He was a good dad. A good husband too. Most of the time. You need a bedtime routine, her brother had said on the phone from Auckland today, and Celeste had said, oh, what a revolutionary idea. I would never have thought of it. If parents had children who were good sleepers, they assumed this was due to their good parenting, not good luck. They followed the rules, and the rules had been proven to work. Celeste must therefore not be following the rules. And you could never prove it to them. They would die smug in their beds. Hi, Celeste. Celeste startled. Jane. She pressed a hand to her chest. As usual, she'd been dreaming and hadn't heard footsteps. It bugged her the way she kept jumping like a lunatic when people appeared. Sorry, said Jane. I didn't mean to creep up on you. How was your day? asked Celeste. Did you get lots of work done? She knew that Jane supported herself doing bookkeeping work. Celeste imagined her sitting at a tidy desk in her small bare apartment, she hadn't been there, but she knew the block of plain red brick apartments on Beaumont Street down by the beach, and she assumed inside would be unadorned, like Jane. No fuss. No knickknacks. The simplicity of her life seemed so compelling. Just Jane and Ziggy. One sweet, putting aside the strange choking incident, of course, quiet, dark-haired child. No fights. Life would be calm and uncomplicated. I got a bit done, said Jane. Her mouth made tiny little mouse-like movements as she chewed gum. 
I had coffee this morning with my parents and Madeline and Ed. Then the day sort of disappeared. The day goes so fast, agreed Celeste, although has had dragged. Are you going back to work now that the kids are at school? asked Jane. What did you do before the twins? I was a lawyer, said Celeste. I was someone else. Ha! Huh. I was meant to be a lawyer, said Jane. There was something wry and sad in her voice that Celeste couldn't quite interpret. They turned down the grassy laneway that led past a little white weatherboard house that almost seemed to be part of the school. I wasn't really enjoying it, said Celeste. Was this true? She had hated the stress. She ran late every day. But didn't she once love some aspects of it? The careful untangling of a legal issue. Like math, but with words. I couldn't go back to practicing law, said Celeste. Not with the boys. Sometimes I think I might do teaching. Teach legal studies. But I'm not sure that really appeals either. She had lost her nerve for work, like she'd lost her nerve for skiing. Jane was silent. She was probably thinking that Celeste was a spoiled trophy wife. I'm lucky, said Celeste. I don't have to work. Perry is, well, he's a hedge fund manager. Now she sounded show-offy, when she'd meant to sound grateful. Conversations with women about work could be so fraught. If Madeline had been there, she would have said, Perry earns a shitload, so Celeste can live a life of leisure. And then she would have done a typical Madeline about face and said something about how bringing up twin boys wasn't exactly a life of leisure and that Celeste probably worked harder than Perry. Perry liked Madeline. Feisty, he called her. I have to start doing some sort of exercise routine while Ziggy is at school, said Jane. I'm so unfit. I get breathless going up a tiny slope. It's terrible. Everyone around here is so fit and healthy. I'm not, said Celeste. I do no exercise at all. Madeline is always after me to go to the gym with her. She's crazy for those classes, but I hate gyms. Me too, said Jane with a grimace. Big sweaty men. We should go walking together when the kids are at school, said Celeste. Around the headland. Jane gave her a quick, shy, surprised grin. I'd love that. Harper, you know how Jane and Celeste were supposedly great friends. Well, obviously it wasn't all roses, because I did overhear something at the trivia night, quite by accident. It must have been only minutes before it happened. I was going out on the balcony to get some fresh air, well, to have a cigarette, if you must know, because I had a number of things on my mind anyway. Jane and Celeste were out there, and Celeste was saying, I'm sorry. I'm just so, so sorry. It was about an hour before school pickup when Samira, Madeline's boss at the Pirouille Theatre, called to discuss marketing for the new production of King Lear. Just before she hung up, finally. Madeline didn't get paid for the time she spent on these phone calls, and if her boss offered to pay, she'd have said no, but still, it would have been nice to have had the opportunity to graciously refuse, Samir mentioned that she had a whole stack of complimentary front row Disney on ice tickets if Madeline wanted them. When for? asked Madeline, looking at her wall calendar. Um, let's see. Saturday, February 28, 2pm. The box on the calendar was empty, but there was something familiar about the date. Madeline reached for her handbag and pulled out the pink envelope that Chloe had given her that morning. Amabella's A Party was at 2 p.m., Saturday, February 28. Madeline smiled. I'd love them. Thea, the invitations for Amabella's party went out first. And then next thing, that very same afternoon, Madeline is handing out free tickets for Disney on Ice, like she's Lady Mark. Samantha, those tickets cost a fortune, and Lily was so desperate to go. I didn't realize it was the same day as Amabella's party, but then again, 
Lily didn't know Amabella from a bar of soap, so I felt bad, but not that bad. Jonathan, I always said the best part of being a stay-at-home dad was leaving behind all the office politics. Then first day of school I get caught up in some war between these two women. Bonnie, we went to Amabella's party. I think Madeline forgot to offer us one of the Disney tickets. I'm sure it was just an oversight. Detective Sergeant Adrian Quinlan, we're talking to parents about everything that went on at that school. I can assure you it wouldn't be the first time that a dispute over a seemingly inconsequential matter led to violence. 22. Three months before the trivia night. Celeste and Perry sat on the couch, drinking red wine, eating lint chocolate balls and watching their third episode in a row of The Walking Dead. The boys were sound asleep. The house was quiet, except for the crunch of footsteps coming from the television. The main character was creeping through the forest, his knife drawn. A zombie appeared from behind a tree, her face black and rotting, her teeth snapping, making that guttural sound that zombies apparently make. Celeste and Perry both jumped and screamed. Perry spilled some of his red wine. He dabbed at the splash of wine on his t-shirt. That scared the life out of me. The man on the screen drove his knife through the zombie's skull. Gotcha, said Celeste. Pause it while I get us a refill, said Perry. Celeste picked up the remote and paused the DVD. This is even better than last season. I know, said Perry. Although I think it gives me bad dreams. He brought over the bottle of wine from the sideboard. Are we going to some kid's birthday party tomorrow, he asked as he refilled her glass. I ran into Mark Whitaker at Catalina's today and he seemed to think we were going. He said the mother mentioned we were invited. Renata somebody. Actually, did I meet a Renata that day when I went to the school with you? You did, said Celeste. We were invited to Amabella's party. But we're not going. She wasn't concentrating. That was the problem. She didn't have time to prepare. She was enjoying the wine, chocolate and zombies. Perry had only gotten back less than a week ago. He was always so loving and chipper after a trip, especially if he'd left the country. It somehow cleansed him. His face always seemed smoother, his eyes brighter. The layers of frustration would take weeks to build up again. The children had been in feral little moods tonight. Mummy gets a rest tonight, Perry told the boys earlier, and he'd done the whole bath, teeth, story routine on his own, while she sat on the couch, reading her book and drinking a Perry surprise. It was a cocktail he'd invented years ago. It tasted of chocolate and cream and strawberries and cinnamon, and every woman he ever prepared it for went crazy over it. I'll give you my children in return for that recipe, Madeline had once told Perry. Perry filled his own glass. Why aren't we going? I'm taking the boys to Disney on ice Madeline got free tickets, and a group of us are going. Celeste broke off another piece of chocolate. She'd texted her apologies to Renata and hadn't heard back. As the nanny did most of the school pickups and drop-offs, Celeste hadn't run into her since the first day of school. She knew she was aligning herself with Madeline and Jane by saying no, but, well, she was aligned with Madeline and Jane. And this was a fifth birthday party. This was not a matter of life or death. So I'm not welcome at this Disney thing, said Perry. He sipped his wine. She felt it then. In her stomach. A tiny squeeze. But his tone was casual. Humorous. If she trod carefully, she might still save the night. She put down the chocolate. Sorry, she said. I thought you'd appreciate a bit of alone time. You can go to the gym. Perry stood above her with the wine bottle still in his hand. He smiled. I've been away for three weeks. I'm away again next Friday. Why would I need alone time? He didn't sound or look angry, but she could feel something in the atmosphere, 
like an electrical charge before a storm. The hairs on her arms stood up. I'm sorry, she said. I didn't think. You sick of me already? He looked hurt. He was hurt. She'd been thoughtless. She should have known better. Perry was always looking for evidence that she didn't really love him. It was like he expected it, and then he was angry when he believed himself proven right. She went to stand up from the couch, but that would turn it into a confrontation. Sometimes, if she behaved normally, she could gently nudge them back on track. Instead, she looked up at him. The boys don't even know this little girl. And I hardly ever take them to see live shows. It just seemed like this was the better option. Well, why don't you take them to live shows, said Perry. We don't need free tickets. Why didn't you tell Madeline to give the tickets to someone who would really appreciate them? I don't know. It wasn't about money, really. She hadn't thought of that. She was depriving some other mother of a free ticket. She should have thought of the fact that Perry would be back and he'd want to spend time with the boys, but he was away so often, she was used to making social arrangements that suited her. I'm sorry, she said calmly. She was sorry, but it was fruitless, because he would never believe her. I probably should have chosen the party. She stood up. I'm going to take my contacts out. My eyes are itchy. She went to walk past him. He grabbed her upper arm. His fingers dug into the flesh. Hey, she said. That hurts. It was part of the game that her initial reaction was always one of outrage and surprise, as if this had never happened before, as if he maybe didn't know what he was doing. He gripped harder. Don't, she said. Perry. Just don't. The pain ignited her anger. The anger was always there, a reservoir of flammable fuel. She heard her voice turn high and hysterical. A shrieking shrewish woman. Perry, this is not a big deal. Don't turn everything into a big deal. Because now it was no longer about the party. Now it was about every other time. His hand tightened further. It looked like he was making a decision, exactly how much to hurt her. It hurt, but not that much. He shoved her, just hard enough so that she staggered back clumsily. Then he took a step back and lifted his chin, breathing heavily through his nostrils, his arms hanging loosely by his sides. He waited to see what she'd do next. There were so many options. Sometimes she tried to respond like an adult. That is unacceptable. Sometimes she yelled. Sometimes she walked away. Sometimes she fought back. She punched and kicked him the way she'd once punched and kicked her older brother. For a few moments he would let her, as if it were what he wanted, as if it were what he needed, before he grabbed her wrists. She wasn't the only one who woke up the next day with bruises. She'd seen them on Perry's body. She was as bad as he was. As sick as he was. I don't care who started it, she always said to the children. None of the options were effective. I will leave you if you ever do that again, she said after the first time, and she was deadly serious, my god she was serious. She knew exactly how she was meant to behave in a situation like this. The boys were only eight months old. Perry cried. She cried. He promised. He swore on his children's lives. He was heartbroken. He bought her the first piece of jewelry she would never wear. A week after the twins had their second birthday, it happened again. Worse than the first time. She was devastated. The marriage was over. She was going to leave. There was no doubt at all. But that very night, both boys woke up with terrible coughs. It was croup. The next day Josh got so sick, their GP said, I'm calling an ambulance. Josh was in intensive care for three nights. 
The tender purple bruises on Celeste's left hip were laughably irrelevant when a doctor stood in front of her saying gently, we think we should intubate. All she'd wanted was for Josh to be okay. And then he was okay, sitting up in his bed, demanding the wiggles and his brother in a voice still husky from that awful tube. She and Perry were euphoric with relief, and a few days after they brought Josh home from the hospital, Perry left for Hong Kong, and the moment for dramatic action had passed. And the unassailable fact that underlay all her indecisiveness was this, she loved Perry. She was still in love with him. She still had a crush on him. He made her happy and made her laugh. She still enjoyed talking with him, watching TV with him, lying in bed with him on cold, rainy mornings. She still wanted him. But each time she didn't leave, she gave him tacit permission to do it again. She knew this. She was an educated woman with choices, places to go, family and friends who would gather around, lawyers who would represent her. She could go back to work and support herself. She wasn't frightened that he'd kill her if she tried to leave. She wasn't frightened that he'd take the children away from her. One of the school mums, Gabrielle, often chatted with Celeste in the playground after school while her son and Celeste's boys played ninjas. I'm starting a new diet tomorrow, she told Celeste yesterday. I probably won't stick to it, and then I'll be all filled with self-loathing. She looked Celeste up and down and said, you've got no idea what I'm talking about, do you, skinny mini? Actually I do, Celeste thought. I know exactly what you mean. Now she pressed her hand to her upper arm and battled the desire to cry. She wouldn't be able to wear that sleeveless dress tomorrow now. I don't know why. She stopped. I don't know why I stay. I don't know why I deserve this. I don't know why you do this, why we do this, why this keeps happening. Celeste, he said hoarsely, and she could see the violence draining from his body. The DVD started again. Perry picked up the remote and turned off the television. Oh God. I'm so sorry. His face sagged with regret. It was over now. There would be no further recriminations about the party. In fact, the very opposite. He'd be tender and solicitous. For the next few days up until he left for his trip, no woman would be more cherished than Celeste. Part of her would enjoy it, the tremulous, teary, righteous feeling of being wronged. She let her hand drop from her arm. It could have been so much worse. He rarely hit her face. She'd never broken a limb or needed stitches. Her bruises could always be kept secret with a turtleneck or sleeves or long pants. He would never lay a finger on the children. The boys never saw. It could be worse. Oh, so much worse. She'd read the articles about proper domestic violence victims. That was terrible. That was real. What Perry did didn't count. It was small stuff, which made it all the more humiliating because it was so tacky. So childish and trite. He didn't cheat on her. He didn't gamble. He didn't drink to excess. He didn't ignore her, like the way her father had ignored her mother. That would be the worst. To be ignored. To not be seen. Perry's rage was an illness. A mental illness. She saw the way it took hold of him, how he tried his best to resist. When he was in the throes of it, his eyes became red and glassy, as if he were drugged. The things he said didn't even make sense. It wasn't him. The rage wasn't him. Would she leave him if he got a brain tumor and the tumor affected his personality? Of course she wouldn't. This was just a glitch in an otherwise perfect relationship. Every relationship had its glitches. Its ups, its downs. It was like motherhood. Every morning the boys climbed into bed with her for a cuddle, and at first it was heavenly, and then, after about ten minutes or so, they started fighting, and it was terrible. Her boys were gorgeous little darlings. Her boys were feral little animals. 
She would never leave Perry any more than she could leave the boys. Perry held out his arms. Celeste. She turned her head, took a step away, but there was no one else there to comfort her. There was only him. The real him. She stepped forward and laid her head against his chest. Samantha, I'll never forget the moment when Perry and Celeste walked into the trivia night. There was like this ripple across the room. Everyone just stopped and stared. 23. Isn't this fantastic, cried Madeline to Chloe as they took their really very excellent seats in front of the giant ice rink. You can feel the cold from the ice. B-R-R-R. Oh. Can you hear the music? I wonder where the princess is. Chloe had reached over and placed one hand gently over her mother's mouth. Shush. Madeline knew she was talking too much because she was feeling anxious and ever so slightly guilty. Today needed to be stupendous to make it worth the rift she'd created between herself and Renata. Eight kindergarten children, who would otherwise be attending Amabella's party, were here watching Disney on ice because of Madeline. Madeline looked past Chloe at Ziggy, who was nursing a giant stuffed toy on his lap. Ziggy was the reason they were here today, she reminded herself. Poor Ziggy wouldn't have been at the party. Dear little fatherless Ziggy. Who was possibly a secret psychopathic bully, but still. Are you taking care of Harry the Hippo this weekend, Ziggy, she said brightly. Harry the Hippo was the class toy. Every weekend it went home with a different child, along with a scrapbook that had to be returned with a little story about the weekend, accompanied by photos. Ziggy nodded mutely. A child of few words. Jane leaned forward, discreetly chewing gum as always. It's quite stressful having Harry to stay. We have to give Harry a good time. Last weekend he went on a roller coaster, ow. Jane recoiled as one of the twins, who were sitting next to her and fighting his brother, elbowed her in the back of the head. Josh, said Celeste sharply. Max. Just stop it. Madeline wondered if Celeste was okay today. She looked pale and tired, with purplish shadows under her eyes, although on Celeste they looked like an artful makeup effect that everyone should try. The lights in the auditorium began to dim and then went to black. Chloe clutched Madeline's arm. The music began to pound, so loud that Madeline could feel the vibrations. The ice rink filled with an array of colorful, swooping, whirling Disney characters. Madeline looked down the row of seats at her guests, their profiles illuminated by the blazing spotlights on the ice. Every child was looking straight ahead, little backs straight, enthralled by the spectacle in front of them and every parent had turned to look at their child's profile, enchanted by their enchantment. Except for Celeste, who had dropped her head and pressed her hand to her forehead. I have to leave him. Sometimes, when she was thinking about something else, the thought came into her head with the shock and the force of a flying fist. My husband hits me. God Almighty, what was wrong with her? All that insane rationalizing. A glitch, for God's sake. Of course she had to leave. Today. Right now. As soon as they got home from the show she would pack her bags. But the boys would be so tired and grumpy. It was fantastic, said Jane to her mother, who had called up to ask how Disney on ice went. Ziggy loved it. He says he wants to learn how to ice skate. Your grandfather loved to ice skate, said her mother triumphantly. There you go, said Jane, not bothering to tell her mother that every single child had announced after the show that they now wanted to learn how to ice skate. Not just those with past lives. Well, and you'll never guess who I ran into at the shops today, said her mother. Ruth Sullivan. Did you, said Jane, wondering if this was the real reason for the call. Ruth was her ex-boyfriend's mother. How sack, she asked dutifully as she unwrapped a new piece of gum. Fine, said her mother. Here's, ah, uh, 
well he's engaged, darling. Is he, said Jane. She slipped the gum in her mouth and chewed, wondering how she felt about that, but there was something else distracting her now, a tiny possibility of a tiny catastrophe. She began walking around their messy apartment, picking up cushions and discarded clothes. I wasn't sure I should tell you, said her mother. I know it was a long time ago, but he did break your heart. He didn't break my heart, said Jane vaguely. He did break her heart, but he broke it so gently, so respectfully and regretfully, the way a nice, well-brought-up 19-year-old boy did break your heart when he wanted to go on a Contiki tour of Europe and sleep with lots of girls. When she thought about Zack now it was like remembering an old school friend, someone she would hug with genuine teary tenderness if they met at their school reunion, and then not see again until the next reunion. Jane got down on her knees and looked under the couch. Ruth asked about Ziggy, said her mother meaningfully. Did she, said Jane. I showed her the photo of Ziggy on his first day of school, and I was watching her face, and she didn't say anything, thank goodness, but I just knew what she was thinking, because I have to say, Ziggy's face in that photo does look a teeny bit like. Mum. Ziggy looks nothing like Zack, said Jane, getting back to her feet. She hated it when she caught herself deconstructing Ziggy's beautiful face, looking for a familiar feature, the lips, the nose, the eyes. Sometimes she thought she'd see something, a flash of something out of the corner of her eye, and then she'd die a little, before quickly reassembling Ziggy into Ziggy. Oh, I know, said her mother. Nothing at all like Zack. And Zack is not Ziggy's father. Oh, I know that darling. Goodness. I know that. You would have told me. More to the point, I would have told Zack. Zack had phoned her after Ziggy was born. Is there something you need to tell me, Jane, he'd said in a tight, bright voice. Nope, Jane had told him, and she'd heard his tiny exhalation of relief. Well, I know that, said her mother. She quickly changed the subject. Tell me. Did you get some good photos with the class toy? Your father is emailing you this wonderful place where you can get them printed off for. How much is it, Bill? How much? No, Jane's photos. For that thing she has to do for Ziggy. Mum, interrupted Jane. She walked into the kitchen and picked up Ziggy's backpack where it lay on the floor. She held it upside down. Nothing fell out. It's fine, Mum. I know where to get the photos done. Her mother ignored her. Bill. Listen to me. You said there was a website. Her voice faded. Jane walked into Ziggy's bedroom where he was sitting on the floor playing with his Legos. She lifted up his bedclothes and shook them. He's going to email you the details, said her mother. Wonderful, said Jane distractedly. I've got to go, mum. I'll call you tomorrow. She hung up. Her heart pounded. She pressed the palm of her hand to her forehead. No. Surely not. She could not have been so stupid. Ziggy looked up at her curiously. Jane said, I think we've got a problem. There was silence when Madeline picked up the phone. Hello, said Madeline again. Who is it? She could hear someone crying and saying something incoherent. Jane? Madeline suddenly recognized the voice. What's the matter? What is it? It's nothing, said Jane. She sniffed. Nobody died. It's sort of funny, really. It's hilarious that I'm crying over this. What happened? It's just. Oh, what will those other mothers think of me now? Jane's voice quavered. Who cares what they think, said Madeline. I care, 
said Jane. Jane. Just tell me. What is it? What happened? We've lost him, sobbed Jane. Lost who? You've lost Ziggy? Madeline felt the panic rise. She was obsessed with losing her own children, and quickly confirmed their respective locations, Chloe in bed, Fred doing his reading with Ed, Abigail staying at her dad's place, yet again. We left him sitting on the seat. I remember actually thinking what a disaster it would be if we left him behind. I actually thought that, but then Josh got his nosebleed and we all got distracted. I've left a message on the lost property number, but he wasn't labelled or anything. Jane. You're not making any sense. Harry the Hippo. We've lost Harry the Hippo. Thea, that's the thing about these Gen Y kids. They're careless. Harry the Hippo had been with the school for over ten years. That cheap synthetic toy she replaced it with smelled just terrible. Made in China. The hippo's face wasn't even friendly. Harper, look, it wasn't so much that she lost Harry the hippo, but that she put photos in the scrapbook of the little exclusive group who went to Disney on ice. So all the kids get to see that, and the poor little tots are thinking, why wasn't I invited? As I said to Renata, that was just thoughtless. Samantha, yes, and you know what's really shocking? Those were the last photos ever taken of Harry the Hippo. Harry the Heritage listed Hippo. Harry the. Sorry, it's not funny. It's not funny at all. Gabrielle, oh my god, the fuss when poor Jane lost the class toy, and everyone is pretending it's not a big deal, but clearly it is a big deal, and I'm thinking, can you people get a life? Hey, do I look thinner than when we last met? I've lost 3 kilos. 24. Two months before the trivia night. The green, cried Madeline as she sprayed green hairspray into Chloe's hair for the athletics carnival. Chloe and Fred were dolphins and their house color was green, which was fortunate because Madeline looked good in green. When Abigail had been at her old primary school, her house color was unflattering yellow. That stuff is so bad for the ozone layer, said Abigail. Really? Madeline held the spray can aloft. Didn't we fix that? Mum, you can't fix the hole in the ozone layer. Abigail rolled her eyes with contempt as she ate her homemade, preservative-free, flaxseed and whatever the hell else was in it muesli. These days whenever she came home from her father's place, she got out of his car, weighed down with food, as if she'd been provisioned for a trip to the wilderness. I didn't mean we fixed the whole ozone layer, I meant the thing with aerosol cans. The, um, the something or others. Madeline held up the hairspray can and frowned at it, trying to read the writing on the side, but the type was too small. Madeline had once had a boyfriend who thought she was cute and stupid, and it was true, she was cute and stupid the whole time she was with him. Living with a teenage daughter was exactly the same. The CFCs, said Ed, aerosol cans don't have CFCs anymore. Whatever, said Abigail. The twins think their mum is going to win the mother's race today, said Chloe as Madeline began to French braid her green hair. But I told them you were a trillion times faster. Madeline laughed. She couldn't imagine Celeste running in a race. She'd probably run in the wrong direction, or not even notice the starter gun had gone off. She was always so distracted. Bonnie will probably win, said Abigail. She's a really fast runner. Bonnie, said Madeline. Ahem, warned Ed. What, snapped Abigail. Why shouldn't she be fast? I just thought she was more into yoga and things like that. Non-cardio things, said Madeline. She returned to Chloe's hair. She's fast. I've seen her in a race with Dad at the beach, and Bonnie is, like, much younger than you, Mum. Ed chuckled. You're a brave girl, Abigail. Madeline laughed. One day, Abigail, when you're thirty, 
I'm going to repeat back to you some of the things you've said to me over the past year. Abigail threw down her spoon. I'm just saying don't get upset if you don't win. Yes, yes, okay, thank you, said Madeline soothingly. She and Ed had laughed at Abigail, when she hadn't meant to be funny, and she didn't quite understand why it was funny, so she now felt embarrassed, and therefore enraged. I mean, I don't know why you feel so competitive with her, said Abigail viciously. It's not like you want to be married to dad anymore, do you, so what's your problem? Abigail, said Ed, I don't like your tone. Speak nicely to your mother. Madeline shook her head slightly at Ed. God! Abigail pushed away her breakfast bowl and stood up. Oh, calamity, thought Madeline. There goes the morning. Chloe swiveled her head away from Madeline's hands so she could watch her sister. I can't even speak now. Abigail's whole body trembled. I can't even be myself in my own home. I can't relax. Madeline was reminded of Abigail's first ever tantrum, when she was nearly three. Madeline had thought that she was never going to have a tantrum, all due to her good parenting. So it had been such a shock to see Abigail's little body whipped about by violent emotion. She'd wanted to keep eating a chocolate frog she'd dropped on the supermarket floor. Madeline should just have let the poor kid eat it. Abigail, there's no need to be so dramatic. Just calm down, said Ed. Madeline thought, thank you, darling, because that always works, doesn't it, telling a woman to calm down. Me you am. Um. I can only find one shoe, hollered Fred from down the hallway. Just a minute, Fred, called back Madeline. Abigail shook her head slowly, as if truly flabbergasted by the outrageous treatment she was forced to endure. You know what, Mum, she said without looking at Madeline. I was going to tell you this later, but I'll tell you now. M-U-U-M, yelled Fred. Mummy is busy, screeched Chloe. Look under your bed, shouted Ed. Madeline's ears rang. What is it, Abigail? I've decided I want to live full time with Dad and Bonnie. What did you say? said Madeline, but she'd heard. She'd feared it for so long, and everyone kept saying, no, no, that would never happen. Abigail would never do that. She needs her mother. But Madeline had known for months it was coming. She knew it would happen. She wanted to scream at Ed, why did you tell her to calm down? I just feel it's better for me, said Abigail. Spiritually. She'd stopped trembling now and calmly took her bowl from the table over to the sink. Lately she'd begun walking the same way Bonnie walked, back ballet dancer straight, eyes on some spiritual point on the horizon. Chloe's face crumpled. I don't want Abigail to live with her dad. Tears spilled copiously. The color on the green lightning shapes on her cheeks began to run. M-U-U-M, shouted Fred. The neighbors would think he was being murdered. Ed dropped his forehead into his hand. If that's what you really want, said Madeline. Abigail turned from the sink and met her eyes, and for a moment it was just the two of them, like it was for all those years. Madeline and Abigail. The Mackenzie girls. When life was quiet and simple. They used to eat breakfast in bed together before school, side by side pillows behind their backs, their books on their laps. Madeline held her gaze. Remember, Abigail. Remember us. Abigail turned away. That's what I want. Stu, I was there at the athletics carnival. The mother's race was fucking hilarious. Excuse my French. But some of those women, you'd think it was the Olympics. Seriously. Samantha, oh rubbish. Ignore my husband. Nobody was taking it seriously. I was laughing so hard, I got a stitch. Nathan was at the carnival. Madeline couldn't believe it when she ran into him outside the sausage sizzle stall, 
hand in hand with sky. This morning of all mornings. Not many dads came to the athletics carnival, unless they were stay-at-home dads or their children were especially sporty, but here was Madeline's ex-husband taking the time off work to be there, wearing a striped polo shirt and shorts, baseball cap and sunglasses, the quintessential good daddy uniform. So, this is a first for you, said Madeline. She saw there was a whistle around his neck. He was volunteering, for God's sake. He was being involved. Ed was the sort of dad who volunteered at the school, but he was on deadline today. Nathan was pretending to be Ed. He was pretending to be a good man, and everyone was falling for it. Sure is, beamed Nathan, and then his grin faded as presumably it crossed his mind that his firstborn daughter must have taken part in athletics carnivals when she was in primary school too. Of course, these days, he was at all of Abigail's events. Abigail wasn't sporty, but she played the violin, and Nathan and Bonnie were at every concert without fail, beaming and clapping, as if they'd been there all along, as if they'd driven her to those violin lessons in Petersham where you could never get a parking spot, as if they'd helped pay for all those lessons that Madeline couldn't afford as a single mother with an ex-husband who didn't contribute a single cent. And now she was choosing him. Has Abigail spoken to you about? Nathan winced a little, as if he were referring to a delicate health issue. About living with you, said Madeline. She has. Just this morning, actually. The hurt felt physical. Like the start of a bad flu. Like betrayal. He looked at her. Is that? Fine with me, said Madeline. She would not give him the satisfaction. We'll have to work out the money, said Nathan. He paid child support for Abigail now that he was a good person. Paid it on time. Without complaint, and neither of them ever referred to the first ten years of Abigail's life, when apparently it hadn't cost anything to feed or clothe her. So you mean I'll have to pay you child support now, said Madeline. Nathan looked shocked. Oh, no I didn't mean that. But you're right. It's only fair if she's living at your place most of the time, said Madeline. Obviously, I would never take your money, Maddie, he interrupted. Not when I, when I didn't, when I wasn't able to, when all those years, he grimaced. Look, I'm aware that I wasn't the best father when Abigail was little. I should never have mentioned money. Things are just a bit tight for us at the moment. Maybe you should sell your flashy sports car, said Madeline. Yeah, said Nathan. He looked mortified. I should. You're right. Although it's not actually worth as much as you. Anyway. Skye gazed up at her father with big worried eyes, and she did that rapid blinking thing again that Abigail used to do. Madeline saw Nathan smile fiercely at the little girl and squeeze her hand. She'd shamed him. She'd shamed him while he stood hand in hand with his waif-like daughter. Ex-husbands should live in different suburbs. They should send their children to different schools. There should be legislation to prevent this. You were not meant to deal with complicated feelings of betrayal and hurt and guilt at your kids' athletics carnivals. Feelings like this should not be brought out in public. Why did you have to move here, Nathan, she sighed. What, said Nathan. Madeline. Time for the kindy mum's race. You up for it? It was the kindergarten teacher, Miss Barnes, hair up in a high ponytail, skin glowing like an American cheerleader. She looked fresh and fecund. A delicious ripe piece of fruit. Even riper than Bonnie. Her eyelids didn't sag. Nothing sagged. Everything in her bright young life was clear and simple and perky. Nathan took his sunglasses off to see her better, visibly cheered just by the sight of her. Ed would have been the same. Bring it on, Miss Barnes, said Madeline. Detective Sergeant Adrian Quinlan. We're looking at the victim's relationships with every parent who attended the trivia night. Harper, 
Yes, as a matter of fact, I do have certain theories. Stu, theories? I've got nothing. Nothing but a hangover. 25. The kindergarten mothers gathered in a ragged, giggly line at the start line of their race. The sunlight reflected off their sunglasses. The sky was a giant blue shell. The sea glinted sapphire on the horizon. Jane smiled at the other mothers. The other mothers smiled back at her. It was all very nice. Very sociable. I'm sure it's all in your head, Jane's mother had told her. Everyone will have forgotten that silly mix-up on orientation day. Jane had been trying so hard to fit into the school community. She did canteen duty every two weeks. Every Monday morning she and another parent volunteer helped out Miss Barnes by listening to the children practice their reading. She made polite chit-chat at drop-off and pick-up. She invited children over for playdates. But Jane still felt that something was not right. It was there in the slight turn of her head, the smiles that didn't reach the eyes, the gentle waft of judgment. This was not a big deal, she kept telling herself. This was little stuff. There was no need for the sense of dread. This world of lunch boxes and library bags, grazed knees, and grubby little faces, was in no way connected to the ugliness of that warm spring night and the bright downlight like a staring eye in the ceiling, the pressure on her throat, the whispered words worming their way into her brain. Stop thinking about it. Stop thinking about it. Now Jane waved at Ziggy, who was sitting on the bleachers near the sidelines with the kindergarten kids under the watchful eye of Miss Barnes. You know I'm not going to win, right, she'd said to him this morning at breakfast. Some of these mothers had personal trainers. One of them was a personal trainer. On your marks, mums, said Jonathan, the nice stay-at-home dad who had gone with them to Disney on ice. How many meters is this, anyway, said Harper. That finish line looks like it's a long way away, said Gabrielle. Let's all go have coffee instead. Is that Renata and Celeste holding the finishing tape, said Samantha. How did they get out of this? I think Renata said that she. Renata has shin splints, interrupted Harper. Very painful apparently. We should all stretch, girls, said Bonnie who was dressed like she was about to teach a yoga class, a yellow singlet top sliding off one shoulder as she languidly lifted one ankle and pulled it up behind her leg. Oh, by the way, Jess, said Audrey or Andrea. Jane could never remember her name. She stepped right up close to Jane and spoke in a low, confidential voice, as if she were about to reveal a deep, dark secret. Jane had gotten used to it by now. The other day she stepped up close, lowered her voice and said, is it library day today? It's Jane, said Jane. She could hardly be offended. Sorry, said Andrea or Audrey. Listen. Are you for or against? For or against what, said Jane. Ladies, cried Jonathan. Cupcakes, said Audrey or Andrea. For or against? She's four, said Madeline. Fun police. Madeline, let her speak for herself, said Audrey or Andrea. She looks very health conscious to me. Madeline rolled her eyes. Um, well, I like cupcakes, said Jane. We're doing a petition to ban parents from sending in cupcakes for the whole class on their kids' birthdays, said Andrea or Audrey. There's an obesity crisis, and every second day the children are having sugary treats. What I don't get is why this school is so obsessed with petitions, said Madeline irritably. It's so adversarial. Why can't you just make a suggestion? Ladies, please. Jonathan held up his starter gun. Where's Jackie today, Jonathan? asked Gabrielle. The mothers were all mildly obsessed with Jonathan's wife, ever since she'd been interviewed on the business segment of the evening news a few nights back, 
sounding terrifyingly precise and clever about a corporate takeover and putting the journalist in his place. Also, Jonathan was very good-looking in a George Clooney-esque way, so constant references to his wife were necessary to show that they hadn't noticed this and weren't flirting with him. She's in Melbourne, said Jonathan. Stop talking to me. On your marks. The women moved to the start line. Bonnie looks so professional, commented Samantha as Bonnie crouched down into a starting position. I hardly ever run these days, said Bonnie. It's so violent on the joints. Jane saw Madeline glance over at Bonnie and dig the toe of her sneaker firmly into the grass. Enough with the chit-chat, ladies, roared Jonathan. I love it when you're masterful, Jonathan, said Samantha. Get set. This is quite nerve-wracking, said Audrey or Andrea to Jane. How do the poor kids cope with the... The gun cracked. Thea, I do have my own ideas about what might have happened but I'd rather not speak ill of the dead. As I say to my four daughters, if you can't say anything nice, don't say anything at all. 26. Celeste could feel the pressure of Renata's grip at the other end of the finishing tape, and she tried to match it with her own, except that she kept forgetting to concentrate on where she was and what she was doing. How's Perry? called out Renata. In the country at the moment. Whenever Renata made an appearance at school or school events, she made an amusing point of not talking to Jane or Madeline. Madeline loved it, poor Jane not so much, but she always talked to Celeste, in a defensive, prickly way, as though Celeste were an old friend who had wronged her but she was choosing to be mature and rise above it. His great, called back Celeste. Last night it had been over Legos. The boys had left their Legos everywhere. She should have made them pick them up. Perry was right. It was just easier to do it herself after they were asleep, rather than do battle with them. The whining. The drama. She just didn't have the resilience last night to go through it. Lazy parenting. She was a bad mother. You're turning them into spoiled brats, Perry had said. They're only five, Celeste had said. She was sitting on the couch folding laundry. They get tired after school. I don't want to live in a pigsty, said Perry. He kicked at the Legos on the floor. So pick them up yourself, said Celeste tiredly. There. Right there. She brought it on herself. Every time. Perry just looked at her. Then he got down on his hands and knees and carefully picked up every piece of Lego from the carpet and put it in the big green box. She'd kept folding, watching him. Was he really going to just pick it all up? He stood and carried the box over to where she sat today. It's pretty simple. Either get the kids to pick it up, or pick it up yourself, or pay for a fucking housekeeper. In one swift move he upended the entire box of Legos over her head in a noisy, violent torrent. The shock and humiliation made her gasp. She stood up, grabbed a handful of Legos from her lap and threw them straight at his face. See there? Again. Celeste at fault. She behaved like a child. It was almost laughable. Slapstick. Two grown-ups throwing things at each other. He slapped her across the face with the back of his hand. He never punched her. He would never do anything so uncouth. She staggered back, and her knee banged against the edge of the glass coffee table. She regained her balance and flew at him with her hands like claws. He shoved her away from him with disgust. Well, why not? Her behavior was disgusting. He went to bed then, and she cleaned up all the Legos and threw their uneaten dinner in the bin. Her lip was bruised and tender this morning, like she was about to get a cold sore. It wasn't enough for anyone to comment upon. Her knee had banged against the side of the coffee table, and it was stiff and painful. Not too bad. Not much at all, really. 
This morning Perry had been cheerful, whistling while he boiled eggs for the boys. What happened to your neck, Daddy, said Josh. There was a long, thin, red scratch down the side of his neck where Celeste must have scratched him. My neck? Perry had put his hand over the scratch and glanced over at Celeste with laughter in his eyes. It was the sort of humorous, secret look that parents share when their children say something innocent and cute about Santa Claus or sex. As if what happened last night were a normal part of married life. It's nothing, mate, he'd said to Josh. I wasn't looking where I was going and I walked into a tree. Celeste couldn't get the expression on Perry's face out of her mind. He thought it was funny. He genuinely thought it was funny, and of no particular consequence. Celeste pressed a finger to her tender lip. Was it normal? Perry would say, no, we're not normal. We're not Mr. and Mrs. Average, mediocre people in mediocre relationships. We're different. We're special. We love each other more. Everything is more intense for us. We have better sex. The starter gun cracked the air, startling her. Here they come, said Renata. Fourteen women ran straight at them as if they were chasing thieves, arms pumping, chests thrust forward, chins jutting, some of them laughing but most looking deadly serious. The children shouted and hollered. Celeste tried to look for the boys, but she couldn't see them. I can't run in the mother's race after all, she told them this morning. I fell down the stairs after you went to bed last night. Or, oh, said Max, but it was an automatic whine. He didn't seem to really care. You should be more careful, Josh had said quietly, without looking at her. I should, Celeste had agreed. She really should. Bonnie and Madeline led the pack. They pulled in front. It was neck and neck. Go Madeline, thought Celeste. Go, go, go yes. Their chests hit the finishing tape. Definitely Madeline. Bonnie by a nose, shouted Renata. No, no, I'm sure Madeline was first, said Bonnie to Renata. Bonnie didn't seem to have exerted herself at all. The color on her cheeks was just a little higher than usual. No, no, it was you, Bonnie, said Madeline breathlessly, although she knew she'd won because she kept Bonnie in her peripheral vision. She bent over, hands on her knees, trying to catch her breath. There was a stinging sensation on her cheekbone where her necklace had whipped across it. I'm pretty sure it was Madeline, said Celeste. Definitely Bonnie, interrupted Renata, and Madeline nearly laughed out loud. So your vendetta has come to this now, Renata. Not letting me win the mother's race. I'm sure it was Madeline, said Bonnie. I'm sure it was Bonnie, countered Madeline. Oh, for heaven's sake, let's call it a tie, said a year six mother, a blonde bob in charge of handing out the ribbons. Madeline straightened. Absolutely not. Bonnie is the winner. She plucked the blue winner's ribbon from the year six mother's hand and pressed it into Bonnie's palm, folding her fingers over it, as if she were entrusting one of the children with a two dollar coin. You beat me, Bonnie. She met Bonnie's pale blue eyes and saw understanding register. You beat me fair and square. Samantha, Madeline won. We were all killing ourselves laughing when Renata insisted it was Bonnie. But do I think that led to a murder? No, I do not. Harper, I came in third, if anyone is interested. Melissa, technically, Juliet came third. You know, Renata's nanny. But Harper was all, a 21-year-old nanny doesn't count. And then, of course, these days we all like to pretend Juliet never existed. 27. Samantha, listen, you need to get your head around the demographics of this place. So first of all you've got your blue collars, tradies, we call them. We've got a lot of tradies in Pirui. 
like my stew. Salt of the earth. Or salt of the sea, because they all surf, of course. Most of the tradies grew up here and never left. Then you've got your alternative types. Your dippy hippies. And in the last ten years or so, all these wealthy XX and banker wankers have moved in and built massive McMansions up on the cliffs. But. There's only one primary school for all our kids. So at school events you've got a plumber, a banker, and a crystal healer standing around trying to make conversation. It's hilarious. No wonder we had a riot. Celeste arrived home from the athletics carnival to find her house cleaner's car parked out front. When she turned the key in the front door, the vacuum cleaner was roaring upstairs. She went into the kitchen to make herself a cup of tea. The cleaners came once a week on a Friday morning. They charged $200 and did a beautiful, sparkling job. Celeste's mother had gasped when she'd heard how much Celeste spent on cleaning. Darling, I'll come and help you once a week, she'd said. You can save the money for something else. Her mother could not grasp the scale of Perry's wealth. When she first visited the big house with the sweeping beach views, she'd walked around with the polite, strained expression of a tourist watching a confronting cultural demonstration. She'd finally agreed it was very airy. For her, $200 was a scandalous amount of money to spend on something that you could, should, do yourself. She would be horrified if she could see Celeste right now, sitting down, while other people cleaned her house. Celeste's mother had never sat down. She'd come home from working night shift at the hospital, walk straight into the kitchen and make the family a cooked breakfast, while Celeste's dad read the paper and Celeste and her brother fought. Good God, the fight Celeste had had with her brother. He'd hit her. She'd always hit him back. Maybe if she hadn't grown up with a big brother, if she hadn't grown up with that tough Aussie tomboy mentality, if a boy hits you, you hit him right back. Perhaps if she'd wept softly and prettily the first time that Perry had hit her, then maybe it wouldn't keep happening. The vacuum cleaner stopped, and she heard a man's voice, followed by a roar of raucous laughter. Her cleaners were a young married Korean couple. They normally worked in complete silence when Celeste was in the house, so they mustn't have heard her come in. They only showed her their professional faces. She felt irrationally hurt, as if she wanted to be their friend. Let's all laugh and chat while you clean my house. There were running footsteps above her head and a peal of girlish laughter. Stop having fun in my house. Clean. Celeste drank her tea. The mug stung her sore lip. She felt jealous of her cleaners. Here she sat, in her big house, sulking. She put down her tea took her Amex card out of her wallet and opened her laptop. She logged onto the World Vision website and clicked through photos of children available for sponsorship, products on a shelf for rich white women like her. She already sponsored three children, and she tried to get the boys interested. Look. Here's little blessing from Zimbabwe. She has to walk miles for fresh water. You just have to walk to the tap. Why doesn't she just get some money from the ATM, said Josh. It was Perry who answered, who patiently explained, who talked to the children about gratitude and helping those less fortunate than themselves. Celeste sponsored another four children. Writing letters and birthday cards to them all would take hours. Ungrateful bitch. Deserve to be hit. Deserve it. She pinched the flesh on her upper thighs until it brought tears to her eyes. There would be new bruises tomorrow. Bruises she'd given herself. She liked to watch them change, deepening, darkening, and then slowly fading. It was a hobby. An interest of hers. Nice to have an interest. She was losing her mind. She trawled through charity websites representing all the pain and suffering the world has to offer, cancer, rare genetic disorders, poverty, human rights abuse, natural disasters. She gave and gave and gave. 
Within 20 minutes she donated $20,000 of Perry's money. It gave her no satisfaction, no pride or pleasure. It sickened her. She made charitable donations while a young girl got down on her hands and knees and scrubbed the grubby corners of her shower stool. Clean your own house, then. Sack the cleaners. But that wouldn't help them either, would it? Give more money to charity. Give until it hurts. She spent another $5,000. Would that hurt their financial situation? She didn't actually know. Perry took care of the money. It was his area of expertise, after all. He didn't hide it from her. She knew that he would happily go through all their accounts and investment portfolios with her, if she so wished, but the thought of knowing the exact figures gave her vertigo. I opened the electricity bill today and I just wanted to cry, Madeline had said the other day, and Celeste had wanted to offer to pay it for her, but of course, Madeline didn't want her charity. She and Ed were perfectly comfortable. It was just that there were so many different levels of comfortable, and at Celeste's level no electricity bill could make her cry. Anyway, you couldn't just hand money over to your friends. You could pick up lunch or coffee whenever you could, but even then you had to be careful not to offend, to not do it so often that it looked like you were showing off, as if the money were part of her, when in fact the money was Perry's, it had nothing to do with her, it was just random luck, like the way she looked. It wasn't a decision she'd made. Once, when she'd been at uni, she'd been in a great mood, and she'd bounced into her tutorial and sat next to a girl called Linda. Morning, she'd said. An expression of comical dismay crossed Linda's face. Oh, Celeste, she'd moaned. I just can't handle you today. Not when I'm feeling like shit and you waltz in here looking like, you know, like that. She waved her hand at Celeste's face, as if at something disgusting. The girls around them had exploded with joyous laughter, as if something hilarious and subversive had finally been said out loud. They laughed and laughed, and Celeste had smiled stiffly, idiotically, because how could you possibly respond to that? It felt like a slap, but she had to respond like it was a compliment. You had to be grateful. Don't ever look too happy, she told herself. It's aggravating. Grateful, grateful, grateful. The vacuum cleaner started again upstairs. Perry had never, in all their years together, made a comment on how she chose to spend their, his, money, except to remind her occasionally, mildly, humorously, that she could spend more if she liked. You know we can afford to get you a new one, he'd said once when he came upon her in the laundry scrubbing furiously at a stain on the collar of a silk shirt. I like this one, she'd said. The stain was blood. Once she stopped working, her relationship to money had changed. She used it the same way she'd use someone else's bathroom, carefully and politely. She knew that in the eyes of the law and society, supposedly, she was contributing to their lives by running the house and bringing up the boys but she still never spent Perry's money in the same way she'd once spent her own. She'd certainly never spent $25,000 in one afternoon. Would he comment? Would he be angry? Was that why she'd done it? Sometimes, on the days when she could feel his rage simmering, when she knew it was only a matter of time, when she could smell it in the air, she'd deliberately provoke him. She'd make it happen, so it was done. Even when she was giving to charity, was it really just another step in the sick dance of their marriage? It wasn't like it was unprecedented. They went to charity balls and Perry would bid twenty, thirty, forty thousand dollars with the unsmiling nod of a head. But that wasn't about giving, so much as winning. I'll never be outbid, he told her once. He was generous with his money. If he ever discovered that a family member or friend was in need, he discreetly wrote a check or did a direct transfer, waving away thanks, changing the subject, seemingly embarrassed by the ease with which he could solve someone else's financial crisis. The doorbell rang, and she went to answer it. Mrs. White. A stocky, bearded man handed her a giant bouquet of flowers. 
Thank you, said Celeste. Someone is a lucky lady, said the man, as if he'd never seen a woman receive such an impressive arrangement. I sure am. The sweet heavy scent tickled her nose. Once, she'd love to receive flowers. Now it was like being handed a series of tasks, find the vase. Cut the stems. Arrange them like so. Ungrateful bitch. She read the tiny card. I love you. I'm sorry. Perry. Written in the florist's handwriting. It was always so strange to see Perry's words transcribed by someone else. Did the florist wonder what Perry had done? What husbandly transgression he had committed last night? Coming home late. She carried the flowers toward the kitchen. The bouquet was shaking, she noticed, shivering as if it were cold. She tightened her grip on the stems. She could throw them against the wall, but it would be so unsatisfying. They would flop ineffectually to the ground. There would be drifts of sodden petals across the carpet. She'd have to scrabble around on the floor for them before the cleaners came downstairs. For God's sake, Celeste. You know what you have to do. She remembered the year she turned 25, the year she appeared in court for the first time, the year she bought her first car and invested in the stock market for the first time, the year she played competitive squash every Saturday. She had great triceps and a loud laugh. That was the year she met Perry. Motherhood and marriage had made her a soft, spongy version of the girl she used to be. She laid the flowers down carefully on the dining room table and went back to her laptop. She typed the words marriage counselor into Google. Then she stopped. Backspace, backspace, backspace. No. Been there, done that. This wasn't about housework and hurt feelings. She needed to talk to someone who knew that people behaved like this, someone who would ask the right questions. She could feel her cheeks burn as she typed in the two shameful words. Domestic. Violence. 28. There are harder things than this, thought Madeline as she folded a pair of white skinny jeans and added them to the half-packed open suitcase on Abigail's bed. Madeline had no right to the feelings she was experiencing. Their magnitude embarrassed her. They were wildly disproportionate to the situation at hand. So, Abigail wanted to live with her father and she wasn't being all that nice about it. But she was 14. 14-year-olds were not known for their empathy. Madeline kept thinking she was fine about it. She was over it. No big deal. She was busy. Other things to do. And then it would hit her again, like a blow to the abdomen. She'd find herself taking short shallow breaths as if she were in labor. Twenty-seven hours with Abigail. Nathan and the midwife joked about football while Madeline died. Well, she didn't die, but she remembered thinking that this sort of pain could only end in death, and the last words she'd hear would be about Manley's chances of winning the premiership. She lifted one of Abigail's tops from the laundry basket. It was a pale peachy color, and it didn't suit Abigail's coloring, but she loved it. It was hand wash only. Bonnie could do that now. Or maybe the new upgraded version of Nathan did laundry now. Nathan version 2.0. Stays with his wife. Volunteers at homeless shelters. Hand washes. He was coming over later today with his brother's truck to pick up Abigail's bed. Last night Abigail had asked Madeline if she could please take her bed to Nathan's house. It was a beautiful four-poster canopy bed that Madeline and Ed had given Abigail for her 14th birthday. It had been worth every exorbitant cent to see the ecstasy on Abigail's face when she first saw it. She'd actually danced with joy. It was like remembering another person. Your bed stays here, Ed said. It's her bed, Madeline said. I don't mind if she takes it. She said it to hurt Abigail, to hurt her back, to show that she didn't care that Abigail was moving out, 
that she would now come to visit on weekends, but her real life, her real home would be somewhere else. But Abigail wasn't hurt at all. She was just pleased she was getting the bed. Hey, said Ed from the bedroom door. Hey, said Madeline. Abigail should be packing her own clothes, said Ed, surely she's old enough. Maybe she was, but Madeline did all the laundry in the house. She knew where things were in the wash, dry, fold, put away assembly line, so it made sense for Madeline to do it. Ever since Ed had first met Abigail, he'd always expected just a little too much of her. How many times had she heard those exact words? Surely she's old enough. He didn't know children of Abigail's age, and it seemed to Madeline that he always shot just a little too high. It was different with Fred and Chloe, because he'd been there from the beginning. He knew and understood them in a way he never really knew and understood Abigail. Of course, he was fond of her, and he was a good, attentive stepdad, a tricky role he'd taken on immediately without complaint, two months after they began dating. Ed went with Abigail to a Father's Day morning tea at school, Abigail had adored him back then, and maybe they would have had a great relationship except that Nathan the prodigal father had returned at the worst time, when Abigail was eleven. Too old to be managed. Too young to understand or control her feelings. She changed overnight. It was as though she thought showing Ed even just basic courtesy was a betrayal of her father. Ed had an old-fashioned authoritarian streak that didn't respond well to disrespect, and it certainly compared unfavorably to Nathan's let's have a laugh persona. Do you think it's my fault, said Ed. Madeline looked up. What? That Abigail is moving in with her dad. He looked distressed, uncertain. Was I too hard on her? Of course not, she said although she did think it was partly his fault, but what was the point in saying that? I think Bonnie is the real attraction, she said. Do you ever wonder if Bonnie has had electric shock treatment, mused Ed. There is a kind of blankness about her, agreed Madeline. Ed came in and ran his hand over one of the posts of Abigail's bed. I had a hell of a job putting this together, he said. Do you think Nathan will be able to manage it? Madeline snorted. Maybe I should offer to help, said Ed. He was serious. He couldn't bear to think of a DIY job being done badly. Don't you dare, said Madeline. Shouldn't you be gone? Don't you have an interview? Yeah, I do. Ed bent to kiss her. Someone interesting. It's Pirawee Peninsula's oldest book club, said Ed, they've been meeting once a month for forty years. I should start a book club, said Madeline. Harper, I will say this for Madeline, she invited all the parents to join her book club, including Renata and me. I already belong to a book club, so I declined, which is probably just as well. Renata and I always enjoyed quality literature, not those lightweight, derivative bestsellers. Pure fluff. Each to their own, of course. Samantha, the whole erotic book club started as a joke. It was actually my fault. I was doing canteen duty with Madeline and I said something to her about a raunchy scene in the book she'd chosen. It wasn't even that raunchy, to be honest, I was just having a laugh, but then Madeline says, oh, did I forget to mention it was an erotic book club? So we all started calling it the Erotic Book Club, and the more people like Harper and Carol clutched their pearls, the worse Madeline got. Bonnie, I teach a yoga class on Thursday nights, otherwise I would have loved to have joined Madeline's book club. 29. One month before the trivia night. I have to take in my family tree tomorrow, said Ziggy. No, that's next week, said Jane. She was sitting on the bathroom floor, leaning against the wall while Ziggy had a bath. Steam and the scent of strawberry bubble bath filled the air. He loved to wallow in deep, very hot bubble baths. Hotter, mummy, hotter, he was always demanding while his skin turned so red, 
Jane was worried she was scalding him. More bubbles. Then he played long, complicated games through the bubbles, incorporating erupting volcanoes, Jedi Knights, ninjas, and scolding mothers. We need special cardboard for the family tree, said Ziggy. Yes, we'll get some on the weekend, said Jane. She grinned at him. He'd mold the bubbles on his head into a mohawk. You look funny. No, I look super cool, said Ziggy. He went back to his game. Kapow. Kapow. Ow. Stop that right now. Watch out, Yoda. Where's your lightsaber? Say please, Yoda. Here it is. Water splashed and bubbles flew. Jane returned to the book Madeline had chosen for their first book club meeting. I picked something with lots of sex, drugs and murder, Madeline had said, so we have a lively discussion. Ideally there should be an argument. The book was set in the 1920s. It was good. Jane had somehow gotten out of the habit of reading for pleasure. Reading a novel was like returning to a once-beloved holiday destination. Right now she was in the middle of a sex scene. She flipped the page. I'll punch you in the face, Darth Vader, cried Ziggy. Don't say punch you in the face, said Jane without looking up. That's not nice. She kept reading. A cloud of strawberry-scented bubbles floated onto the page of her book. She pushed it away with her finger. She was feeling something, a tiny pinpoint of feeling. She shifted slightly on the bathroom tiles. No. Surely not. From a book. From two nicely written paragraphs. But yes. She was. She was ever so slightly aroused. It was a revelation that after all this time she could still feel something so basic, so biological, so pleasant. For a moment she saw the staring eye in the ceiling and her throat tightened, but then her nostrils twitched with a sudden flare of anger. I refuse, she said to the memory. I refuse you today, because guess what, I have other memories of sex. I have lots of memories of an ordinary boyfriend and an ordinary bed, where the sheets weren't that crisp and there were no staring eyes in the ceiling and there wasn't that muffled, draped silence, there was music and ordinariness and natural light and he thought I was pretty, you bastard, he thought I was pretty, and I was pretty, and how dare you, how dare you, how dare you? Mummy, said Ziggy. Yes, she said. She felt a crazed, angry kind of happiness, as if someone were daring her not to be. I need that spoon that's shaped sort of like this. He drew a semicircle in the air. He wanted the egg slicer. Oh, Ziggy, that's enough kitchen stuff in the bath, she said, but she was already putting her book down and standing up to go and get it for him. Thank you, mummy, said Ziggy angelically, and she looked down at his big green eyes with the tiny droplets of water beaded on his eyelashes and she said, I love you so much, Ziggy. I need that spoon pretty fast, said Ziggy. Okay, she said. She turned to leave the bathroom, and Ziggy said, do you think Miss Barnes will be mad at me for not bringing in my family tree project? Darling, it's next week, said Jane. She went into the kitchen and read out loud from the notice stuck to the fridge by a magnet. All the children will have a chance to talk about their family trees when they bring in their projects on Friday, March 24 oh, calamity. He was right. The family tree was due tomorrow. She'd had it in her head that it was due the same Friday as her dad's birthday dinner, but then dad's dinner had been moved until a week later because her brother was going away with a new girlfriend. It was all bloody Dane's fault. No. It was her fault. She only had one child. She had a diary. It shouldn't be that hard. They'd have to do it now. Right now. She couldn't send him to school without his project. He'd be calling attention to himself, and he hated it when that happened. If it were Madeline's Chloe, she couldn't care less. She'd giggle and shrug and look cute. 
Chloe liked being the center of attention, but all poor Ziggy wanted was to blend into the crowd, just like Jane, but for some reason the opposite kept happening. Let the water out of the bath, Ziggy, she called. We have to do that project now. I need the special spoon, called back Ziggy. There's no time, shrieked Jane. Let the water out now. Cardboard. They needed a large sheet of cardboard. Where would they get that from at this time of night? It was past seven. All the shops would be closed. Madeline. She'd have some spare cardboard. They could drive around to her place and Ziggy could stay in the car in his pajamas while Jane rushed in and got it. She texted Madeline, crisis. Forgot family tree project. Idiot. Do you have spare sheet of cardboard? If so, can I drive around and pick it up? She pulled the instruction sheet off the fridge. The family tree project was designed to give the child a sense of their personal heritage and the heritage of others, while reflecting on the people who are important in their lives now and in the past. The child had to draw a tree and put a photo of themselves in the middle, then include photos and names of family members, ideally dating back to at least two generations, including siblings, aunties, uncles, grandparents and if possible great-grandparents or even great-great-grandparents. There was a big underlined note down at the bottom. Note to parents, obviously your child will need your help, but please make sure they have contributed to this project. I want to see their work, not yours. Miss, Rebecca, Barnes. It shouldn't take that long. She already had all the photos ready. She'd been feeling so smug about not leaving that until the last minute. Her mother had gotten prints done of photos from the family albums. There was even one of Ziggy's great-great-grandfather on Jane's dad's side, taken in 1915 just a few short months before he died on the battlefield in France. All Jane had to do was get Ziggy to draw the tree and write out at least some of the names. Except it was already past his bedtime. She'd let him stay far too long in the bath. He was ready for story and bed. He'd be moaning and yawning and sliding off his chair, and she'd have to beg and bribe and cajole, and the whole process would be excruciating. This was silly. She should just put him to bed. It was ridiculous to make a five-year-old stay up late to do a school project. Maybe she could just give him the day off tomorrow. A sickie. But he loved Fridays. F.A.B. Fridays. That's what Miss Barnes called them. Also, Jane really needed him to go to school tomorrow so she could work. She had three deadlines to meet. Do it in the morning before school. Ha. Huh. Yeah, right. She could barely get him to put his shoes on in the morning. Both of them were useless in the mornings. Deep breaths. Deep breaths. Who knew that kindergarten could be so stressful? Oh, this was funny. This was so funny. She just couldn't seem to make herself laugh. Her mobile phone was silent. She picked it up and looked at it. Nothing. Madeline normally answered texts immediately. She'd probably had enough of Jane lurching from crisis to crisis. Mummy. I need my spoon, cried Ziggy. Her phone rang. She snatched it up. Madeline. No, love, it's Pete. It was Pete the plumber. Jane's heart sank. Listen, love. I know. I'm so sorry. I haven't done the pay yet. I'll do it tonight. How could she have forgotten? She always did the pay slips for Pete by lunchtime on a Thursday, so he could pay his boys on Friday. No worries, said Pete CYA, love. He hung up. Not one for small talk. Mummy. Ziggy. Jane marched into the bathroom. It's time to let the water out. We've got to do your family tree project. Ziggy lay stretched out on his back, 
his hands nonchalantly crossed behind his head like a sunbather on a beach of bubbles. You said we didn't have to take it in tomorrow. We do. I was right, you were wrong. I mean, you were right, I was wrong. We have to do it right now. Quick. Let's get into your pajamas. She reached into the warm bathwater and wrenched out the plug, knowing as she did that she was making a mistake. No, shouted Ziggy, enraged. He liked pulling the plug out himself. I'll do it. I gave you enough chances, said Jane in her sternest, firmest voice. It's time to get out. Don't make a fuss. The water roared. Ziggy roared. Mean mummy. I do it. You let me do it. No, no. He threw himself forward to grab for the plug so he could put it back in and pull it back out again. Jane held the plug up high out of his grasp. We don't have time for that. Ziggy stood up in the bathwater, his skinny, slippery little body covered in bubbles and his face contorted in demented rage. He grabbed for the plug, slipped, and Jane had to grab his arm hard to stop him from falling and probably knocking himself out. You hurt me, screamed Ziggy. Ziggy's near fall had made Jane's heart lurch, and now she was furious with him. Quit yelling, she yelled. She grabbed a towel from the rail and wrapped it around him, lifting him straight out of the bath, kicking and screaming. She carried him into his bedroom and laid him with elaborate care on the bed because she was terrified she might throw him against the wall. He screamed and thrashed back on the bed. Spittle frothed over his lips. I hate you, he screamed. The neighbors must be close to calling the police. Stop it, she said in a reasonable, grown-up voice. You are behaving like a baby. I want a different mummy, shouted Ziggy. His foot rammed her stomach, nearly winding her. Her self-control slipped from her grasp. Stop it. Stop it. Stop it. She screamed like a madwoman. It felt good, as if she deserved this. Ziggy stopped instantly. He scuttled back against the headboard, looking up at her in terror. He curled up in a little naked ball, his face squashed into his pillow, sobbing piteously. Ziggy, she said. She put her hand on his knobbly spine and he jerked away from her. She felt sick with guilt. I'm sorry for yelling like that, she said. She draped the bath towel back over his naked body. I'm sorry for wanting to throw you against the wall. He flipped over and launched himself at her, clinging to her like a koala, his arms around her neck, his legs around her waist, his wet, snotty face buried in her neck. It's okay, she said. Everything is okay. She retrieved the towel from the bed and wrapped it back around him. Quick. Let's get you into your PJs before you get cold. There's someone buzzing, said Ziggy. What, said Jane. Ziggy lifted his head from her shoulder, his face alert and inquisitive. Hear it? Someone was buzzing the security door for their apartment. Jane carried him out into the living room. Who is it, said Ziggy. He was thrilled. There were still tears on his cheeks but his eyes were bright and clear. He'd moved on as if that whole terrible incident had never taken place. I don't know, said Jane. Was it someone complaining about the noise? The police? The child protection authorities coming to take him away? She picked up the security phone. Hello? It's me. Let me in. It's chilly. Madeline. She buzzed her in, put Ziggy down and went to open the front door of the apartment. Is Chloe here too? Ziggy bounced about excitedly, the towel slipping off his shoulders. Chloe is probably in bed, like you should be. Jane looked down the stairwell. Good evening. Madeline beamed radiantly up at her as she click-clacked up the stairs in a watermelon-colored cardigan, 
jeans and high-heeled, pointer-toed boots. Hello, said Jane. Brought you some cardboard. Madeline held up a neatly rolled cylinder of yellow cardboard like a baton. Jane burst into tears. Thirty. It's nothing. I was happy for an excuse to get out of the house, said Madeline over the top of Jane's teary gratitude. Now, quick sticks, let's get you dressed, Ziggy, and we'll knock this project over. Other people's problems always seemed so surmountable, and other people's children so much more biddable, thought Madeline as Ziggy trotted off. While Jane collected the family photos, Madeline looked around Jane's small, neat apartment, reminded of the one-bedroom apartment she and Abigail used to share. She was romanticizing those days, she knew it. She wasn't remembering the constant money worries or the loneliness of those nights when Abigail was asleep and there was nothing good on TV. Abigail had been living with Nathan and Bonnie now for two weeks, and it seemed it was all going perfectly well for everyone except Madeline. Tonight, when Jane's text had come through, the little children were asleep, Ed was working on a story and Madeline had just sat down to watch America's Next Top Model. Abigail, she'd called out as she switched it on, before she remembered the empty bedroom, the four-poster bed replaced by a sofa bed for Abigail to use when she came for weekends, and Madeline didn't know how to be with her daughter anymore, because she felt like she'd been fired from her position as mother. She and Abigail normally watched America's Next Top Model together, eating marshmallows and making catty remarks about the contestants, but now Abigail was happily living in a TV-free house. Bonnie didn't believe in television. Instead, they all sat around and listened to classical music and talked after dinner. Rubbish, scoffed Ed when he heard this. Apparently it's true, Madeline said. Of course, now when Abigail came to visit, all she wanted to do was lie on the couch and gorge on television, and because Madeline was now the treat-giving parent, she let her. If she'd spent a week just listening to classical music and talking, she'd want to watch TV too. Bonnie's whole life was a slap across Madeline's face. A gentle slap, more of a condescending, kindly pat, because Bonnie would never do anything violent. That's why it was so nice to be able to help Jane out, to be the calm one, with answers and solutions. I can't find glue to paste on the photos, said Jane worriedly as they laid everything out on the table. Got it. Madeline pulled a pencil case out of her handbag and selected a black marker for Ziggy. Let's see you draw a great big tree, Ziggy. It was all going well until Ziggy said, we have to put my father's name on it. Miss Barnes said it doesn't matter if we don't have a photo, we just put the person's name. Well, you know that you don't have a dad, Ziggy, said Jane calmly. She told Madeline that she'd always try to be as honest as possible with Ziggy about his father. But you're lucky, because you've got Uncle Dane, and Grandpa, and Great Uncle Jimmy. She held up photos of smiling men like a winning hand of cards. And we've even got this amazing photo of your great-great-grandfather, who was a soldier. Yes, but I still have to write my dad's name down in that box, said Ziggy. You draw a line from me to my mummy and my daddy. That's the way you do it. He pointed at the example of a family tree that Miss Barnes had included, demonstrating a perfect unbroken nuclear family, with mum, dad and two siblings. Miss Barnes really needs to rethink this project, thought Madeline. She'd had enough trouble herself when she was helping Chloe with hers. There had been the tricky matter of whether a line should be drawn from Abigail's picture to Ed, you'll have to put in a photo of Abigail's real dad, Fred had said helpfully, looking over their shoulders. And his car? No we don't, Madeline had said. It doesn't have to be exactly like the one Miss Barnes gave you, Madeline said to Ziggy. Everyone's project will be different. That's just an example. Yes but you have to write down your mother's and your father's name, said Ziggy. What's my dad's name? Just say it, mummy. Just spell it. I don't know how to spell it. I'll get in trouble if I don't write down his name. 
Children did this. They sensed when there was something controversial or sensitive and they pushed and pushed like tiny prosecutors. Poor Jane had gone very still. Sweetheart, she said carefully, her eyes on Ziggy, I've told you this story so many times. Your dad would have loved you if he'd known you, but I'm so sorry, I don't know his name, and I know that's not fair. But you have to write a name there. Miss Barnes said. There was a familiar note of hysteria in his voice. Overtired five-year-olds needed to be handled like explosive devices. I don't know his name, said Jane, and Madeline recognized the gritted teeth note in her voice too, because there was something in your children that could bring out the child in yourself. Nothing and nobody could aggravate you the way your child could aggravate you. Oh, Ziggy, darling, see, this happens all the time, said Madeline. For God's sake. It probably did. There were plenty of single mothers in the area. Madeline was going to have a word with Miss Barnes tomorrow to ensure that she stopped assigning this ridiculous project. Why try to slot fractured families into neat little boxes in this day and age? This is what you do. You write Ziggy's dad. You know how to write Ziggy, don't you? Of course you do, that's it. To her relief, Ziggy obeyed, writing his name with his tongue out the side of his mouth to help him concentrate. What neat writing, encouraged Madeline feverishly. She didn't want to give him time to think. You are a much neater writer than my Chloe. And that's it. You're done. Your mum and I will stick down the rest of the photos while you're asleep. Now. Story time. Right? And I'm wondering, could I read you a story? Would that be okay? I'd love to see your favorite book. Ziggy nodded dumbly, seemingly overwhelmed by her torrent of chatter. He stood up, his little shoulders drooping. Good night, Ziggy, said Jane. Good night, mummy, said Ziggy. They kissed each other goodnight like warring spouses, their eyes not meeting, and then Ziggy took Madeline's hand and allowed her to lead him off to his bedroom. In less than ten minutes she was back out in the living room. Jane looked up. She was carefully pasting the last photo onto the family tree. Out like a light, said Madeline. He actually fell asleep while I was reading, like a child in a movie. I didn't know children really did that. I'm so sorry, said Jane. You shouldn't have to come over here and put another child to bed, but I am so grateful to you, because I didn't want to get into a conversation with him just before bed about that, and... S-H-H-H-H. Madeline sat down next to her and put her hand on her arm. It was nothing. I know what it's like. Kindergarten is stressful. They get so tired. He's never been like that before said Jane. About his father. I mean, I always knew it might be an issue one day, but I thought it wouldn't be until he was thirteen or something. I thought I'd have time to work out exactly what to say. Mum and Dad always said stick to the truth, but you know, the truth isn't always, it's not always, well, it's not always that. Palatable, offered Madeline. Yes, said Jane. She adjusted the corner of the photo she'd just glued down and surveyed the piece of cardboard. He'll be the only one in the class without a picture in the box for his father. That's not the end of the world, said Madeline. She touched the photo of Jane's dad with Ziggy on his lap. Plenty of lovely men in his life. She looked at Jane. It's annoying that we don't have anyone with two mummies in the class. Or two daddies. When Abigail was at primary school in the Inner West, we had all sorts of families. We're a bit too white-bred here on the peninsula. We like to think we're terribly diverse, but it's only our bank accounts that vary. I do know his name, said Jane quietly. You mean Ziggy's father? Madeline lowered her voice too. Yes, said Jane. His name was Saxon Banks. Her mouth went a bit wonky when she said the words, as if she were trying to make unfamiliar sounds from a foreign language. Sounds like a respectable name, doesn't it? 
A fine, upstanding citizen. Quite sexy too. Sexy Saxon. She shuddered. Did you ever try to get in touch with him, asked Madeline. To tell him about Ziggy. I did not, said Jane. It was an oddly formal turn of phrase. And why did you not? Madeline imitated her tone. Because Saxon Banks was not a very nice fellow, said Jane. She put on a silly, posh voice and held her chin high, but her eyes were bright. He was not a nice chap at all. Madeline returned to her normal voice. Oh, Jane, what did that bastard do to you? 31. Jane couldn't believe she'd said his name out loud to Madeline. Saxon Banks. As if Saxon Banks were just another person. Do you want to tell me, said Madeline. You don't have to tell me. She was obviously curious, but not in that avid way that Jane's friends had been the next day. Spill, Jane, spill. Give us the dirt, and she was sympathetic, but her sympathy wasn't weighed down by maternal love, like it would be if it were Jane's mother hearing the story. It's not that big a deal, really said Jane. Madeline sat back in her chair. She took off the two hand-painted wooden bangles she was wearing on her wrist and placed them carefully on top of each other on the table in front of her. She pushed the family tree project to one side. Okay, she said. She knew it was a big deal. Jane cleared her throat. She took a piece of gum out of the packet on the table. We went to a bar she said. Zack had broken up with her three weeks earlier. It had been a great shock. Like a bucket of icy water thrown in the face. She thought they were on the path toward engagement rings and a mortgage. Her heart was broken. It was definitely broken. But she knew it would heal. She was even relishing it a little, the way you could sometimes relish a head cold. She wallowed deliciously in her misery, crying for hours over photos of her and Zack, but then drying her tears and buying herself a new dress because she deserved it because her heart was broken. Everybody was so gratifyingly shocked and sympathetic. You are such a great couple. He's crazy. He'll regret it. There was the feeling that it was a rite of passage. Part of her was already looking back on this time from afar. The first time my heart was broken. And part of her was kind of curious about what was going to happen next. Her life had been going one way, and now, just like that, wham, it was heading off in another direction. Interesting. Maybe after she finished her degree she'd travel for a year, like Zach. Maybe she'd date an entirely different sort of guy. A grungy musician. A computer geek. A smorgasbord of boys awaited her. You need vodka, her friend Gail had said. You need dancing. They went to a bar at a hotel in the city. Harbour views. It was a warm spring night. She had hay fever. Her eyes were itchy. Her throat was scratchy. Spring always brought hay fever, but also that sense of possibility, the possibility of an amazing summer. There were some older men, maybe in their early thirties, at the table next to them. Executive types. They bought them drinks. Big, expensive, creamy cocktails. They chugged them back like milkshakes. The men were from interstate, staying at the hotel. One of them took a shine to Jane. Saxon Banks, he said, taking her hand in his much larger one. You're Mr. Banks. Jane said to him. The dad in Mary Poppins. I'm more like the chimney sweep, said Saxon. He held her eyes and sang softly, a sweep is as lucky, as lucky can be. It's not very hard for an older man with a black Amex and a chiseled chin to make a tipsy 19-year-old swoon. Bit of eye contact. Sing softly. Hold a tune. There you go. Done deal. Go for it, Gail said in her ear. Why not? She couldn't come up with a reason why not. 
no wedding ring. There was probably a girlfriend back home, but it wasn't up to Jane to do a background check, was it, and she wasn't about to begin a relationship with him. It was a one-night stand. She'd never had one before. She'd always hovered on the side of prudish. Now was the time to be young and free and a bit crazy. It was like being on holidays and deciding to give bungee jumping a go. And this would be such a classy one-night stand, in a five-star hotel, with a five-star man. There would be no regrets. Zack could go off on his tacky contiki tour and grope the girls on the back of the bus. Saxon was funny and sexy. They laughed and laughed as the glass bubble elevator slid up through the center of the hotel. Then the sudden muffled carpeted silence of the corridor. His room key sliding in and the instant, tiny green light of approval. She wasn't too drunk. Just nicely drunk. Exhilarated. Why not? She kept telling herself. Why not try bungee jumping? Why not leap off the edge into nothing? Why not be a bit naughty? It was fun. It was funny. It was living life, the way Zack wanted to live life by going on a bus tour around Europe and climbing the Eiffel Tower. He poured her a glass of champagne, and they drank together, looking at the view, and then he removed the champagne glass from her hand and placed it on the bedside table, and she felt like she was in a movie scene she'd seen a hundred times before, even while part of her laughed at his pretentious masterfulness. He put his hand on the back of her head and pulled her to him, like someone executing a perfect dance move. He kissed her, one hand pressed firmly on her lower back. His aftershave smelled like money. She was there to have sex with him. She did not change her mind. She did not say no. It was certainly not rape. She helped him take her clothes off. She giggled like an idiot. She lay in bed with him. There was just one point when their naked bodies were pressed together and she saw the strangeness of his hairy, unfamiliar chest and she felt a sudden desperate longing for the lovely familiarity of Zack's body and smell, but it was okay, she was perfectly prepared to see it through. Condom, she murmured at the appropriate point, in the appropriate low throaty voice, and she thought he'd take care of that in the same smooth discreet way he'd done everything else, with a better brand of condom than she'd ever used before, but that's when he'd put his hands around her neck and said, ever tried this? She could feel the hard clamp of his hands. It's fun. You'll like it. It's a rush. Like cocaine. No, she said. She grabbed at his hands to try to stop him. She could never bear the thought of not being able to breathe. She didn't even like swimming underwater. He squeezed. His eyes were on hers. He grinned, as if he were tickling, not choking her. He let go. I don't like that, she gasped. Sorry, he said. It can be an acquired taste. You just need to relax, Jane. Don't be so uptight. Come on. No. Please. But he did it again. She could hear herself making disgusting, shameful gagging sounds. She thought she would vomit. Her body was covered in cold sweat. Still no. He lifted his hands. His eyes turned hard. Except maybe they'd been hard all along. Please don't. Please don't do that again. You're a boring little bitch, aren't you? Just want to be fucked. That's what you came here for, hey? He positioned her underneath him and shoved himself inside her as if he were operating some sort of basic machinery, and as he moved, he put his mouth close to her ear and he said things, an endless stream of casual cruelty that slid straight into her head and curled up, worm-like, in her brain. You're just a fat ugly little girl, aren't you? With your cheap jewellery and your trashy dress. Your breath is disgusting, by the way. Need to learn some dental hygiene. Jesus. Never had an original thought in your life, have you? Want a tip? You've got to respect yourself a bit more. Lose that weight. 
Join a gym, for fuck's sake. Stop the junk food. You'll never be beautiful, but at least you won't be fat. She did not resist in any way. She stared at the damn light in the ceiling, blinking at her like a hateful eye, observing everything, seeing it all, agreeing with everything that he said. When he rolled off her, she didn't move. It was as though her body didn't belong to her anymore, as though she'd been anesthetized. Shall we watch TV, he said, and he picked up the remote control and the television at the end of the bed came to life. It was one of the die-hard movies. He flicked through channels while she put back on the dress that she'd loved. She'd never spent that much money on a dress before. She moved slowly and stiffly. It wouldn't be until days later that she would find bruises on her arms, her legs, her stomach and her neck. As she dressed, she didn't try to hide her body from him, because he was like a doctor who had operated on her and removed something appalling. Why try to hide her body when he already knew just how abhorrent it was? You off, then, he said when she was dressed. Yes. Bye, she said. She sounded like a thick-witted twelve-year-old. She could never understand why she felt the need to say bye. Sometimes she thought she hated herself mostly for that. For her dopey, bovine bye. Why? Why did she say that? It was a wonder she didn't say thanks. See you. It was like he was trying not to laugh. He found her laughable. Disgusting and laughable. She was disgusting and laughable. She went back downstairs in the glass bubble elevator. Would you like a taxi, said the concierge, and she knew he could barely contain his disgust, disheveled, fat, drunk, slutty girl on her way home. After that, nothing ever seemed quite the same. 32. Oh, Jane. Madeline wanted to sweep Jane into her arms and onto her lap and rock her back and forth as if she were Chloe. She wanted to find that man and hit him, kick him, yell obscenities at him. I guess I should have taken the morning after pill, said Jane. But I never even thought about it. I had bad endometriosis when I was younger, and a doctor told me I'd have a lot of trouble getting pregnant. I can go for months without a period. When I finally realized I was pregnant, it was. She told her story in a low voice that Madeline had had to strain to hear, but now she lowered it even further to almost a whisper, her eyes on the hallway leading to Ziggy's bedroom. Much too late for an abortion. And then my grandfather died, and that was a big shock to us all. And then I went a bit strange. Depressed, maybe. I don't know. I left uni and moved back home, and I just slept. For hours and hours. It was like I was sedated or really jet-lagged. I couldn't bear to be awake. You were probably still in shock. Oh, Jane. I'm so sorry that happened to you. Jane shook her head as if she'd been given something she didn't deserve. Well. It's not like I got raped in an alleyway. I have to take responsibility. It wasn't that big a deal. He assaulted you. He. Jane lifted a hand. Lots of women have bad sexual experiences. That was mine. The lesson is, don't go off with strange men you meet in bars. I can assure you I went off with my share of men I met in bars, said Madeline. She'd done it once or twice. It had never been like that. She would have poked his eyes out. Do not for a moment think that you're in any way to blame, Jane. Jane shook her head. I know. But I do try to keep it in perspective. Some people do really like that erotic asphyxiation stuff. Madeline saw her put a hand unconsciously to her neck. You might be into it, for all I know. Ed and I think it's erotic if we find ourselves in bed without a wriggling child in between us, said Madeline. Jane, my darling girl, that wasn't sexual experimentation. What that man did to you was not. Well, don't forget you heard the story from my perspective, 
interrupted Jane. He might remember it differently. She shrugged. He probably doesn't even remember it. And that was verbal abuse. Those things he said to you. Madeline felt the fury rise again. How could she fight this creep? How could she make him pay? Those vile things. When Jane had told her the story, she hadn't needed to try to think back to remember the exact words. She'd recited his insults in a dull monotone, as if she were reciting a poem or a prayer. Yes, said Jane. Fat ugly little girl. Madeline winced. You are not. I was overweight, said Jane. Some people would probably say I was fat. I was into food. A foodie, said Madeline. Nothing as sophisticated as that. I just loved all food, and I especially loved fattening food. Cakes. Chocolate. Butter. I just loved butter. An expression of mild awe crossed her face, as if she couldn't quite believe she was describing herself. I'll show you a photo, she said to Madeline. She flicked through her phone. My friend Em just posted this on Facebook for Throwback Thursday. It's me at her 19th birthday. Just a few months before, before I got pregnant. She held up the phone for Madeline to see. There was Jane wearing a red sheath dress with a low neckline. She was standing in between two other girls of the same age, all three of them beaming at the camera. Jane looked like a different person, softer, uninhibited, much, much younger. You were curvy, said Madeline, handing back the phone. Not fat. You look gorgeous in this photo. It's sort of interesting when you think about it, said Jane, glancing at the photo once before she flicked it off with her thumb. Why did I feel so weirdly violated by those two words? More than anything else that he did to me, it was those two words that hurt. Fat. Ugly. She spat out the two words. Madeline wished she would stop saying them. I mean a fat, ugly man can still be funny and lovable and successful, continued Jane. But it's like it's the most shameful thing for a woman to be. But you weren't, you're not, began Madeline. Yes, okay, but so what if I was, interrupted Jane. What if I was? That's my point. What if I was a bit overweight and not especially pretty? Why is that so terrible? So disgusting. Why is that the end of the world? Madeline found herself without words. To be fat and ugly actually would be the end of the world for her. It's because a woman's entire self-worth rests on her looks, said Jane. That's why. It's because we live in a beauty-obsessed society where the most important thing a woman can do is make herself attractive to men. Madeline had never heard Jane speak this way before, so aggressively and fluently. Normally she was so diffident and self-deprecating, so ready to let someone else have the opinions. Is that really true, said Madeline. For some reason she wanted to disagree. Because you know I often feel secretly inferior to women like Renata and Jonathan's bloody hotshot wife. There they are, earning squillions and going to board meetings or whatever, and there's me with my cute little part-time marketing job. Yes, but deep down you know that you win because you're prettier, said Jane. Well, said Madeline, I don't know about that. She caught herself caressing her hair and dropped her hand. So that's why, if you're in bed with a man, and you're naked and vulnerable, and you're assuming that he finds you at least mildly attractive, and then he says something like that, well it's... She gave Madeline a wry look. It's kind of devastating. She paused. And, Madeline, it infuriates me that I found it so devastating. It infuriates me that he had that power over me. I look in the mirror each day, and I think, I'm not overweight anymore, but he's right, I'm still ugly. Intellectually I know I'm not ugly, I'm perfectly acceptable. But I feel ugly, because one man said it was so, and that made it so. It's pathetic.
He was a prick, said Madeline helplessly. He was just a stupid prick. It occurred to her that the more Jane expounded on ugliness, the more beautiful she looked, with her hair coming loose, her cheeks flushed and eyes shining. You're beautiful, she began. No, said Jane angrily. I'm not. And that's okay that I'm not. We're not all beautiful, just like we're not all musical, and that's fine. And don't give me that inner beauty shining through crap either. Madeline, who had been about to give her that inner beauty shining through crap, closed her mouth. I didn't mean to lose so much weight, said Jane. It makes me angry that I lost weight, as if I were doing it for him, but I got all weird about food after that. Every time I went to eat it was like I could see myself eating. I could see myself the way he'd seen me, slovenly fat girl eating. And my throat would just. She tapped a hand to her throat and swallowed. Anyway. So it was quite effective. Like a gastric bypass. I should market it. The Saxon Banks diet. One quick, only slightly painful session in a hotel room and there you go. Lifelong eating disorder. Cost effective. Oh, Jane, said Madeline. She thought of Jane's mother and her comment on the beach about no one wants to see this in a bikini. It seemed to her that Jane's mother had probably helped lay the groundwork for Jane's mixed up feelings about food. The media had done its bit, and women in general, with their willingness to feel bad about themselves, and then Saxon Banks had finished the job. Anyway, said Jane. Sorry for that little tirade. Don't be sorry. Also, I don't have bad breath, said Jane. I've checked with my dentist. Many times. But we'd been out for pizza beforehand. I had garlic breath. So that was the reason for the gum obsession. Your breath smells like daisies, said Madeline. I have an acute sense of smell. I think it was the shock of it more than anything, said Jane. The way he changed. He seemed so nice, and I'd always thought I was a pretty good judge of character. After that, I felt like I couldn't really trust my own instincts. I'm not surprised, said Madeline. Could she have picked him? Would she have fallen for his Mary Poppins song? I don't regret it, said Jane. Because I got Ziggy. My miracle baby. It was like I woke up when he was born. It was like he had nothing to do with that night. This beautiful tiny baby. It's only as he started to turn into a little person with his own personality that it even occurred to me, that he might, that he might have, you know, inherited something from his, his father. For the first time, her voice broke. Whenever Ziggy behaves in a way that seems out of character, I worry. Like on orientation day, when Amabella said he choked her. Of all the things to happen. Choking. I couldn't believe it. And sometimes I feel like I can see something in his eyes that reminds me of, of him, and I think, what if my beautiful Ziggy has a secret cruel streak? What if my son does that to a girl one day? Ziggy does not have a cruel streak said Madeline. Her desperate need to comfort Jane cemented her belief in Ziggy's goodness. He's a lovely, sweet boy. I'm sure your mother is right, he's your grandfather reincarnated. Jane laughed. She picked up her mobile phone and looked at the time on the screen. It's so late. You should go home to your family. I've kept you here this long, blathering on about myself. You weren't blathering. Jane stood up. She stretched her arms high above her head so that her t-shirt rose and Madeline could see her skinny, white, vulnerable stomach. Thank you so much for helping me get this damned project done. My pleasure. Madeline stood as well. She looked at where Ziggy had written Ziggy's dad. Will you ever tell him his name? Oh, God, I don't know, said Jane. Maybe when he's twenty-one when he's old enough for me to tell him the whole truth and nothing but the truth. He might be dead, said Madeline hopefully. Karma might have gotten him in the end. 
Have you ever Googled him? No, said Jane. There was a complicated expression on her face. Madeline couldn't tell if it meant that she was lying or that even the thought of Googling him was too painful. I'll Google the awful creep, said Madeline. What was his name again? Saxon Banks, right? I'll find him and then I'll put out a hit on him. There must be some kind of online murder a bastard service these days. Jane didn't laugh. Please don't Google him, Madeline. Please don't. I don't know why I hate the thought of your looking him up, but I just do. Of course I won't if you don't want me to, I was being flippant. Stupid. I shouldn't make light of it. Ignore me. She held her arms out and gave Jane a hug. To her surprise, Jane, who always presented a stiff cheek for a kiss, stepped forward and held her tightly. Thank you for bringing over the cardboard, she said. Madeline patted Jane's clean-smelling hair. She'd nearly said, you're welcome, my beautiful girl, like she did to Chloe, but the word beautiful seemed so complicated and fraught right now. Instead she said, you're welcome, my lovely girl. 33. Are there any weapons in your house? asked the counsellor. Pardon, said Celeste. Did you say weapons? Her heart was still pounding from the fact that she was actually here, in this small yellow walled room, with a row of cactus plants on the windowsill and colourful government-issued posters with hotline numbers on the walls, cheap office furniture on beautiful old floorboards. The counselling offices were in a federation cottage on the Pacific Highway on the lower North Shore. The room she was in probably used to be a bedroom. Someone had once slept here never dreaming that in the next century people would be sharing shameful secrets in this room. When she'd gotten up this morning Celeste had been sure she wouldn't come. She intended to ring up and cancel as soon as she got the children to school, but then she'd found herself in the car, putting the address into the GPS, driving up the winding peninsula road, thinking the whole way that she would pull over in the next five minutes and call them up and say so sorry, but her car had broken down, she would reschedule another day but she kept driving, as if she were in a dream or a trance, thinking of other things like what she'd cook for dinner, and then, before she knew it, she was pulling into the parking area behind the house and watching a woman coming out, puffing furiously on a cigarette as she opened the door of a banged-up old white car. A woman wearing jeans and a crop top, with tattoos like awful injuries all the way down her thin white arms. She'd envisaged Perry's face. His amused, superior face. You're not serious, are you? This is just so. So lowbrow. Yes, Perry. It was. A suburban counselling practice that specialised in domestic violence. It was listed on their website, along with depression and anxiety and eating disorders. There were two typos on the homepage. She'd chosen it because it was far enough away from Pirawi that she could be sure of not running into anyone she knew. Also, she hadn't really had any intention of turning up. She'd just wanted to make an appointment, to prove she wasn't a victim, to prove to some unseen presence that she was doing something about this. Our behaviour is lowbrow, Perry, she'd said out loud in the silence of the car, and then she'd turned the key in the ignition and gone inside. Celeste, prompted the counsellor now. The counsellor knew her name. The counsellor knew more about the truth of her life than anyone in the world besides Perry. She was in one of those naked nightmares, where you just had to keep walking through the crowded shopping centre while everyone stared at your shameful, shocking nudity. She couldn't go back now. She had to see it through. She'd told her. She'd said it, very quickly, her eyes slightly off-centre from the counsellors, pretending she was keeping eye contact. She'd spoken in a low, neutral voice, as if she were telling a doctor about a revolting symptom. It was part of being a grown-up, being a woman and a mother. You had to say uncomfortable things out loud. I have this discharge. I'm in a sort of violent relationship. Sort of. Like a teenager hedging her words, distancing herself. Sorry. 
Did you just ask about weapons? She recrossed her legs, smoothing the fabric of her dress across them. She'd deliberately chosen an especially beautiful dress that Perry had bought for her in Paris. She hadn't worn it before. She'd also put on makeup, foundation, powder, the whole kit and caboodle. She wanted to position herself, not as superior to other women, of course not, she didn't think that, not in a million years. But her situation was different from that woman in the parking lot. Celeste didn't need the phone number for a shelter. She just needed some strategies to fix her marriage. She needed tips. 10 top tips to stop my husband from hitting me. 10 top tips to stop my hitting him back. Yes, weapons. Are there any weapons in the house? The counselor looked up from what must be a standard sort of checklist. For God's sake, thought Celeste. Weapons. Did she think Celeste lived in the sort of home where the husband kept an unlicensed gun under the bed? No weapons, said Celeste. Although the twins have lightsabers. She noticed that she was putting on a well-bred private schoolgirl sort of voice and tried to stop it. She wasn't a private schoolgirl. She'd married up. The counselor laughed politely and noted something on the clipboard in front of her. Her name was Susie, which seemed to indicate a worrying lack of judgment. Why didn't she call herself Susan? Susie sounded like a pole dancer. The other problem with Susie was that she appeared to be about 12 years old, and quite naturally, being 12, she didn't know how to apply eyeliner properly. It was smudged around her eyes, giving her that raccoon look. How could this child give Celeste advice on her strange, complicated marriage? Celeste should be giving her advice on makeup and boys. Does your partner assault or mutilate the family pets, said Susie blandly. What? No. Well, we don't have any pets, but he's not like that. Celeste felt a surge of anger. Why had she subjected herself to this humiliation? She wanted to cry out, absurdly, this dress is from Paris. My husband drives a Porsche. We are not like that. Perry would never hurt an animal, she said. But he hurts you, said Susie. You don't know anything about me, thought Celeste sulkily, furiously. You think I'm like the girl with the tattoos, and I am not, I am not. Yes, said Celeste. As I said, occasionally he, we become physically, violent. Her posh voice was back. But as I tried to explain, I have to take my share of the blame. No one deserves to be abused, Mrs. White, said Susie. They must teach them that line at counselling school. Yes, said Celeste. Of course. I know that. I don't think I deserve it. But I'm not a victim. I hit him back. I throw things at him. So I'm just as bad as he is. Sometimes I start it. I mean, we're just in a very toxic relationship. We need techniques. We need strategies to help us, to make us stop. That's why I'm here. Susie nodded slowly. I understand. Do you think your husband is afraid of you, Mrs. White? No, said Celeste. Not in a physical sense. I think he's probably afraid I'll leave him. When these incidents have taken place, have you ever been afraid? Well, no. Well, sort of. She could see the point that Susie was trying to make. Look, I know how violent some men can be, but with Perry and me, it's not that bad. It's bad. I know it's bad. I'm not delusional. But, see, I've never ended up in the hospital or anything like that. I don't need to go to a shelter or a refuge or whatever they're called. I have no doubt you see much, much worse cases than mine but I'm fine. I'm perfectly fine. Have you ever been afraid that you might die? Absolutely not, said Celeste immediately. She stopped. Well, just once. 
It was just that my face. He had my face pressed into the corner of a couch. She remembered the feeling of his hand on the back of her head. The angle of her face meant that her nose sort of folded in half, pinching her nostrils. She'd struggled frantically to free herself, like a pinned butterfly. I don't think he realized what he was doing. But I did think, just for a moment, that I was going to suffocate. That must have been very frightening, said Susie without inflection. It was a bit. She paused. I remember the dust. It was very dusty. For a moment Celeste thought she might cry, huge, heaving, snotty sobs. There was a box of tissue sitting on the coffee table in between them for just that purpose. Her own mascara would run. She'd have raccoon eyes too, and Susie would think, not so upper class now, are you, lady? She pulled herself back from the brink of debasement and looked away from Susie. She studied her engagement ring. I packed a bag that time, she said. But then, well, the boys were still so little. And I was so tired. On average, most victims will try to leave an abusive situation six or seven times before they finally leave permanently, said Susie. She chewed on the end of her pen. What about your boys? Has your husband ever? No, said Celeste. A sudden terror took hold of her. Dear God. She was crazy coming here. They might report her to the Department of Community Services. They might take the children away. She thought of the family tree projects the boys had taken into school today. The carefully drawn lines connecting each of them to their twin, to her and to Perry. Their happy glossy faces. Perry has never ever laid a finger on the boys. He is a wonderful father. If I ever thought that the boys were in danger, I would leave, I would never, ever put them at risk. Her voice shook. That's one of the reasons I haven't left, because he is so good with them. So patient. He's more patient with them than me. He adores them. How do you think, began Susie, but Celeste interrupted her. She needed her to understand how Perry felt about his children. We had so much trouble getting pregnant, or not getting pregnant. Staying pregnant. I had four miscarriages in a row. It was terrible. It was like she and Perry had endured a two-year journey across stormy oceans and endless deserts. And then they'd reached the oasis. Twins. A natural pregnancy with twins. She'd seen the expression on the obstetrician's face when she found the second heartbeat. Twins. A high-risk pregnancy for someone with a history of recurrent miscarriage. The obstetrician was thinking, no way. But they made it all the way to 32 weeks. The boys were preemies. So there was all that going back and forth to the hospital for late-night feeds. We couldn't believe it when we finally got to bring them home. We just stood there in the nursery, staring at them, and then, well, then, those first few months were like a nightmare, really. They weren't good sleepers. Perry took three months off. He was wonderful. We got through it together. I see, said Susie. But Celeste could tell she didn't see. She didn't understand that she and Perry were bound together forever by their experiences and their love for their sons. Breaking away from him would be like tearing flesh. How do you think the abuse impacts your sons? Celeste wished she would stop using the word abuse. It doesn't impact them in any way, she said. They have no idea. I mean, for the most part, we're just a very happy, ordinary, loving family. We can go for weeks, months even, without anything out of the ordinary. Months was probably an exaggeration. She was starting to feel claustrophobic in this tiny room. There wasn't enough air. She ran a fingertip across her brow, and it came back damp. What had she expected from this? Why had she come? She knew there were no answers. No strategies. 
No tips and techniques, for God's sake. Perry was Perry. There was no way out except to leave, and she would never leave while the children were little. She was going to leave when they were at university. She'd already decided that. What made you come here today, Mrs. White, said Susie, as if she were reading her mind. You said this has been going on since your children were babies. Has the violence been escalating recently? Celeste tried to remember why she'd made the appointment. It was the day of the athletics carnival. It was something to do with the amused expression on Perry's face that morning when Josh asked him about the mark on his neck. And then she'd gone home after the carnival and felt envious of her cleaners because they were laughing. So she'd given $25,000 to charity. Feeling philanthropic were you, darling. Perry had said Riley a few weeks later when the credit card bill came in, but he'd made no further comment. No, it hasn't been escalating, she said to Susie. I'm not sure why I finally made an appointment. Perry and I went to marriage counseling once, but it didn't. Well, nothing came of that. It's hard because he travels a lot for work. He'll be away again next week. Do you miss him when he's away? said Susie. It seemed as though this wasn't a question on her clipboard, it was just something that she wanted to know. Yes, said Celeste. And no. It's complicated, said Susie. It's complicated, agreed Celeste. But all marriages are complicated, aren't they? Yes, said Susie. She smiled. And no. Her smile vanished. Are you aware that a woman dies every week in Australia as a result of domestic violence, Mrs. White? Every week. He's not going to kill me, said Celeste. It's not like that. Is it safe for you to go home today? Of course, said Celeste. I'm perfectly safe. Susie raised her eyebrows. Our relationship is like a seesaw, explained Celeste. First one person has the power, then the other. Each time Perry and I have a fight, especially if it gets physical, if I get hurt, then I get the power back. I'm on top. She warmed to her theme. It was shameful sharing these things with Susie, but it was also a wonderful relief to be telling someone, to be explaining how it all worked, to be saying these secrets out loud. The more he hurts me, the higher I go and the longer I get to stay there. Then the weeks go by, and I can feel it shifting. He stops feeling so guilty and sorry. The bruises I bruise easily, well, the bruises fade. Little things I do start to annoy him. He gets a bit irritable. I try to placate him. I start walking on eggshells, but at the same time I'm angry that I have to walk on eggshells, so sometimes I stop tiptoeing. I stomp on the eggshells. I deliberately aggravate him because I'm so angry with him, and with myself, for having to be careful. And then it happens again. So you've got the power right now, said Susie. Because he hurt you recently. Yes, said Celeste. I could actually do anything right now because he still feels so bad about what happened the last time. With the Legos. So right now everything is great. Better than great. That's the problem, see. It's so good right now, it's almost. She stopped. Worth it, finished Susie. It's almost worth it. Celeste met Susie's raccoon eyes. Yes. The blandness of Susie's gaze said nothing at all except, got it. She wasn't being kind and maternal and she wasn't reveling in the delicious superiority of her own kindness. She was just getting the job done. She was like that brisk, efficient lady at the bank or the telephone company who just wants to do her job and untangle that knotty problem for you. They sat in silence for a moment. Outside the office door, Celeste could hear the murmur of voices, the ringing of a telephone and the distant sounds of traffic passing on the street outside. A sense of peace washed over her. The sweat on her face cooled. 
For five years, ever since it had begun, she'd been living her life with this secret shame draped so heavily over her shoulders, and for just a moment it lifted and she remembered the person she used to be. She still had no solution, no way out, but for just this moment she was sitting opposite someone who understood. He will hit you again, said Susie. That detached professionalism again. No pity. No judgment. It wasn't a question. She was stating a fact to move the conversation forward. Yes, said Celeste. It will happen again. He'll hit me. I'll hit him. It will rain again. I will get sick again. I will have bad days. But can't I enjoy the good times while they last? But then why am I here at all? So what I'd like to talk about is coming up with a plan, said Susie. She flipped over a page on her clipboard. A plan, said Celeste. A plan, said Susie. A plan for next time. 34. Have you ever wanted to experiment with that, what's it called, erotic asphyxiation, said Madeline to Ed as they lay in bed. He had his book. She had the iPad. It was the night after she'd taken the cardboard over to Jane's place. She'd been thinking about Jane's story all day. Sure. I'm up for it. Let's give it a shot. Ed took off his glasses and put down his book, turning to her with enthusiasm. What? No. Are you kidding, said Madeline. Anyway, I don't want sex. I ate too much risotto for dinner. Right. Of course. Silly of me. Ed put his glasses back on. And people accidentally kill themselves doing that. They die all the time. It's a very dangerous practice, Ed. Ed looked at her over the top of his glasses. I can't believe you wanted to choke me, said Madeline. He shook his head. I was just trying to show my willingness to accommodate. He glanced at her iPad. Are you looking up ways to spice up our sex life or something? Oh God no, said Madeline, with perhaps too much feeling. Ed snorted. She looked at the Wikipedia entry for erotic asphyxiation. So apparently when the arteries on either side of the neck are compressed, you get a sudden loss of oxygen to the brain so you go into a semi-hallucinogenic state. She considered it. I've noticed whenever I've got a head cold, I often feel quite amorous. That might be why. Madeline, said Ed, you have never been amorous when you had a head cold. Really, said Madeline. Maybe I just forgot to mention it. Yeah, maybe you did. He went back to reading his book again. I had a girlfriend who was into it. Seriously? Which one? Well, maybe she wasn't theoretically a girlfriend. More like a random girl. And this random girl wanted you to. Madeline put her hands around her own throat, stuck her tongue out the side of her mouth and made choking noises. Goddamn, that looks sexy when you do that, said Ed. Thanks. Madeline dropped her hands. So did you do it? Sort of half-heartedly, said Ed as he took off his glasses. He grinned to himself, remembering. I was a bit drunk. I was having trouble following instructions. I remember she was disappointed with me, which I know you probably find impossible to fathom, but I didn't always thrill and delight. Yes, yes. Madeline waved him quiet and looked back at her iPad. So why the sudden interest in erotic asphyxiation, said Ed. She told him Jane's story and watched the tiny muscles around his jaw flicker and his eyes narrow, the way they did when he heard a story on the news about a child being hurt. Bastard, he said finally. I know, said Madeline. And he just gets away with it. Ed shook his head. Silly, silly girl. He sighed. These sort of men just prey on. 
Don't call her a silly girl. Madeline sat up so fast, the iPad slipped off her legs. That sounds like you're blaming her. Ed held up his hand as if to ward her off. Of course I'm not. I just meant. What if it were Abigail or Chloe, cried Madeline. I actually was thinking of Abigail and Chloe, said Ed. So you'd blame them, would you? Would you say, you silly girl, you got what you deserved? Madeline, said Ed calmly. Their arguments always went like this. The angrier Madeline got, the more freakishly calm Ed became, until he reached a point where he sounded like a hostage negotiator dealing with a lunatic and a ticking bomb. It was infuriating. You're blaming the victim. She was thinking of Jane sitting in her cold, bare little apartment, the expressions that had crossed her face as she shared her sad, sordid little story, the shame she so obviously still felt all these years later. I have to take responsibility, she'd said. It wasn't that big a deal. She thought of the photo Jane had showed her. The open, carefree expression on her face. The red dress. Jane once wore bright colors. Jane once had cleavage. Now Jane dressed her bony body apologetically, humbly, like she wanted to disappear, like she was trying to be invisible, to make herself nothing. That man had done that to her. It's all fine and dandy for you to sleep with random women, but when a woman does, it's silly. That's a double standard. Madeline, said Ed, I was not blaming her. He was still speaking in his I am the grown-up you read the crazy one voice, but she could see a spark of anger in his eyes. You are. I can't believe you would say that. The words bubbled out of her. You're like those people who say, oh, what did she expect? She was drinking at one o'clock in the morning, so of course she deserved to be raped by the whole football team. I am not. You are so. Something changed in Ed's face. His face flushed. His voice rose. Let me tell you this, Madeline, he said. If my daughter goes off one day with some wanker she's only just met in a hotel bar, I reserve the right to call her silly. It was stupid for them to be fighting about this. A rational part of her mind knew this. She knew that Ed didn't really blame Jane. She knew her husband was actually a better, nicer person than she was, and yet she couldn't forgive him for that silly girl comment. It somehow represented a terrible wrong. As a woman, Madeline was obliged to be angry with Ed on Jane's behalf, and for every other silly girl, and for herself, because after all, it could have happened to her too, and even a soft little word like silly felt like a slap. I can't be in the same room as you right now. She hopped out of bed taking the iPad with her. Be ridiculous, then, said Ed. He put his glasses back on. He was upset, but Madeline knew that he would read his book for twenty minutes, turn off the light and fall instantly asleep. Madeline closed the door firmly, she would have preferred to slam it, but she didn't want the kids waking up, and marched down the stairs in the dark. Don't hurt your uncle on the stairs, called out Ed from behind the door. He was already over it, thought Madeline. She made herself a cup of chamomile tea and settled down on the couch. She hated chamomile tea, but it was supposedly soothing and calming and whatever, so she was always trying to make herself drink it. Bonnie only drank herbal tea, of course. According to Abigail, Nathan avoided caffeine now too. This was the problem with children and marriage breakups. You got all this information about your ex-husband that you would otherwise never know. She knew, for example, that Nathan called Bonnie his Bonnie Bon. Abigail had mentioned this in the kitchen one day. Ed, who had been standing behind her, silently stuck his finger down his throat, making Madeline laugh, but still, she could have done without hearing that. Nathan had always been into alliteration, he used to call her his Mad Maddie, not quite as romantic. Why had Abigail felt the need to share those sorts of things? Ed thought it was deliberate, that she was trying to bait Madeline, to purposely hurt her, 
but Madeline didn't believe that Abigail was that malicious. Ed always saw the worst in Abigail these days. That's what was behind her sudden fury with him in the bedroom. It wasn't really anything to do with the silly girl comment. It was because she was still angry with Ed over Abigail moving in with Nathan and Bonnie, because the more time that passed, the more likely it seemed that it was Ed's fault. Maybe Abigail had been teetering on the edge of her decision, playing around with the idea but not really seriously considering it, and Ed's calm down comment had been just the shove she'd needed. Otherwise she'd still be here. It might have just been a passing phase. Teenagers did that. Their moods came and went. Lately, Madeline's mind had been so filled with memories of the days when it was just her and Abigail that she sometimes had the strangest feeling that Ed, Fred and Chloe were interlopers. Who were these people? It was like they'd marched into Madeline and Abigail's life with all their noise and their stuff, their noisy computer games and their fighting, and they'd driven poor Abigail away. She laughed at the thought of how outraged Fred and Chloe would be if they knew she dared question their existence, especially Chloe. But where was I, she always demanded when she looked at old photos of Madeline and Abigail. Where was Daddy? Where was Fred? You were in my dreams, Madeline would say, and it was true. But they weren't in Abigail's dreams. She sipped her tea and felt the anger slowly drain from her body. Nothing to do with the stupid tea. Really it was that man's fault. Mr. Banks. Saxon Banks. An unusual name. She rested her fingertips on the cool, smooth surface of the iPad. Don't Google him, Jane had begged, and Madeline had promised, so this was very wrong, but the desire to see the bastard was so irresistible. It was like when she read a story about a crime, she always wanted to see the offender, to study his or her face for signs of evil. She could always find them. And it was so easy, just a few keystrokes in that little rectangle, it was like her fingers were doing it without her permission and, while she was still deciding whether or not to break her promise, the search results were already on the screen in front of her, as if Google were an extension of her mind and she only had to think of it for it to happen. She would just take a very, very quick look, she'd just skim it with her eyes, and then she'd close the page and delete all references to Saxon Banks from her search history. Jane would never know. It wasn't like Madeline could do anything about him. She wasn't going to plan some elaborate, satisfying revenge, although, already part of her mind had split off and was travelling down that path, some sort of scam. To steal his money? To publicly humiliate or discredit him. There must be a way. She double clicked, and one of those well lit corporate headshots filled her screen. A property developer called Saxon Banks, based in Melbourne. Was that him? A strong jawed, classically handsome man with a pleased with himself smirk and eyes that seemed to look straight into Madeline's in a combative, bordering on aggressive way. You prick, said Madeline out loud. You think you can do whatever you want to whomever you choose, don't you? What would she have done in Jane's situation? She couldn't imagine herself reacting the way Jane had. Madeline would have slapped him. She wouldn't have been undone by the words fat and ugly, because her self-confidence about her looks was too high, even when she was 19, or especially when she was 19. She got to decide how she looked. Perhaps this man specifically picked out girls who he knew would be vulnerable to his insults. Or was this line of thought just another form of victim blaming? This wouldn't have happened to me. I would have fought. I wouldn't have stood for it. He wouldn't have shattered my self-respect. Jane had been completely vulnerable at the time, naked, in his bed, silly girl. Madeline caught herself. Silly girl. She'd just thought exactly the same thing as Ed. She'd apologize in the morning. Well, she wouldn't apologize out loud, but she might make him a soft-boiled egg, and he'd get the message. She studied the photo again. She couldn't see a resemblance to Ziggy. Or, actually, maybe she could. Perhaps a little around the eyes. 
she read the little biography next to his photo. Bachelor of this, masters of that, member of the institute of whatever, blah, blah, blah. In his spare time Saxon enjoys sailing, rock climbing and spending time with his wife and three young daughters. Madeline winced. Ziggy had three half-sisters. Madeline knew this now. She knew something she shouldn't know, and she couldn't you and know it. She knew something about Jane's own son that Jane herself didn't know. She hadn't just broken a promise, she'd violated Jane's privacy. She was a tacky little voyeur poking about the internet, digging up photos of Ziggy's father. She'd been angered by what had happened to Jane, but part of her had almost relished the story, hadn't she? Hadn't she almost enjoyed? Feeling outraged over Jane's sad, sordid little sex story. Her sympathy came from the superior, comfy position of someone with a life in proper middle-class order, a husband, a home, a mortgage. Madeline was just like some of her mother's friends, who had been so excitedly sympathetic when Nathan left her and Abigail. They were sad and outraged for her, but in such a tut tut that's oh so terrible way that left Madeline feeling brittle and defensive, even as she genuinely appreciated the home-cooked casseroles that were solemnly placed on her kitchen table. Madeline stared into Saxon's face, and he seemed to stare back at her with knowing eyes, as if he knew every despicable thing there was to know about her. A wave of revulsion rushed over her, leaving her feeling clammy and shaky. A scream sliced like a sword through the house's sleepy silence, Mummy! Mummy, Mummy, Mummy! Madeline leapt to her feet, her heart hammering, even though she already knew it was just Chloe having another one of her nightmares. Coming! I'm coming, she called as she ran down the hallway. She could fix this. She could so easily fix this, and it was such a relief because Abigail didn't want or need her anymore, and there were evil people like Saxon Banks out there in the world waiting to hurt Madeline's children, in big ways and small ways, and there wasn't a damn thing she could do about it, but at least she could drag that monster out from under Chloe's bed and kill it with her bare hands. 35. Miss Barnes, after that little drama on orientation day, I was stealing myself for a tough year, but it seemed to get off to a good start. They were a great bunch of kids, and the parents weren't being too annoying. Then about halfway through the first term it all fell apart. Two weeks before the trivia night. Latte and a muffin. Jane looked up from her laptop, and then down again at the plate in front of her. There was an artful scribble of whipped cream on the plate next to the muffin. Oh, thanks, Tom, but I didn't order. I know. The muffin is on the house, said Tom. I hear from Madeline that you're a baker. So I wanted to get your expert opinion on this new recipe I'm trying. Peach, macadamia nut and lime. Crazy stuff. The lime, I mean. I only bake muffins, said Jane. I never eat them. Seriously. Tom's face fell a little. Jane said hurriedly, but I'll make an exception today. The weather had turned cold this week, a little practice session for winter, and Jane's apartment was chilly. That grey sliver of ocean she could see from her apartment window just made her feel colder still. It was like a memory of summers lost forever, as if she lived in a grey, brooding, post-apocalyptic world. God, Jane, that's a bit dramatic. Why don't you take your laptop and set yourself up at a table at Blue Blues? Madeline had suggested. So Jane had started turning up each day with her laptop and files. The cafe was filled with sun and light, and Tom had a wood fire stove running. Jane gave a little exhalation of pleasure each time she stepped in the door. It was like she'd gotten on a plane and flown into an entirely different season compared with her miserable, damp apartment. She made sure that she was only there in between the morning rush and the afternoon rush so she didn't take up a paying table, and of course she ordered coffees and a small lunch throughout the day. Tom the barista had begun to seem like a colleague, someone who shared the cubicle next to hers. He was good for a chat. 
They like the same TV shows, some of the same music. Music. She'd forgotten the existence of music like she'd forgotten books. Tom grinned. I'm turning into my grandma, aren't I? Force feeding everyone. Just try one mouthful. Don't eat it all to be polite. Jane watched him go, and then averted her eyes when she realized she was enjoying looking at the breadth of his shoulders in his standard black t-shirt. She knew from Madeline that Tom was gay, and in the process of recovering from a badly broken heart. It was a cliché, but it also seemed to be so often true, gay men had really good bodies. Something had been happening over the last few weeks, ever since she'd read that sex scene in the bathroom. It was like her body, her rusty, abandoned body, was starting up again of its own accord, creaking back to life. She kept catching herself idly, accidentally looking at men, and at women too, but mainly men, not so much in a sexual way, but in a sensual, appreciative, aesthetic way. It wasn't beautiful people like Celeste who were drawing Jane's eyes, but ordinary people and the beautiful ordinariness of their bodies. A tanned forearm with a tattoo of the sun reaching out across the counter at the service station. The back of an older man's neck in a queue at the supermarket. Calf muscles and collarbones. It was the strangest thing. She was reminded of her father, who years ago had an operation on his sinuses that returned the sense of smell he hadn't realized he'd lost. The simplest smells sent him into rhapsodies of delight. He kept sniffing Jane's mother's neck and saying dreamily, I'd forgotten your mother's smell. I didn't know I'd forgotten it. It wasn't just the book. It was telling Madeline about Saxon Banks. It was repeating those stupid little words he'd said. They needed to stay secret to keep their power. Now they were deflating the way a jumping castle sagged and wrinkled as the air hissed out. Saxon Banks was a nasty person. There were nasty people in this world. Every child knew that. Your parents taught you to stay away from them. Ignore them. Walk away. Say, no. I don't like that, in a loud, firm voice, and if they keep doing it, you go tell a teacher. Even Saxon's insults had been schoolyard insults. You smell. You're ugly. She'd always known that her reaction to that night had been too big, or perhaps too small. She hadn't ever cried. She hadn't told anyone. She'd swallowed it whole and pretended it meant nothing, and therefore it had come to mean everything. Now it was like she wanted to keep talking about it. A few days ago, when she and Celeste had their morning walk, she'd told her a shorter version of what she'd told Madeline. Celeste hadn't said all that much, except that she was sorry and that Madeline was absolutely right and Ziggy was nothing like his father. The next day, Celeste gave Jane a necklace in a red velvet bag. It was a fine silver chain with a blue gemstone. That gemstone is called a lapis, said Celeste in her diffident way. It's supposedly a gemstone that heals emotional wounds. I don't really believe that stuff, but anyway, it's a pretty necklace. Now Jane put a hand to the pendant. New friends. Was that it? The sea air? The regular exercise was probably helping too. She and Celeste were both getting fitter. They'd both been so happy when they noticed they didn't have to stop and catch their breath when they reached the top of the flight of stairs near the graveyard. Yes, it was probably the exercise. All she'd needed all this time was a brisk walk in the fresh air and a healing gemstone. She dug her fork into the muffin and lifted it to her mouth. The walks with Celeste were also returning her appetite. If she didn't watch out, she'd get fat again. Her throat closed up on cue, and she replaced the fork. So, not quite cured. Still weird about food. But she must not offend lovely Tom. She picked up her fork and took the tiniest bite. The muffin was light and fluffy, and she could taste all the ingredients that Tom had mentioned, macadamia, peach, lime. She closed her eyes and felt everything, the warmth of the cafe, the taste of the muffin, 
the by now familiar smell of coffee and second-hand books. She took another, bigger forkful and scraped up some of the cream. Okay. Tom leaned over a table close to hers, cleaning it with a cloth he took from his back pocket. Jane lifted a hand to indicate her mouth was full. Tom took a book that a customer had left on the table and replaced it on one of the higher shelves. His black t-shirt lifted away from his jeans, and Jane saw a glimpse of his lower back. Just a perfectly ordinary lower back. Nothing particularly notable about it. His skin during the winter was the color of a weak latte. During the summer it was the color of hot chocolate. It's wonderful, she said. MMMM. Tom turned around. There were only the two of them in the cafe right now. Jane pointed her fork at the muffin. This is amazing. You should charge a premium. Her mobile rang. Excuse me. The name on the screen said school. The school had only called her once before, when Ziggy had a sore throat. Miss Chapman. This is Patricia Lipman. The school principal. Jane's stomach contracted. Mrs. Lipman? Is everything all right? She hated the craven note in her voice. Madeline spoke to Mrs. Lipman with cheerful, condescending affection, as if she were a dotty old family butler. Yes, everything is fine, although I would like to arrange a meeting with you as a matter of some urgency if I could. Ideally today. Would around 2 p.m. suit you, just before pick-up? Of course. Is everything. Lovely. I'll look forward to seeing you then. Jane put down her phone. Mrs. Lipman wants a meeting with me. Tom knew most of the kids, parents, and teachers at the school. He'd grown up in the area and attended the school himself back when Mrs. Lipman was a lowly year three teacher. I'm sure you don't have anything to worry about, he said. Ziggy is a good kid. Maybe she wants to put Ziggy in a special class or something. MMMM. Jane took another absent-minded forkful of muffin. Ziggy wasn't gifted and talented. Anyway, she already knew from the tone of Mrs. Lipman's voice that this wasn't going to be good news. Samantha, Renata went off her head when the bullying started. Part of the problem was the nanny hadn't been communicating, so it had been going on for a while without her knowing. Of course we now know that Juliet had other things on her mind besides her job. Miss Barnes, what parents don't understand is that a child can be a bully one minute and a victim the next. They're so ready to label. Of course, I do see this was different. This was bad. Stu, my dad taught me, a kid hits you, you hit him back. Simple. It's like everything these days. A trophy for every kid in the soccer game. A prize in every bloody layer of hot potato. We're bringing up a generation of wimps. Thea, Renata must surely have blamed herself. The hours she worked, she barely saw her children. My heart just goes out to those poor little mites. Apparently they're not coping well at the moment. Not coping well at all. Their lives will never be the same again, will they? Jackie, nobody says anything about Jeff working long hours. Nobody asks if Jeff knew what was going on with Amabella. It's my understanding Renata had a higher paid, more stressful job than Jeff, but nobody blamed Jeff for having a career, nobody said, oh, we don't see much of Jeff at the school, do we? No. But if the stay-at-home mum see a dad do pick up, they think he deserves a gold medal. Take my husband. He has his own little entourage. Jonathan, they're my friends, not my entourage. You have to excuse my wife. She's in the middle of a hostile takeover. That might be why she's coming across a bit hostile. I think the school has to take responsibility. Where were the teachers when all this bullying was going on?